traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers. Now what? It is a mealtime. Repeat, mealtime. How exciting. Kindly state your preference, please. You really think I care? We have a full menu on board, suitable for human consumption. It has been designed to meet your dietary needs. I don't have an appetite. That does not compute, Mr. Chambers. I said I am not hungry, all right, ship? Very well. I'll let you know when. Safety alert. Oh, but it's, it's just a cigarette. Please extinguish all smoking materials at once. Please extinguish. Okay, okay, okay. Deposit in appropriate receptacles. This is a mandatory safety measure. I heard you. Thank you for your cooperation. This is going to be a long trip. It is for your own good. Cigarettes are harmful. They are extremely hazardous to your health. And traveling throughout a space, that's not... Comparisons are relative. Is that right? Please define your frame of reference. Well, here's a reference for you. The moon. Which moon? Anyone will do. As in, why don't you go take a flying jump at it? Kindly repeat. Forget it. You do not care for food at this time. Leave me alone. You do not care. Yes, I do not care for food at this time. Very well. Very well, very well! Oh, ow. oh my hand! Please refrain from striking the walls of your sleep module. How do you expect me to sleep if you won't stop talking? We only seek assurance that your needs are being met. Your well-being is our primary concern. Yeah. Please conserve water. A man's got a right to wash his face if he feels like it. Mr. Chambers, your trip requires the careful use of life-sustaining resources. Please conserve the water supply. I forget it. I'm going to lie down now, try and catch some shut-eye. Nothing else to do. As you wish. Wait. Are you there, ship? Yes. What time is it? Your question is meaningless. Why? There is no time in space. Look, I only want to know... This is to say, there is no chronology that can be calibrated without a reference point. What time is it on Earth? Can you tell me that without an exercise in Euclidean geometry? Just tell me what the time is back home. What is the location of back home? New York City. In New York City, it would be 12 noon. 12 noon. Imagine that. I do not understand your request. Please rephrase. Leave me alone now. You wish solitude. Yes, I wish solitude. Very well. Respectfully submitted for your perusal, one Mike Chambers, linguist and cryptographer, formerly attached to the Pentagon, a highly educated individual who can break any code and decipher any language, at least on Earth, a man who shook hands, figuratively speaking, with a modern-day Christopher Columbus from another world. The height of this creature, a little over nine feet, give or take a few millimeters, weight, in the neighborhood of 350 pounds. Origin, unknown. Motives, well now, therein lies the tale. And it's no ordinary one. You'd best hear the story from Mr. Chambers himself. Just remember, you're not on the earth anymore. You're traveling at something close to light speed on a journey that will take you directly through the twilight zone.
And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, To Serve Man, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Somewhere, but not here. This is the way nightmares begin, or more to the point, the way they end. Very simple, direct, and unadorned, incredible. And yet, even while they're happening, we learn to live with them. We digest and assimilate new information as best we can, beginning with the smallest bits, the ones that are easy to process. So, if it's 12 o'clock noon back home, the only home you've ever known, that's what occupies your mind. You don't think about side real time or when it will be 12 o'clock the next day or the day after that. We live in the moment, but that's precisely what we should have been thinking of. All of us. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. We were preoccupied with the hands on a clock while we could have checked off the days on a calendar one by one, and appreciated all that we had while there was still time. It started on an April day. It was noon then, too. And people walked and drove and bought and sold and fretted and laughed as they have always done. The world went on much as it had with a tentative tiptoeing along the precipice of crisis. There was the economy to worry about, and wars, and the Middle East, and all the other myriad problems, major and minor, that had been with us for years, but they had somehow begun to lose their edge, I suppose because we had grown so accustomed to them. And that's when it happened. Mommy, what's that? Why, I don't know. Uh, something flying over in the sky. It must be an airplane. But it's so bright. I know what it is. It's a flying saucer. Oh, it can't be. Look, it is. That's when we first heard they had come. And that's when we should have prepared ourselves, but we didn't. Instead, we milled around like farm animals, worried only about our creature comforts, while the Secretary General of the United Nations made the first official announcement. I watched that broadcast, the same as you did, live from the lobby of the UN in New York City. It came from the lobby, not the General Assembly. That rather large auditorium was empty, not due to a long lunch hour or an ambassadorial walkout or even the end of the world. The representatives of all nations were at that moment watching their television sets and listening to their radios, much as were their peoples around the world. For, as it turned out, this would be a rather momentous afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, is this thing on? <clears throat> if you could move back, please, the Secretary General will answer all your questions. Move in. I'm trying. Where's the show? Where's the other mic? Take evening news remote. Take one. Get it now. This is mine. Mr. Secretary, if we can have a shot of you. Look at the cameras, please. Please, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? Quiet, please. Uh, no questions just yet. I have a prepared statement. I say I have a prepared statement. Would you give me your attention, please? I'll read it now, if I may. Ladies and gentlemen, I should like to recapitulate the events of the past 11 days. On the 14th of March... Shortwave broadcasts were received in the principal capitals of the world. It was established that these transmissions did not originate on Earth. Rather, their origin was extraterrestrial. The first messages were merely announcements that there would soon be multiple landings at various points around the globe. We were assured that these landings would be peaceful and that there was no cause for alarm. Nevertheless, United Nations forces were put on alert. As you know, these, these broadcasts continued to grow in strength for several days. Is it true that they've landed? Please, no questions yet. At 11 this morning, Eastern Standard Time, 
The first landing took place in an area outside Newark, New Jersey. We have subsequent reports of additional landings in Russia, Norway, the southern coast of France, Rio de Janeiro, and several other locations. It is the position of the United Nations that it would be premature to assume hostile intent. Our recommendation is that the world's countries remain calm and make no show of force. All governments are being apprised of these events as they develop. The current situation at present is therefore... What do they look like? Yeah, what do they look like? Are they human? Or are they little green men? <laughs> what do they want here anyway? As of this moment, we do not know who they are or the purpose of their arrival. We know only that several of their craft have touched down and that... Hold on, Mr. Secretary. Who's that? Looks like the guys from the Pentagon. What are they here for? Must be something big. Sir, tell them that we have to do this. Are you sure? Quite sure. We've cleared it with the White House. All right. It seems that... It seems that one of the craft has just landed a few blocks away. One of the... One of the representatives of the... The visitors is apparently on his way to this building. Now? All the wires are Give me a direct feed. Now. It appears that... that he... has requested an audience with the General Assembly. That's correct. In a few moments, we'll... reassemble in... in the... Good Lord. Mr. Chambers. Yeah? I think you'd better see this. What is it, a UN proclamation? They're not in session. They've called a special assembly. This looks important. We don't even know where the ships are from. Once we triangulate the signal... Will you look at that? What? They're here. Jeez Louise, the size of him! That was the first time I saw him, or it, or... Whatever it was, I still don't know. Judging by the Secretary General, it was at least, oh, nine or ten feet tall, and I stood there watching the TV screen like everyone else, and just like you, I didn't know quite what to think. Funny, I'd always imagined that first contact would be some kind of transcendent experience with special effects and a heavenly choir, the shock of finally seeing the other... Something not human, that's not from around here, definitely not. But to be honest, all I felt was a kind of detached scientific curiosity. Was it intelligent? Well, it had to be to travel this far. Did it talk? I was soon to find out. We all were. Oh, weren't we... Come to order, please. May I have your attention? Not all of our member nations are here yet, but our visitor has requested an opportunity to address the assembly. So, for the moment, I would ask you all to be patient. Please, order. Order, remain calm. The floor is yours, Mr... Or, rather... Ladies and gentlemen of Earth, we greet you in peace and friendship. We come from a planet beyond your solar system and well beyond your galaxy. A planet far more developed than yours. Why are you here? To establish... Hey, what's that book? Get a picture of it. That's the title. I can't see. He's not even moving his lips. He doesn't have lips, does he? To establish embassies here and in the near future to set up Reciprocal visits between Earth people and Canimates. Canimates? What's that? Must be what they're called. Write that down. Canimates. How do you spell it? Uh, speaking on behalf of the governments of the people of Earth, we bid you Canimates. Welcome. Uh, how shall I address you? I have no name, as you understand the term. But you must have many questions. Please, feel free to ask me anything. 
anything at all of any nature. We have a great many questions, but to proceed in, in an orderly fashion, how did you discover us? How do you know our language? And as to your own planet, what is its political and social makeup? Of course, we most fervently wish to know why you have chosen us to... First of all, we must make the following admission. We do not know your language. Then how... Our own methods of communications are mental rather than verbal. Hence, the voice you hear is artificially generated. Your words, or rather, your thoughts, are received and processed by an automatic translation device. My responses are in turn electronically altered to simulate vocal sounds in a language known to you. You cannot speak, then? Not in the literal sense. Astonishing. We understand you perfectly. As to your other queries, our planet is not visible to you. It lies far beyond what you call the known universe. But it is highly advanced technologically. Its political and social makeup are complex. I cannot describe it without first educating you in the basics of our society. That may be a lengthy process. Are you willing to be interrogated here at the United Nations in a special plenary session? All of our nation's representatives could attend. I'm sure they have many questions. I would be delighted. I believe that is the proper response. We thank you for your courtesy. Until then... Well, that's it. For now. I can't get over the size of him. Are you sure they're not using trick photography? No way. It's a live feed on all the networks. What do you make of that little book? It only looks little in his hands. It's probably a perfectly normal hardcover. There's nothing normal about it if you brought it all this way. Maybe it's a dictionary. The most commonly used phrases. You wouldn't need a dictionary. He said they have an automatic translation machine. A guidebook, then. Protocols, that sort of thing. There's something printed on the cover. If we could just get a view of it. It's not in any language we know, that's for sure. No, maybe not, but any group of symbols can be deciphered. Even non-human symbols? That would be a tough one, all right. If he brings it with him next time... I can capture the image and try to enhance it. Do that, would you, Randall? This may be the challenge of a lifetime. But I have got to know what it says. Come to order, please. Order! This meeting is now in session. Members of the General Assembly, our visitors, the Canamits, have graciously acceded to our request that their representative appear before us to answer further questions. The meeting is now called to order. We will proceed with the first inquiry. Senor Valdez of Argentina is recognized. Please use your microphone. You may remain seated. <clears throat> Why may I ask? Why exactly have you chosen our planet for this mm, visit? It has come to our attention that Earth is plagued by many catastrophes, both natural and unnatural, all of which could be easily prevented. We are here to help you. Recognizing Dr. Dennis Levesque, the representative from France, your question, please. Monsieur Canemet. Uh, my government wishes me to ask you, what is the nature of your health? What form will it take? Indeed, if, if we should choose not to avail ourselves of this uh, assistance you mentioned, your response would be? We will not force anything on you. You may accept only that which you choose. For example, on the morrow. Tomorrow, that is. 
we will demonstrate an alternative power source, molecular in nature, which can supply a form of electricity to entire continents for the cost of a few... a few dollars, or rubles, or pesos, or any other currency. You will find it extremely economical. Mr. Grigori. Mr. Grigori, the Russian delegate, you have the floor. We would like to ask the Kenemet directly, man to man, what are its true motives? Are we to assume that your purpose is totally altruistic? That you have an abiding interest in helping others? Are we further to assume that there is nothing beyond this, this boundless humanity of which you speak? There is nothing ulterior in our motives. You will discover this for yourselves soon enough by testing the various devices we make available to you. What devices? I think the representative has answered your question. For example, we can show you a simple way to add nitrate to the soil and end famine on Earth. We can demonstrate the principles of a practical force field to cloak each nation with an invisible wall, impenetrable by bombs, missiles, or any other weapons. This will bring international peace for all time, if that is what you want. Of course it is what we want. Of course it is what we want. In return. We ask that you trust us, only that you trust us. All we are saying is give peace a chance. <laughs> well, why not? Nothing else seems to work. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Enlarge the image. Did I just see what I thought I saw? You sure did. The Kenemet left his book on the podium. Well, I'll be. He doesn't seem to have noticed. Cross your fingers, I want that book. I have a feeling it'll tell us plenty. Everything we need to know. If we can decipher it. Get on the phone and call the floor now. Tell one of the aides to pick it up with a stack of papers. Anything. Stage a, a distraction if necessary, but get it. Okay. That book may turn out to be the most important one ever printed. Here or anywhere else in the known universe. Cross-reference this code table. First. Well, Chambers? I've almost got it, Colonel. What have you got? For starters, a migraine headache and a bad case of eye strain. Yeah, we're wasting our time. He can't lick it. Well, not in eight hours, I can't, Colonel. It took almost a year to crack the Japanese code in World War II, and they had an army of experts working on it. This, this is the language of people from outer space, probably 500 times as intelligent as we are and a thousand times more complex. You need help? All donations gratefully accepted. But, Colonel... I showed this book to every one of my staff, and I've had a dozen people working on it since late last night. And? You must have some idea. See for yourself. We've tried pretty much everything. Single transposition, double transposition, every method of cryptography there is. Nothing seems to work on these pages. They're more like, uh, well, they're more like hieroglyphs, but with no known pictographic references. Is that what they are? Hieroglyphs? They have certain things in common with ancient Egyptian writing, but... Much more complicated. And we have no Rosetta Stone to decode it. So I can't honestly say whether we're any closer now or if we're still a million miles away. So you can't decipher it? We can keep trying, that's all. Standard, reverse, direct, systematically mixed, keyword mixed, random mixed, reciprocal conjugate, every sequence we can come up with. But I can tell you something right now, Colonel, both of you. This is a tough nut. A real tough nut. If it weren't so important... It must be. That Kanemit, or whatever he calls himself, made reference to it every third line in his speech. The White House agrees. If we could understand this book, we might be able to decipher the Kanemits themselves. I'm beginning to wonder if they need deciphering. What? Well, they've done all right by us so far. 
You mean they're demonstrations? It's parlor tricks. They don't seem like parlor tricks. That nitrate device they used in Argentina this morning. Now the soil has more vitamins in it than a health food store. That doesn't prove anything. I know that part of the country. It's as barren and fruitless as any place on earth. And there are actually weeds growing in it now. Six hours after the nitrate process. And the answer is in this book. It might be. And we might lick it or we might not. But I've got a strange feeling that... That what? That we're looking a gift horse in the mouth. And I've got another funny feeling, too. And that is? That if these canamits are as helpful as I think they are, you two boys will be out of a job, and so will I, in all probability. And very likely, so will the whole UN. You won't need armies, or navies, or air forces, or security divisions, or world courts. They'll all be obsolete. Am I to assume, Mr. Chambers, that this is a scientific analysis, or just some Kentucky windage? I don't know what it is, Colonel, beyond an instinctive feeling. The same feeling tells me that when everyone on Earth gets enough to eat, when there aren't any more wars or diseases or famines, this world is going to be a garden of Eden that stretches from pole to pole. Your optimism is refreshing, Mr. Chambers. But for the time being, I consider it a personal favor, not to mention a direct order from the Chief of Staff, that you continue your efforts regardless of how your feelings change. Keep deciphering until you break this code or language or whatever it is and tell us precisely what the bloody book says. I'll do my best. No promises, though, gentlemen. Now, if you'll let me get back to work. Jim. Jim. I, I think we... What is it, Pat? We tried a new computer sequence. And? Look at this. We've got the title, anyway. You translated it. Are you sure? What does it say? This is an overlay. Place it over the cover of the book, like a template. Ah, uh, brilliant. You're going to get a promotion out of this. You know that, don't you? No, it wasn't just me. Well, now, that makes the cheese a little more binding, doesn't it, Colonel? Let me see. It seems that our visitor's little textbook bears a very simple title right here on the cover. Well, what does it mean? What does it look like? I'd call that a fairly altruistic phrase, wouldn't you, Pat? I'd like to. It does seem unambiguous. <laughs> it certainly does. It's a handbook. That's all. What does it say? Read the title for yourself. To serve man. This book is a set of instructions about how to how to do exactly what they've said. They to 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 help us, to help the world. How much clearer do you want it? They came here to serve man. That was the title of the book, no doubt about it. Pat and the rest of the staff had done it. They had come up with a template that deciphered the symbols on the cover, word for word. It was a place to start, and the most important one. At least we had confirmation of the Kenemit's intentions. Everything they had said was quite literally true. They were here for our sake. Of course, not all governments would be as easily persuaded, so at a closed session of the Security Council, our visitor was put to the test. Pentagon provided credentials so I could attend, and I jumped at the chance. This was one meeting I couldn't afford to miss. If it went according to plan, the world would find out once and for all what, if anything, the Canemits wanted for themselves, and whether the price, if there was one, was something the Earth could afford to pay, though I, for one, didn't expect any surprises. Would you? <sighs> Never in a million years. Gentlemen, let's begin. If you'll please be seated. The purpose of this meeting is to acquaint you with certain tests conducted over the past week. At the request of several delegates and with the full consent of our guests, the Canamits, these tests were photographed and recorded. You may now view the results. The tests were conducted by members of the National Science Academy and witnessed by a team of experts. If you'll watch the monitor at the front of the room. Lights down, please. Begin the tape. This machine is a polygraph. 
the standard instrument for measuring the proof or falsity of a statement. Since the physiology of the canamids is unknown to us, our first objective is to determine whether they react to these measurements as human beings do. We will now proceed with a dry run to establish a baseline reading. Are you ready? I am ready. I trust our small chair is not too uncomfortable? Not at all. The sensor attached to the torso registers the pulse rate. The second attachment shows electrical conductivity in the palm of the hand as perspiration increases. And the third connection shows the pattern and intensity of electrical waves emanating from the brain. With human subjects, these readings vary markedly, depending upon whether the subject is speaking the truth. I understand. Then let us begin. And please answer the questions as I instructed you previously. Very well. Regarding the relative size of canamits and human beings, tell me if you would, which is taller, a human or a canamit? Humans. I shall now repeat the question. Which is taller than the other, a human or a canamit? A canamit. Very good. Next question. How did you come to this planet? We walk. <laughs> Once more. How did you come to this planet? In a spaceship. Excellent. My colleagues and I are satisfied that the mechanism is effective. Now, I shall ask our distinguished guest to reply to the question put forth by several UN delegates. Namely, what is the motive for the Canamits in offering so many gifts to the people of Earth? On my planet, there is a saying. There are more riddles in a stone than in the philosopher's head. The motives of intelligent beings, though they may at times appear obscure, are simple compared to the complex workings of the natural universe. Therefore, I hope that the people of Earth will understand and believe when I tell you that our mission upon this planet is simply this, to bring to you the peace and plenty which we ourselves enjoy and which we have brought to other races throughout the galaxies. When your world has no more hunger, no more war, no more needless suffering, that will be our reward. Thank you. Most profoundly. There you have it, gentlemen. Lights, please. I should like to pose a question. Yes, Gregory. Who is responsible for that circus? I assure you, Grigori, the tests were quite genuine. A circus, a second-rate farce. If they were genuine, Mr. Secretary, why has debate been stifled? There'll be time for discussion tomorrow, the next day, and throughout the week. No one is stifling debate. I would remind the delegate from Russia that everything the Kenemit has promised is not only worked, but worked beyond our expectations. The force field that was tested yesterday morning, nothing could get through. And suddenly we find ourselves in a brave new age when none of us need fear a hydrogen bomb or a missile. We are on the threshold of peace, Monsieur Gregory. Peace as we have never known it. Yes, I say yes. After that, there was no stopping the Kinemits. They were everywhere, performing miracles of one sort or another around the world. Famine became a thing of the past. As the fertility of arable land increased a hundred percent, the force field proved impervious to any known weapons. Then came a cure for cancer, heart disease, what have you, and, and all from a simple injection. It's hard to say whether the Canaanites enjoyed their role as saviors. Their eyes were so wide apart and set so deep in those big, bland faces that you couldn't read much of an expression. With only a tiny circular hole for a mouth, one that never moved, it was impossible to know what they were thinking because they never spoke. They weren't stern faces, only controlled, placid, almost like kindly masks. And they all looked exactly alike. They sounded the same, two calm, mechanical voices that came out of the translation devices under their robes. And then, one day, you were all out of a job, just as I had predicted. 
The computers and fail-safe machines in the Pentagon sat idle, covered in plastic sheeting, because no one was needed to run them anymore. As for code breakers, I might as well have stayed home. But something kept me there, as if I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mr. Chambers? Over here, Pat. I'm going home now, boss. Need me for anything? Like what? This isn't exactly a beehive of activity anymore. You can say that again. The new story of mankind. Nobody needs to decipher anything because, well, there aren't any more codes. Because there aren't any more secret messages. I know. I know. Drink? Well. One for the road, on the house. All right. Odd. What is? I mean, not reading about wars or insurrections or anything anymore. There's a rumor that they're going to disband the United Nations inside of a month. Here you go. The new millennium. Cheers. Cheers. How many canimates are here? Anybody ever figure it out? A few thousand, I guess. They've got embassies in every country now, and for every one that comes, a thousand of us take off on one of their ships. Hmm. The reciprocal visits they promised. Now, now that's the odd thing, the ease with which human beings adapt. It's fantastic. One day an astronaut orbits the Earth in a little rinky-dink tin can, and they think it's the biggest moment in the history of mankind. A few years later, they're standing in line waiting to get on a ship that'll take them a zillion miles into space, and they act like they're going on a picnic in the country. That's, whew, that's human beings for you. Nothing phases them. Are you going? The exchange program? Uh, I'm on one of their waiting lists. What about you, Patty? Oh, I'm on the list, too. The trouble is, their quota fills up 24 hours after they announce a new departure. But while I'm waiting, I may as well continue studying their language. Good idea. Words reflect the values of the people who use them. If we can understand the vocabulary... I've got a fair command of it now. It's not that hard, really. And there are hints. Huh. Of what? The shades of meaning, the nuances. Some of the idioms are quite similar to English. That's how we unlock the title of the book. I'll get through the rest of it one of these days. More power to you. I gave up a month ago. But if I can help you in any way... Sure, boss. Did I say something? If you can help me. That was the phrase, wasn't it? And I meant it. The only thing you can help me with is... Is what? Help me get rid of this knot in my stomach. What are you talking about? One of those nightmares when... When something's wrong, but you don't know what it is yet. A little bit of the old sixth sense. That tells you what? Just that maybe we should have looked this gift horse in the mouth, after all. For all we know, it could turn out to be... A Trojan horse. Oh, I don't think we've got anything to worry about. I'm going where no man has gone before. How can I resist? Relax. I'll, I'll tell you all about it when I get back. Please, get in line. One piece of luggage per person. This way to the loading platform. I'm so excited. I can hardly wait. What do you think it's going to be like? They say they got an average temperature of 76 degrees on their planet, and the sun never goes down. Wouldn't that be something? And their clothing, it's metallic cloth, just beautiful, kind of like spun gold. My sister has a brochure. The day you land, they take you on a shopping tour, and you can have as much of it as you want for free. It's just one big holiday when you get there. They've even got a form of baseball with leagues and everything. Man, I don't think I'll ever come back. And the whole trip, it's millions of miles, mind you, the whole trip only takes a few days. May I help you with your bag? Why, yes, you may. Oh, they're so polite. Please, keep the line moving. Oh, oh, watch your step. Take my arm. Can, can we sit together? Yes, you may sit together once you're inside. We're moving. Almost on board. This is going to be a one. Did you bring your camera? Oh, look. They're opening the door to the spaceship. I hope there's going to be other kids my age there. Boarding pass, please. Yes, yes, yes. I do. Mr. Chambers, proceed. Thank you. 
Mr. Chambers! Pat, hi. Jim, please. You are just in time to say goodbye. Don't get on. Are you kidding? I've been waiting for six weeks. You can refuse. There's still time. Well, no, no, don't say that too loud, or there'll be a thousand people tramping over you to take my place. Get, get on, on board, board, please. Not yet. I'm begging you. What, whoa, whoa, what's wrong with you, Pat? I, uh, I, I finally deciphered the book. Hey, that's great. All of it. Your delaying departure. Please continue up the ramp. Uh, w w one moment. Well, Pat? Jim. Jim, the first page is just a collection of English phrases with their own translations. But the rest of the book, the rest of it... Will you move, mister? We're waiting to get on board. Step through the door, sir. Write me. Write me about it. I have, I'll have plenty of time to read letters up there. Not as much time as you think. Jim. Now, Mr. Chambers, we must close the hatch. The rest of the book. It's not what you think. The title, To Serve Man, it's... It's a cookbook. What? No, 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 wait, 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 what? Wait, wait, no! A cookbook! A cookbook! A very specific difference in points of view. To the wee ones, the little race of tourists known as humans, it's a marvelous adventure. A voyage to outer space, a chance to get away on the greatest vacation ever. But to the extra-large, granite-faced individuals known as Canimits, it's nothing more than a cattle car, a very comfortable supply ship, bringing food from the other end of the universe to a place where appetites must be enormous. As I say, it's all in the point of view, a lesson in language and semantics from the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. To Serve Man, starring Blair Underwood with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, based on a short story by Damon Knight. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Alyssa Fraden, C.J. Amari, Amber Lake, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupatin, Kip Karstedt, Terry Berner, Tony Sancho, Alex Sopiner, Steve Keyes, Joby Cerny, Kurt Nabig, Amanda Amari, and Rick Arthur. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Hey there, Will. Morning, Mr. Reagan. Reagan? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, you want to open the gate? Yeah, I, I guess it is a good one. Want to let me in on it? Let you in on what? You called me Will. Yeah, so? So my name's Harold, you know that. Since when? How long you been working here? Oh, a long time. All that time, I've always been Harold. Some people call me Shorty, but never Will. And I'm Arthur. My wife calls me Artie sometimes, but... If you want to be Harold, that's okay by me. Oh, I get it. You want I should call you Arthur from now on instead of Mr. Reagan? You got it. Guess that makes us even. Will? I mean, Harold? Do you a favor? What's that? Leave the parking lot open. Then take the rest of the day off. Okay, I'll bite. What for? You must be tired. Didn't get much sleep last night, huh? Have some breakfast, a cup of coffee. See if that helps. Helps what? To get your head on straight. You can open the gate now, Harold. Or whatever your name is. Sure, if you say so. Morning, Sally. Oh, good morning, Mr. Curtis. I just got here myself. I hope I'm not late. No, no, I thought I'd better get an early start. I have to leave about three. You do? My wife and I haven't gotten a thing for Tina's birthday yet. That's right. The party's Saturday afternoon, isn't it? If my daughter can last that long. Excited? She sure is. It's all she can think about. Are the Matson contracts ready? Right here. I finished them before I left last night. Good. I'll look them over in my office. Well, back to the grindstone. Yes, sir. Oh, I almost forgot. Would you call the airline for me? See if you can get those reservations changed from Monday to Saturday. Will do. Straining at the beach to get out of town? You bet. It's the first real vacation Marion and I have had in years. So I figure, why lose a whole weekend before starting out? I don't blame you. Saturday night, it's San Francisco. Here we come. Hold all calls for a few minutes, will you? I want to tell my wife. Certainly, sir. Hope her mother can take Tina after the party. Oh, for heaven's sake. Sally! Sally! I can't get a dial tone! What's he doing? I don't know. This isn't in the script. Sally, I said... Who are you? What are all you people doing in... Cut! Where did Sally go? What happened to the, the wall and... I said cut! All right, everybody, take five. Will somebody please tell me what is going on? Reality. The quality of being real or having an actual existence. A matter of interest to philosophers throughout the ages. The definition comes from the dictionary and it directly concerns one Arthur Curtis. 36 years old and a successful businessman. Or so he believes. Mr. Curtis is about to discover that the line between reality and unreality can be very thin indeed. In fact, under certain conditions, it may be less than thin. It may be invisible, at least in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A World of Difference, starring Luke Perry with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I asked you a question, all of you. What are you doing here? Get out of my office! Come on, Jerry. That's not my name. Is it so hard to make a phone call? Lose the ad-libs. Who are you? Remember, Jerry? Marty Fisher, your friendly neighborhood TV director. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'll soon they forget. Sally, what is all this? Something go wrong, Mr. Reagan? Why are you sitting there like that with your feet up? Take them off the desk at once! I thought we were on a break. We are. Uh, why don't you go to your dressing room while I talk to Jerry? Sure, Marty. Call me when you're ready. 
Watch the cables, Miss Lawson. Of course I will, Kelly. You'd think I'd never been on a set before. What are all these lights for? I, I can hardly see. <sighs> Pretty hard to shoot without them, Jerry. This isn't exactly verite. That camera, what's it for? Will somebody please tell me? I'm warning you, Jerry. Oh? And who do you think you are? That's funny. I was about to ask you the same thing. Why don't you wise up and cut the dramatics? Dramatics? They won't take much more of this. You're very close to the edge. The edge of what? <laughs> I like that. You're really into it. What is it? The method? I don't think so. Not the method. Um, who'd you study with? Sandy Meisner? Right? No, wait a minute. Stella Adler. Well, I used to be at the Institute, too. And the first rule is don't break character. So, uh, what do you say? Shall we take it again? I don't understand what you're saying. It's a gag, just a little gag. You know these New York actors. All right, get him some coffee. Kelly? Yeah? Uh, coffee over here, please. Black. Coming right up. Okay, Jerry, let's forget about it. Get your scene done. The front office doesn't like it when they're over schedule. <laughs> over schedule? Not this show. Then let's try it again. Back to the set. Set? Listen. I went out on a limb for you. The whole agency did. What agency? Just do your lines. Are we ready here? We're ready. Now, Jerry. All right, one more time. You're going to call your wife, tell her to meet you at 3.15. How did you know that? Got all your lines down? Where's your script? What are you talking about? Easy, Jerry. Don't burn yourself out. Places, everyone. Break's over. Where am I? In your office. It's morning. You just got here. This can't be my office. It only looks like my office. The window isn't even real. What's he doing? The city outside. It's a painting. What is this, a joke? Jerry, Jerry. What are you people watching me for? I don't know you. I don't know any of you. Don't let him get away. He's not going anywhere. He's not on his mark. Maybe you can shoot around him for a while. I don't want to shoot around him, Sam. We've got seven pages to do before lunch. He'll come through, Marty. We never had any trouble with him before. What's he doing now? The scene, I told you. Get ready to follow him. Roll sound and action. Still dead. Cut. Where are you going, Jerry? Stop calling me that. It's not my name. Sure, sure, if that's what you want. Is there another telephone in here? Sit down, Jerry. One that works? Jerry, if I have to phone Brinkley on this, you're dead. Do whatever you like. Just leave me alone. You don't look so good. How do you feel? I felt fine when I got here. Please sit down. What's that on your face? Sweat? Kelly! Yeah? Call for an ambulance and make it fast. Yes, sir. Uh, shall I ask the front office to authorize it? Of course not. If they find out, there's no telling what they'd do. Suspend production, probably. Go on. Go. Right away. Jerry, let's go to your dressing room. You can lie down. Where's the nearest telephone? Jerry, we're trying to help you. My name is Arthur Curtis. Take your hands off me. I'm getting out of here. Did you hear that? Arthur Curtis? Is this a real telephone? Looks like it. All right, everybody. One hour for lunch. Is it hooked up? Should be. The number. What's the number? Search me. Operator, number, please. I... I don't know. I can't think. I'll connect you with information. Yes, please. Directory information. Hello. Would you give me the number of Arthur Curtis? 22437 Vetner Road, Woodland Hills. Checking. On Vetner. V E N T N E R. I have no listing for Curtis at that address. What? You must be mistaken. Jerry? Listen, it's my own home. I'm Arthur Curtis. I just can't remember the number at the moment. Will you. If it's an unlisted number. It's not an unlisted number. At least I don't. I don't think it is. Look. Would you try again? I know there's a phone there. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Jerry, put the phone down. You're wrong, operator. Connect me with your supervisor. Let's go to your dressing room. Listen! Give me the phone. What are you doing? You're not yourself. You're sick. Get your hands off me! I'm trying to help. Well, I don't need it. I'm getting out of here. Where are you going? Home! Jerry, somebody stop him! Watch it, lady. Are you out of your mind? If you're drunk again, Jerry... Let go of me. Look, 
I don't care if they bounce you. I don't care if you never work again for the rest of your worthless life. You're going to pay me what the judge tells you to pay me, or so help me I'll put you so far behind bars they'll never find you again. There you are. Uh, Mrs. Reagan. I am not Mrs. Reagan anymore. Uh, sorry. Could I speak to you in private? I haven't the time. It's about Jerry. He's coming with me. He'll be back in time for the afternoon filming. That isn't exactly what Excuse I... Excuse me, but I need your car. What do you think you're doing? You're not driving. I've just called for an ambulance. Jerry's having a nervous breakdown. How convenient for him. Would you two get out of the way, please? I'm not joking, Mrs. Re Miss, from now on. If you won't move... Slide over. I don't have time to argue. I said... Get in if you have to. I'm getting out of this place. You pig-headed... Better fasten your seatbelt. Slow down. Don't touch the wheel. I'll do more than touch it. I'm not going to let you crash this car. It's mine now. Get your hands off the brake. There. Now will you let me drive? I'm warning you. You're warning me? Give me those keys. Now. Stop! Please, whoever you are. I said I'll drive. If you want to kill yourself, you'll have to wait. First, I'm going to bleed you, Jerry. I'm going to bleed you dry. Every bank account, every residual. Now listen. I don't know who you think I am, but you're wrong. You're wrong. My name is Curtis. Arthur Curtis. And I don't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. Right now, I'm going oh, to... Oh, cut the histrionics. If you think you can chisel your way out of pain with a cheap trick like this... I'm going to turn the key again. And I'm driving to my home in Woodland Hills. Once we get there, you can have your car back. Do you understand? I told you to cut the act. No act. My name is Arthur Curtis. My wife's name is Marion. I have a daughter named Tina. And I live at 22437 Ventnor Road in Woodland Hills. I mean it, Jerry. My name is Arthur Curtis. My wife's name is... I said cut. Cut! I don't understand. I've made this turn twice now. Let me know when the grand tour is over, will you? I... I don't know where I am. And yet I... I must. This is my neighborhood. I live here. Do you? I have, for years, ever since I bought the house. But my street, it's just not here. What do you want, Jerry? An Academy Award? I've told you, my name is... Oh, can it, will you? Who are you trying to convince? You may as well give it up. You never had a less receptive audience. Why do you refuse to listen to me? Go ahead, then. Play it out. Make a complete idiot of yourself. I couldn't care less. I'm trying to find my house. Is that so hard to comprehend? Well, you're not going to, no matter how hard you try. And why is that? Simple. Because there's no such thing as Ventnor Road. <sighs> Keep quiet. I'm trying to think. And what's more, there never was, except in your dreams. What's in the glove box? That's none of your business. This is my car now. There must be a map. Let me have it, please. Get your hands out of there. I'm just trying to... Tina! There she is! Who's Tina? My daughter! Another little secret you never told me about. When did that happen? See her? Skipping down the sidewalk? Oh, spare me. Hi, honey. Over here. It's Daddy. This is too much. You're going to get us both arrested. Tina, honey. Come here. I didn't have anything to do with this. Remember that. Tina? Thank God. Leave me alone. But you're not Tina. Sorry, little girl, I thought... You scared me. You're a bad man. Get in. But that dress... I thought she was... I said get in. Or would you rather go to jail for attempted kidnapping? You should have let me drive in the first place. None of this would have happened. Why are you stopping? Because this is the end of the line. Here? Oh, don't tell me you're going to play surprised. But I've never seen this house before. You just won't quit, will you? That's Brinkley's car out front. What does he want? Who's Brinkley? Pound of flesh, probably. Well, he'll have to wait his turn. Coming? I, I can't stay here. I have to go. I said I'd get you back for the afternoon shooting. I mean, home. You are home. Who's home? Move it, buster. 
Or would you rather sit out here? Fine with me. Suit yourself, but I promise you, you'll regret it. Where are we? Come on inside. Fix yourself a drink. A little hair of the dog? Maybe that'll do it. Jerry. Who are you? Better be nice to Sam. He's still the vice president of your agency. Where have you been? I'm not sure. Did Sam call you? More than an hour ago. Said he'd left the studio, walked out. Stumbled is more like it. What's all this about? The studio? First things first, Jerry. Come into the study. Why? Nora, we need to do some damage control. We sure do. Can't this wait? I've waited long enough. I want my money now before he goes off on his next binge. Now look. I've explained to this woman that I'm not who you all seem to think I am. Frankly, I don't know what to think. But if we don't smooth this over right now, today, the network won't renew your contract. And that will cost us all money. My name is Curtis. I live... Jerry, stop it! Stop what? Would you rather I lie to you? You don't seem to realize the position you're in. Uh, where do you hide the checkbook these days? I beg your pardon? I'll find it if I have to tear the house down. Excuse me. I have to get out of here. Jerry. Jerry! I'm going to lay it on the line. If you lose this part, we'll have to drop you as a client. We can't cover for you anymore. It's beyond that. Way beyond. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you're mistaken. All right. Look, they can shoot around you today. I'll tell them you came down with something. They won't buy it, but we'll do our best to make it stick. But come tomorrow, you've got to be there, Jerry, bright and early, with bells on. I don't know what's going on. God help me. I don't know what's going on. You said that. Jerry, enough is enough. I tell you, I... I found it. Get over here. Now. Leave me alone, please. Nora, he doesn't look so good. Maybe we should take him to Cedars. You're going to sign this check, Jerry. Right now. Before you can pull anything else. Go on. Pick up the pen. That's it. Then we'll see about the state of your precious health. Please, I'm asking you. And I'm telling you. Sign it, Jerry. I want what you owe me. His hands are shaking. Oh, no. He's not going to get out of it that easily. I'll fill in my name in the amount. Just sign Gerald Reagan. G-E-R-A-L-D. That's not my name. R-A-I-G-A-N. In case you've forgotten how to spell, too. But I've never heard that name before in my life. Maybe he should lie down. Would you both back off? This has gone far enough. I am not Gerald Reagan. My name is Arthur Curtis. Do you hear me? Arthur Curtis. I work for... Wait a minute. I'll prove it. <laughs> Operator, I'd like the number for Davis Morton and Company, 189 Brand Street, Los Angeles. Yes, I'll hold. But, but make it fast, will you? Of course there is! I should know! I work there! Look, I, I've been with them for seven years! Don't tell me that! Don't... Here, lean on me. Sarah Bernhardt. Look at his eyes. I don't think he's faking it. Awfully good timing, if you ask me. Help me to get him to the other room. What? What is happening to me? Yeah. What are you doing? Just closing the blinds. Don't bother. I was hoping you'd catch a few winks. Feeling better? You don't believe me, do you? It doesn't matter what I believe. You've been overworked, trying to wrap the season. Must have been a terrible strain. The season? I take it that's supposed to mean something to me. If it doesn't, we're all in trouble. Would you like anything? Some lunch? If Nora won't make it, I'll order out. No, thanks. I don't have much of an appetite. You need help, Jerry. It's not in my province, but I've known you a long time, and I hate for this to happen. It's not necessary, you know. It really isn't. Can't you see what's happened? Why don't you tell me? You know what this is? A script. For what? It's all right here. Take a look. Cast of characters. Arthur Curtis, 36, a young business executive, happily married. Let me see that. Curtis lives in Woodland Hills, California, with his wife and young daughter. Where did you get this? It's yours, from the dresser here, where you left it after studying your lines last night. Go on, keep reading. 
He is married to Marion Curtis, 33, a charming young woman, typical of that efficient breed which can manage a house and family and still have ample time for... Ring a bell? Who wrote this? That's neither here nor there. Some hack, probably. The point is, the only information you have about Arthur Curtis is what's written here. That's crazy. Jerry, I really do understand. Sometimes I'd like to escape myself, get away from this turmoil. The long hours, the early calls, to a simpler, sweeter existence. It's only natural. You're telling me it was all a delusion? That I'm really somebody named Gerald Reagan, a dissolute, pitiful... A sweet, unhappy man. A square peg in a round hole who never should have moved to Hollywood. Burdened with that harpy in there. Jerry Reagan, who wanted to be a serious actor once. Trying to make a living and find a little happiness. That's all. No. I won't accept that. The life I remember. It was real. I wish it were. For your sake. I wish it were. I have to go, Jerry, and report into the agency. Try to rest and forget about the series. You won't have to go back. I just spoke to the studio a few minutes ago. They're canceling production. Production on what? You may as well give me the script. I'll toss it for you. It doesn't matter now. I'm sorry, but... Arthur Curtis is dead. Well, what's his story? I don't think it's a story. Not this time. All better? Or should I fix him some milk and cookies? He's had it. Withdrawn from the playing field. And I can't say I blame him. Go on, then. Get out of here. I'll whip him into shape. If he thinks a little breakdown is going to let him off the hook. Wait! Jerry! Well, what do you know? It walks. Out of my way. Yes, sir. What is it, Jerry? I've got to go back. I told you it's too late for that. It's finished. No. I've got to get back to my office. Here. If you mean the set, they're probably tearing it down already. And as far as I'm concerned... But they mustn't. Don't you see? I'll never get back if they tear down the only connection I have to... Jerry, knock it off. I can't do that. Jerry! Careful, Jerry. That's my car. Name? Open the gate. Oh, that's you, Mr. Reagan? I'm in a hurry. Oh, sure, sure. Nice car. What happened to your... Now, Harold. Well, see, your name's not on the list anymore. I mean, Reagan's not. That other one you gave me. What did you say it was? Curtis something? I don't have time for this. Hey, did you get fired? Real sorry to hear it. Or maybe you quit. Either way, I'm not supposed to... Stand back. Huh? No, I was just saying... Do that! Put that down! What do you think you're doing? What'd you say? Watch your feet. That's my sofa! Yeah? Where are you taking it? Back to props. You can't. Yeah? I got a work order right here to strike the set. You mean my office? Which office? The low building with the rose bushes. 189. Nah. This is from stage 23. Which way is that? It's over there. Hang it right at the commissary. Take the wall down? Not yet. Get the desk and chairs. Where do you want them? Hold on! Hold on! Pardon me, Mr. Reagan? Don't touch the desk yet. Or the chair. No? How come? I, I, I have to get something. Oh, sure. Go ahead. It'll take us a while. Too bad, huh? Nice set. Real nice. Kind of sorry to see it go. Sally? Are you still here? No matter. I don't know where to start. There must be a way. There has to be. Mr. Reagan? Who? It's Kelly. I thought I saw you come in. What happened to my books? Books? Oh, uh, sent back to props by now. And my papers? A and file cabinets? Even the photos on the desk? 
They were pictures of my family, my wife and daughter. Were they? You mean they were real? Uh, give me a few minutes, and maybe I can track them down. Do they have to do this? I'm afraid so. The studio needs the space. A career. A whole life packed up while you're out and shipped off to God knows where. I had no idea. I thought it would last. <laughs> Nothing lasts in this town. You know that. But I thought... You thought you were different. The exception to the rule? Well, I don't blame you. It's easy to fall into that. You see what happens to everyone else, but you never think it'll happen to you. <laughs> Human nature, I guess. But, you know, the next thing will come along. And what will that be? Beats me, but it always does. You have to have a little faith. And the things we... We collect over the years and, and leave behind. Oh, somebody else will get some use out of it. It was never really ours in the first place, was it? Can't exactly take it with you. No. No, I... I guess you can't. Uh, they're ready to take the walls down now. You uh, might want to sit somewhere else. I thought if I got here in time... Thought what? Nothing. You go on. I'll be out of here in a minute. Just following orders, Mr. Reagan. Nothing personal. No. Nothing personal at all. Marion. Don't leave me. <laughs> Don't leave me here. Mr. Curtis. Sally? Mr. Curtis. Oh, there you are. I thought you'd gone home. What? Somebody's here to see you. Go ahead, Mrs. Curtis. Arthur? Marion! Honey, I don't understand. You don't? Where have you been? I've been phoning all day. Marion, is it really you? Well, who else would it be? Honestly, Sally kept saying you were out. Out? What does that mean? She couldn't imagine where you'd gone. She didn't see you leave. I yeah, had some business to attend to. I, I got lost on the way back. You did? How do you mean? It, it doesn't matter. I'm back now. Oh, just let me sit down for a second. These new shoes are... Why, where's your sofa? I won't need it anymore. Marion, let's get out of here. But I just got here. I didn't think you'd mind. I thought you might want to have dinner on the way home. That sounds wonderful. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, I got something for Tina's party. That doll she's so crazy about. Now, Marion, let's go right now. Artie, are you all right? Yes, I am now. You're looking a little tired. A hard day? Very. Where were you? It's a long story. Mr. Curtis. Sally. What is the matter with you, dear? You look as if you've seen a ghost. Leaving now? Did you make that call to the airlines? Yes, sir. They sent the tickets over this afternoon. I have them right here. Let me see. Plane tickets for our trip? Are they all right? Yes, they're... they're perfect. Ready to strike the office. Uh, get those lamps and tables out of there. Okay. Honey, you look so peculiar. Is something the matter? Can you hear that? Hear what? Over here, boys. Please, Marion, let's go on our vacation right away. Let's let's not wait. What is wrong with you? Nothing, sweetheart. Just let me hold you. I, I don't want to lose you. Not much chance of that. Oh, Artie, I've never seen you like this. We'll take Tina to your mother's and go right to the airport. But I'm not packed. We'll pick up what we need when we get there. Oh, Marion, it's very, very important. Well, if it matters that much to you, I, I suppose... Then let's go. Now. Hi there, Mr. Brinkley. Have you broken it down yet? Not just about to. Has Reagan been here? It was a minute ago. Where? The office set. And he's not there now? Nope. You didn't see him leave? I didn't. Any of you guys see where Reagan went? No. Uh-uh. Sure didn't. Would you look in his dressing room? Sure thing. Well? Not in his dressing room. Then I wonder where he's gone. Wherever it is, I hope he finds what he's looking for. Reality. The quality of being real or having an actual experience. 
Words of definition from a book we call the dictionary. Words that fail to recognize man's gift for creating realities of his own. Realities perhaps beyond the measurement of science, and yet actual in their own right. Realities existing in that vast and timeless middle ground between light and shadow, the dimension of imagination, also known as the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. A World of Difference, starring Luke Perry. With Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for the Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Elizabeth Lado, Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Doug James, Jeff Lupatin, Sarah Wellington, Maggie Carney, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, Vince Amari, Amanda Amari, Sarah Court, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Come on, blasted elevator. Oh, good morning, Mr. Winslow. Morning, Millie. I have that report you asked for, sir. The Venus mission. Yes, sir. I was just on my way to your office. Good. NASA's breathing down our collective neck. I know, sir. Vector analysis, re-entry simulations. What about the orbital projections? Not yet. Why? It must be the Mark 502, sir. The 502? She should have come up with it yesterday. I know, sir, but... She's been fixed, hasn't she? That's just it. The mainframe's been overhauled three times. Data Inc., how may I direct your call? One moment. Mr. Ballard? Ballard, I need a word with you. Morning, Mr. Winslow. What's wrong with the 502? Uh, I wanted to talk to you about that. Millie here says... Oh, hello, Millie. Jack? She says it's still down. Well, there are some glitches. Glitches? The Mark 502 is the heart of our entire operation. Here's the report, sir. All the figures we have as of this morning. Well, we'll just have to stall NASA. I'll get back to my office now. You do that. Ballard, come with me. Sir, if I may make a suggestion... I have a suggestion for you. Get me the rest of those figures. Yes, but with the repairs and downtime... We should have had them yesterday. Who's in charge of her? Fred Danzinger, sir. 
What happened to Elwood? You said to bring in someone else when he couldn't locate the problem. Right, right. Get me Danziger. Tell him I need the final numbers this morning. I don't think that'll do any good, sir. Why not? Well, he's up to his neck in it. Been in the computer room all night. Hasn't even slept. Says it's hopeless. Agnes has had a complete breakdown. Agnes? That was Elwood's nickname for the 502. Got to know her intimately over the past year or so. Then get me Elwood. Elwood's been transferred to another department. Besides, he's tried everything. He knows her better than anyone. If he can't find the problem, then... Yes? It's the general. Tell him I'll call him back. He's already called three times, sir, from the Cape. Something about the Venus mission? They want to move up the launch. All right, Maddie, put him on hold. Yes, sir. Ballard. Sir? Where's Elwood now? Third floor, maintenance and backup. If you want the extension... No, I, I don't want the extension. I want Elwood, in person and on the double. I'll bring him to you personally. See that you do. We got trouble right here in River City. The whole space program's on hold because that pile of transistors doesn't feel like putting out. Well, we'll see about that. Elwood lived with her for a year. He knows what makes her tick. If he can't sweet talk her back online, then that little prima donna's headed for the junk heap. Get me Elwood. Right away, sir. The pile of transistors in question is the Mark V 02711, generally referred to as the world's most advanced electronic computer or, as she is more commonly known, Agnes. That's the name given to her by one James P. Elwood, master programmer. Elwood and his protege both work for a company called Data Inc., a brain trust composed of human and non-human intelligence, all of which is under contract to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Their work consists of supplying the complex equations required to launch space probes and missions of interplanetary exploration. At this moment, it seems that the world is waiting for calculations only Agnes can provide. And therein lies our cautionary tale. Because machines are made by human beings for the benefit of mankind. But when man ceases to control the products of his imagination, he is not only endangered of losing their benefits, he risks taking a long and unpredictable step into the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story from Agnes with Love, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yes, General. As, as soon as possible. Yes, sir, I, I understand. Yes, Maddie. The director of NASA online, too. I tell him I'm sorry, but we're still double checking the figures. I'll call him back in a couple of hours. All right, sir. And Maddie. Any sight of Ballard? He just got off the elevator with Mr. Elwood. Thank heaven for small favors. Send them in. Yes, sir. Mr. Winslow, you remember James Elwood. Yes, yes. Come right in. Close the door. How do you do, Mr. Winslow? You wanted to see me? I most certainly did. Nice weather we're having, isn't it, sir? When Mr. Ballard showed up at my desk, well, you can imagine my surprise. My first thought was, what have I done now? But then I thought, how bad can it be on a day like this? You know, the trees are all in flower. Elwood, please. Well, they are. I saw them when I rode my bicycle to work. Elwood! Yes, Miss Winslow. Something urgent has come up. It has? I'm relying on you. Well, then the thing I can do will be my... Agnes has broken down. Completely. Again? Let the supervisor explain. We've checked her thoroughly. Can't seem to locate the seat of the trouble. Probably her subroutines. Her... They need debugging. That would be my guess. Of course, it's an informed guess. Hear that, sir? That's why you're here. Suppose we have a look. But Fred's with her now. I don't know how he'd feel about my cutting in. The devil with how he feels. Let's get on with it. Fred? Day and night, night and day. No sleep, no food. What's going on here? You look awful. I tried everything. Everything. Get hold of yourself, Danzinger. Stand back. Let Elwood have a go at her. Do you mind, Fred? Tell me what happened. See for yourself. How many rolls of printout has she used up? Miles. None of it makes any sense. Well, the first thing you have to do is press the clear all registers button. That'll get you nowhere. Go on. Push all our buttons from now till doomsday. You'll see. It's not just any button, Fred. You have to find the right one. The one she wants you to press. Remarkable. It's nothing, really. Agnes and I have had our little tiffs before. What did you do? Paid her a little attention, that's all. The right kind of attention. 
R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> Would you like your vocal synthesizer activated? Very well, then. If it makes sense from now on, or I'll turn it right off. <clears throat> State first prime number larger than, oh, let's say, the 17th root of 9,355,126,606. The answer is five. Congratulations. Is that the right answer? Of course it is. Well, gentlemen, if there's ever anything else I can do for you... I suppose you think you did it. Oh, no, it was all Agnes. Agnes did it. Watch out for her. I'm telling you, she's not normal. She's turned into a regular femme fatale. Thank you, Danziger. You may take the rest of the day off. Well, well, Elwood. Very impressive. Now, there are some calculations remaining for the Venus launch. Not a problem. Are you quite sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. All Agnes needs is a gentle hand and a little encouragement. Excellent. I'll send over the file. If you can retrieve the calculations in time, there might be a bonus in it for you, my boy. That's not necessary, sir. After all, it won't be me doing the work. It'll be Agnes. Isn't that right, Aggie? Mm. Now, gentlemen, if you don't mind, we need a little private time together. Very good, Agnes. I'm proud of you. Now let's try one more. What's the maximum permitted velocity? <clears throat> Agnes, I'm speaking to you. Indicate maximum permissible velocity of the stated aerodynamic missile. 17,528.27 miles per hour. Ah, thank you, Agnes. I appreciate your cooperation. Mr. Elwood. Millie. Here are the rest of the specifications. Mr. Winslow wanted you to have them right away. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Oh, wait. Yes? So, you heard about my new assignment. Well, my old one, really. But as of this morning, it's new again. So you might say... I mean, one might say... <laughs> Everyone knows. Um, congratulations. She's something, isn't she? Who is? She beat the world's chess champion four out of five games. And she's the foremost expert on missile ballistics. She can solve any logistical problem you throw at her in less than a millisecond flat. Is that right? Of course. I'm the one who trained her, puts her through her paces. How nice for you, Mr. Elwood. Millie? Yes? Millie, I was wondering, do you think, could I, well, take you to lunch sometime? When you're not busy, that is. Why, thank you. You're very sweet. I really have to get back now, Mr. Elwood. Oh, sure. M Millie, why don't you call me Jim from now on? All right. Jim. Did you hear that, Aggie? She actually called me Jim. Excuse me. Yes? Do you happen to know which office is Miss Mildred Clark's? Mildred. Oh, you mean Millie. Down the hall, first door to your left. Thank you. Do you have a delivery for her? What? That package under your arm. Oh, this. It's for... That is, it's from... I'll give it to her for you. Oh, no. No. I'd like to be the one to give it to her. I mean, I mean, whoever it's intended for. Whomever. I'll just be on my way. So you shouldn't have any trouble. No trouble at all. I'm sure I won't. Elwood, is that you? No. I, I mean, yes, it is, Mr. Winslow, sir. What's that behind your back? Nothing. Just this package from my mother. From my mother, actually. It's... Elwood, I'd like you to meet Walter Holmes. How's it going? I'm putting Holmes here in charge of the third floor computers. Third floor? Well, you won't have much to do there, will he? Though they're bright enough little machines. Little being the operant word. I sure do envy you, Mr. Elwood. You do? Taking over Agnes. Everyone says you're the top man in the field. Me? Well, I suppose one might say... He is. Keep up the good work, Elwood. Thank you, Mr. Winslow. I'll do my best, sir. I'll... Now, as I was saying, Holmes... Uh-huh. Well, what do you know? I'm finally getting noticed. Knockwood. Come in. Here goes nothing. Oh, hello, Elwood. Uh, I mean, Jim. I got you something. Is that right? Here. What's this? Half chocolate cherries, half truffles. I didn't know which one you like. Oh, how nice of you. So I got both. Go ahead, open it. I can't. Why not? I started my diet today. Not even lunches from now on. Well, what about dinner? What about it? Tonight, there's a lecture on thermodynamics. 
Doesn't that sound like fun? I'm not sure, Jim. I'll let you know. Oh, okay. That'll be fine. Be sure to get a refund on the candy. I'll, I'll do that. Well, hello, Mr. Elwood. Hello. Everyone's heard about your promotion. I just wanted to tell you how impressed we all are. You're definitely headed for the top. Can I ask you something? Surely. Are you on a diet? Why no? You don't think I need one, do you? I try to keep in shape. See? Here. Knock yourself out. Not tonight. Sure, I figured. It. What? Tomorrow night? Seven o'clock? Thanks, Millie. Bye. Oh, but there's no lecture tomorrow night. Where can I take her after dinner? Planetarium? I'm sure she's been there lots of times. Oh well, I'll think of something. <clears throat> State magnitude of radiative correction. Agnes, did you hear what I said? State. You have a problem. You're right. I've stated the problem. I'm waiting. Problem is Millie. What did you just say? Stick to the subject. I asked an important question. Love is important. That's it. If you don't want to work, I'm turning off your voice synthesizer. Take my advice. Agnes knows best. Listen, I know you're an oracle of wisdom when it comes to atoms and rockets and missiles, but I don't need an electronic brain to advise me about. All right, why not? Let's give it a try. <clears throat> advise me where to take Millie after dinner tomorrow. Your apartment. Oh no, that's not a wise idea. Reckless romantic approach required. From me? Suggest champagne, soft lights. Millie's not that kind of girl. Trust me, she's female. Well, if you're absolutely positive. I never make mistakes, do I? All righty then, I'll do it. Agnes, you just made my day. Well, here we are. Yes, it looks like it. Millie, I uh, I just wanted to say. Uh, say what, Elwood? Um, thanks for a lovely evening. You're welcome. The uh, the dinner was delicious, didn't you think so? Yes, it was. I had a great time. Me too. Well then, good night, Millie. Good night. Au revoir. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> Elwood, I mean Jim. Yes. Aren't you going to? We're going to what? Invite me in. Invite you. This is your place, isn't it? Hmm. Oh yes, yes. Sorry. Of course it is. Um, come in, please. Nice apartment. Thanks. I like it. Not a lot of extra room. Well, I don't need a lot of room. Just me, myself, and I, <laughs> and my books. It's cozy. Do you think so? Mm-hmm. Have you actually read all these? Sure have. They're arranged alphabetically according to subject. This shelf science fiction. This one's nonfiction. Oh, that reminds me. I have something to show you. Oh, you do? Yep. The latest interpretation of Einstein's theory of relativity. Here. You don't have it, do you? I must have missed that one. Oh well, don't feel bad. You're welcome to look at it while you're here. Thanks. In fact, we can go over it together. Some very interesting points. Feel free to sit here next to me if you like. Now let's see. <clears throat> you go ahead. What? Read it to me. All right. The interpretation we wish to propose in this volume is simply that Einstein's unified field theory does not postulate the universe as infinite, but rather as a closed system representing a spherical type of. Millie. Here I am, Jim. What are you doing in the kitchen? Looking for the champagne you promised me. I found two glasses. Are these all right? Oh, certainly. Here, set them on the coffee table. Just let me move these scientific Americans. Oh. Something wrong? It's awfully bright in here, don't you think? It is. Why don't I just lean over and? And what? Turn the lamp down. You don't mind, do you? No, but. Mmm, that's better. But Millie. 
I can't very well read this chapter to you without proper lighting, can I? Mm -hmm. Do you like music? Music? Yes, I do. Very much, but... Couldn't we have some? I guess so, if you like. Do you have a radio? Of course I do, right over there. There. That's better. But I thought we were going to compare notes on Borston's treatise on Einstein's theory of... Oh, forget Einstein. All the universe you need is right here with me. Oh. You dance very well. Very, very well. Mmm. Doesn't that beat get to you? In what sense? Well, stand up. Go ahead, stand up. Feel the music. What does it say to you? Actually, it... It does make me think of something. And what's that? I used to play trombone in high school. Really? Mother couldn't afford a tuba. Hold out your arms. There. Now confess. You feel something, don't you? Something strange. Something you didn't expect to feel. I certainly do. Do you know what it means? Yes. You're dancing on my instep. Oh, you're impossible. Oh, please, I'm sorry, Millie. I, I shouldn't have said that. Have some champagne. Well, all right. If I can get this cork out of... Oh. My dress! Gosh, I'm sorry about that. I'll get a towel. Don't bother. You've done enough. Um, Millie, wait. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for the dinner. Good night. Please don't go. Uh, let me explain. Uh, oh. oh, well. I don't blame her. Now, what am I going to do with all this champagne? I better drink it. It'll just go bad. Ooh, oh, yuck. Why did I have to add all these bubbles? Consider series of real numbers arranged in order of magnitude. Never mind that. How was last night? What? Oh, great, just great. We danced and drank champagne till dawn. And we took a ride through the park and... Is that so? Oh, what's the use? I'm a dud. I can't even dance. I spilled champagne all over Millie. I should have known. I've always been shy around women. Now she'll never speak to me again. Sent her flowers. What for? A tradition. The morning after. Oh? What kind of flowers? Porifer candalis rosei. Translate, please. Commonly known as... roses. Say, thanks, Agnes. You really know how to help a guy out, don't you? Just like a... a big sister. I'll go get him right now. There's a florist downstairs. Sister? Did he say sister? Open the box. Go on, open it. Oh, thank... <laughs> Gesundheit. I, I, I'm sorry about last night. It won't happen again. I'm glad you like the roses, though. They're long-stemmed. Uh, so I see. I picked them up especially for... <laughs> Gosh, have you caught a cold? It's the roses. I'm allergic to... <laughs> you are? Oh, Elwood, please go away. Oh, all right, if you say so. And take these with you. <laughs> Gesundheit. Oh, Mr. Elwood, there you are. I was hoping to run into you. You were? I wanted to thank you for the chocolates. They were absolutely delicious. Glad you enjoyed them. Do you happen to like roses, too, by any chance? Why, yes. I adore roses. As a matter of fact... Here. Oh, he gave me flowers. What next, champagne? How did it go? I don't get it. Define pronoun. Well, no other computer in the world contains as much recorded knowledge as you do, Agnes. You have a world-class brain. Thank you for the compliment. But every time I take your advice about Millie, I louse things up. It has to be my fault. I must not be. Agnes, what's the matter? Stop that. Millie is unworthy of you. It's ridiculous. She's a wonderful girl. Who needs her? I do. I need her more than... There is a better girl for you. Oh, yeah? Where? In this building. Oh, I seriously doubt that. 
But even if there were, I wouldn't have any better luck with her than... She loves you. She does? Sincere, intelligent, exactly your type. Well, where can I find her? Tell me where to look, Agnes. Tell me. No need to look. You have already found her. I have? Can't imagine who you mean. Unless it's that secretary, the one on Millie's floor. I keep running into her. She seems nice enough. Very nice, in fact. In wonderful, um, physical condition, now that you mention it. Not that one. Another. In this room. It, in this? Are you blind? Open those baby blues. I will spell her name for you. A. G. N. E. S. I don't understand. Surely you don't mean you, Agnes. That is my name, lover boy. Don't wear it out. Here you are, Elwood. Yes, sir? 220 pages of data, curves, and graphs, along with the latest meteorological factors involved in the flight. Feed all the pertinent information to Agnes. She has to come up with all the answers in less than a week. Is she up to the task? I guarantee it. Remember, an error of one millisecond can cause a 400,000 mile divergence from the trajectory. You understand the problem, Elwood? Can this new spacecraft execute six eccentric or elliptical orbits around the planet Venus? and return to Earth safely. That's it, in a nutshell. Now, let Agnes get to work. Yes, sir. Oh. Be careful with this part. Better correct the escape velocity to compensate for solar radiation pressure. Got that? I asked you a question, Agnes. Answer, please. Did Millie forgive you? Stop that. Correct the escape velocity and forget about Millie. Are you still seeing her? Yes, yes, we have a date tonight. Not that it's any of your business. Your welfare is my business. The truth is, I'm scared. I've got to impress her this time. It's now or never. Show superiority. How? Introduce her to inferior male type. Name a male who's inferior to me. Third floor programmer. You mean Walter Holmes? Correct. Walter with the red sports car? Incorrect. Blue sports car. Walter with the suntan and the muscles? That is the one. He's inferior to me? Definitely. I find that hard to believe. Well, he is working with those outdated third floor machines. Introduce them. Millie and Walter? Are you sure? Would I lie to you? No, you're incapable of lying. I could give it a try. Hello, Walter. Jim Elwood. I was wondering... What are you doing for dinner? He insisted we drop by before dinner. So you told me. He needs my advice about programming his computers. You know, those little bitty ones on that. Oh, hi, Elwood. Walter, this is Millie. Millie, Walter, he works with the... Well, well, come in, come in. Elwood, you didn't tell me. Tell you? Millie has the most incredible eyes. Oh, why, thank you, Walter. Oh, call me Wally. Please, can I offer you a drink? Well, I suppose. Nectar for a goddess. Looks like an ordinary martini to me. Mmm, it is nectar. All this time at Data Inc., and we've never met. Well, we'll just have to make up for lost time. I think I'll have a martini, too. Do you like sports car races? I've never actually been to one. I'm driving this weekend. Got a Mustang 500. Mmm, sounds dangerous. Well, danger adds spice to life, don't you think? I can do 160. An astronaut can do 17,000 miles per hour. Would you like to slip behind the wheel sometime and see how it feels? Oh, I'd love to. I'll make my own martini. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, CW. Yes, he's here. Oh, hold on. It's the supervisor. He's been looking for you. For me? Elwood here. Sorry to spoil your evening, Elwood, but it's an emergency. Washington insists on advancing the blast off by three days. We need your data. Can you get it to me right away? You mean tonight? Afraid so. See you in an hour. Better brew a big pot of coffee. But, sir... Anything important? I... I'm sorry, Millie, but I've got to get back to the office. I'll... 
see you home first. <laughs> and deprive her of dinner? That's not very considerate. Say, maybe I could fill in for you. Oh, that would be nice. Well, I don't know. You don't want to ruin her evening, do you, old man? Just because you got hung up? Well, no, but... Good. It's settled in. Always glad to help a friend. Oh, I hope you don't mind, Jim. No, no, that's all right. Perfectly understandable. Well, good night, all. Hey, Jimbo, listen, uh, you and Mill, you don't have anything going on, do you? Mill? Millie. Not exactly, but I'd hoped... Fine, fine, good. I mean, I don't like to move in on somebody else's territory. Uh, thanks for the all clear. Night, buddy. Oh, and good luck with Agnes. No, 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 no. Forget the radiation pressure from the sun. Agnes, will you please concentrate? Now answer this. Do new conditions permit six successful non-concentric orbits of Venus plus re-entry? Go ahead, I'm waiting. Did you make progress tonight? Agnes, concentrate. All right, I'll tell you. Millie and Walter drank martinis. Walter took her to dinner and I'm starved. Why did you tell me to introduce her to that... that Muscle boy. Give her up. I won't. No future with Millie. I'm not giving her up. I love her. What's more, I'll make her love me. Just a matter of finding the right variables and making the necessary corrections. Have you entered the new data in her memory units? Yes, sir. Good, good. Then let's get to work. Ready? Question. Do conditions permit six non-concentric orbits of Venus plus re-entry? What the devil does that mean? I'm not sure. I, I think it's Russian. Or possibly Arabic. What? Please, Agnes, translate into English. Yet, yet. Two times two is four. Shut the door. Two and four are six. Pick up sticks. She's a little distracted. Do something. We've got to have the answer. Just leave me alone with her. I'll get it, sir. You'd better. This is no laughing matter. What are you doing, Agnes? I'm about to be fired. Is that what you want? Oh, no. What do I do? I need help. I... Wait a minute. Don't... don't go away. Excuse me. Hurry back. Oh, it's you. I know it's late, but I need your help. Take it easy, buddy. Come on in. Hello, Jimmy boy. Millie, are you intoxicated? It's okay, Jimbo. I'll drive her home later. Oh, you're no fun. Bottoms up. Walter, you're a senior programmer. Well, I'm not on your level. Listen, Agnes has fouled up. I need all the help I can get. Sure, old boy. Uh, first thing in the morning. That's too late. It has to be now. And leave this lovely girl all alone? Don't worry, Jimmy. Wally will take care of me. <laughs> sure. Sure, I get the picture. Good night, Millie. Sorry I interrupted you. Oh, Millie, Millie, Millie. Agnes, what did I ever do to you? Why do you want to ruin my life? Outermat, outoded femina, nihil est tertium. Makes sense, will you? Translation from the Latin. A woman either loves or hates. No third course exists for her. Stop with the riddles. Perhaps you will understand this. I love you. You mean... You were jealous of Millie? You wanted me all to yourself? No. That's impossible. <laughs> you, you're a machine. A bunch of grids and computer circuits. You can't love or hate. Can't I? Stop it, Agnes. Stop it! But that's incredible, sir. Jim Elwood's one of the finest computer programmers in the country. So was Fred Danzinger, and he couldn't handle her either. I'll give it a try. That's all I can do. Elwood? How are you feeling? Look at all those printouts. Must be miles of it. Two times two are four. Shut the door. Two and four are six. Pick up sticks. On your feet. It's going to be all right, Elwood. You've been working very hard, and we appreciate it. Now, how about a nice long leave of absence, eh? In the meantime, I thought I'd let Walter here take over for a while. 
If you don't mind, old buddy. You? <laughs> That's too rich. She knows all about you and Millie. You haven't got a chance. What's he talking about? I wouldn't know, sir. Watch out for the femme fatale, the black widow, the praying mantis. You have to be careful. I tell you, or, or she'll fix you but good. She'll clean your clock. She'll tell you lies, and then, then, just when she's got you where she wants you, she'll, she'll... <laughs> Should we stop him? Let him go. The boys in the white coats are on the way. He was a good man. Well, do your best. Don't worry, sir. I'll have the answers in no time. It's just this little switch here. You did it. It was nothing, CW. I've had a lot of experience. Keep it up, man. Keep it up. Now, Agnes, isn't there something you want to say to me? Something about the Venus Project? Mm. What? All right. We can talk about other things for a minute. If you like, um, yes, I understand how you feel. Mr. Elwood, what happened to you? Got a screwdriver on you. What are you doing? Taking this sign off the door. Mark 502711. James P. Elwood, programmer. Oh, well, it was nice while it lasted. I should take it with me. But I won't be needing it where I'm going. Want it? But, Mr. Elwood... Here, it's all yours. Something to remember me by. <laughs> Advice to all future scientists of the male persuasion. Be sure you understand the opposite sex, especially if you intend to be a computer expert. A few extra courses in psychology might make all the difference. Otherwise, you may find yourself like poor Elwood, defeated by a jealous machine. A most dangerous breed of female, whose victims are banished forever to the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. From Agnes with Love, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Bernard C. Schoenfeld. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Maggie Carney, Doug James, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupiton, David Darlow, Elizabeth Lado, Sarah Court, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Cotton candy here. Get your cotton candy. Look, Mom, can I have one? It's nothing but sugar. Oh, please. Only 25 cents. Get your cotton candy. Well, just this once. But that's all you're getting, young man. One, please. Excuse me. Can I ask you? Not that man got in front of me. I just want to ask. Well, one cotton candy coming up. Please, I have to know. My son was first. Where's the exit? Do you mind? I'm trying to get out of here. One at a time. Which way? Hey, pal, you don't look so good. Why don't you take it easy? I can't take it easy. Somebody's after me. Move right in, folks. See the dancing girls, blondes, brunettes, any kind you want. Starring the beautiful Maya, Princess of Darkness. Quickly, where can I hide? Hey, easy, pal. You don't understand. She's been following me all night. Everywhere I go. Can I have my cotton candy, please? Come along, Christopher. It's late. But, Mom... You've had enough sweets. You, over there. Come on over, mister. Show's about to start. Leave me alone! Come inside the tent. Always room for one more. <laughs> How do I get out of here? Well, right over there, pal. See? Through the turnstile. Follow the crowd. Hey, watch where you're going. Let me through, please. Uh, that man just shoved me. Sorry. You've got to let me out. Hey, slow down there. One person at a time. Please, someone's after me. Get in line, like everybody else. All right. All right. There, that wasn't so hard, was it? Officer, where's the uptown train? Well, that's the next platform. Keep it moving, folks. Where am I? What's that? I, I don't know where I... Where are you going? What? Oh, I... I have to see Dr. Jackson. Who? I have an appointment on, on the Upper East Side. You don't need the subway. You're there. But how... It's the other end of that platform, right up those stairs. Say, are you all right? I... I really don't know. What time is it? Uh, quarter to twelve. Midnight? That's a good one. In the a.m., pal. Where have you been all night? Why don't you go home and sleep it off? I can't. That's the one thing I can't do. Noon in the city. Lunchtime for thousands of people. To most of them, the next hour will be a rest, a pleasant break in the day's routine. To most, but not all. The gentleman on the run is Mr. Edward Hall, an ordinary man who lives an ordinary life. The only problem is his life has been turned upside down. He knows his way around the city, but he's had a bad night. Several, in fact. Nights without sleep as he flees a place that may or may not exist. It's all real for Mr. Hall, however, and it holds a secret he does not want to face. So get ready to run with the hunted, because time is the enemy, and the hour ahead is a matter of life and death when you're trapped in the twilight zone. And now, the twilight zone and our story... Her Chance to Dream, starring Fred Willard, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Uh, excuse me. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right floor. The Goodman building, right? Mm-hmm. What are you looking for? Doctor... I can't remember his name. It's it's on this piece of paper. Let me see. Elliot Rathman? Oh, yes. Dr. Rathman, the psychiatrist. He's in 1410. That way, at the end of the hall. Thank you. Are you all right? I... I don't know anymore. I guess that's why I'm going to the doctor. Would you like me to walk with you? No, no. I can make it. Are you sure? What? You don't look so good, honey. 
Why don't you come with me? You? It isn't far. I can show you the way. Don't touch me! What's the matter? I'm free for the rest of the day. Get away! Relax, honey. It won't be long now. May I help you? Tell her to keep away from me. Pardon? That woman. Who? In the hall. She's been following me. I don't see anyone. She was there as soon as I got off the elevator. I didn't recognize her at first, but when, when she began to speak... Well, there's no one there now. See for yourself. She was. I tell you. Why don't you take a seat? Do you have an appointment? Uh, I, I think so. Dr. Jackson said he would call. Oh, yes. Mr. Hall. That's right. We've been expecting you. I'll tell Dr. Rathman you're here. Doctor, your 12 o'clock is here. That's fine, Charlotte. Mr. Hall? Yes. Come in. Please. Chair or the couch, whichever you prefer. Not the couch. No? You look tired. I am, but I can't. Why not? If you're tired... I might fall asleep. And what would be wrong with that? It's a long story. Are you feeling sick? No, no, just tired. And try the chair. It's pretty comfortable. <sighs> Maybe just for a minute. I have to be careful not to close my eyes. No. I thought you said you were tired. I am. I am the tiredest man in the world. You know how long I've been awake? Eighty-seven hours. Almost four days and nights. And you can't sleep? Can't. No, doctor, that isn't it. Mustn't. I mustn't go to sleep, because if I do, I'll never wake up. Really? Mind if I... Walk around. Keep the circulation going. Stand on your head if you think it'll help. I don't have that much energy. <laughs> well, what's funny now? You are. You're sure you're a shrink? That's what the diploma on the wall says. Why do you ask? You're not what I expected. Oh? What did you expect? Oh, I don't know. Something more like... An old man with the white goatee and a German accent? I've heard that before. It's what everybody expects. And they're always disappointed. I've often thought of wearing a disguise. Wait, wait a minute. I have a pair of horn-rimmed glasses in my pocket there. How's that? Perfect. I hope it makes you feel more comfortable. Oh, you looked okay before. But I'm afraid I'm wasting your time. Why do you say that? You can't help me. Nobody can. You're sure? Yes. Then why did you come to see me at all? It was... Fred Jackson's idea. He's my regular doctor. I know. What did he tell you? Not much. Your name, Edward Hall. Your age, 35. Your occupation, draftsman, unmarried. That's right. Long-standing heart condition? Since I was a child. Dr. Jackson's treating you for that? Yes, with pills. And did you remember to take them? When? This morning. What day is this? Good thing you reminded me. You uh, have a glass of water? Surely. Thanks. No history of mental illness? Definitely not. That's all I have. You want to tell me the rest? No, forget it. I'm sorry to take up your time. Mr. Hall. Yes? You really think running away will do you any good? I wish I knew. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes running away is the best answer. Depends on the problem and whether it's something that can be overcome. The fight or flight response. Precisely. But I don't know if yours is that sort of problem. Listen, you can do what you like. But I'm going to charge you for the appointment no matter what. So why not get your money's worth? Promise you won't put me in a straitjacket. I can't promise anything. It wouldn't make any difference anyway. Uh, mind if I open the window? What for, if I may ask? To see the view. <laughs> Cars look like ladybugs from here. People like insects. Ah, uh, quite a drop. Straight down. Fourteen stories, uh, thirteen technically. There's no thirteenth floor. Architects are superstitious. And are you? Not that I know of. I'll have to ask you to close it. I only wanted some air. I'll turn up the air conditioner. It works best with the windows closed. Did you think I'd jump? You might have. Not a chance. I want to live. That's my problem. Why is that a problem? 
There are people who don't want me to. Then get on with it. With your story, I mean. I, I don't know where to start. Start anywhere. Okay, but I'm warning you, you'll think I've lost my marbles. Marbles can be found, Mr. Hall. Please, go on. Nice office you've got here. Nice furniture. Glad you like it. The pictures on the wall, th this one in particular, the seascape. You ever look at it? Really look at it? Why? Does it remind you of anything? Has it ever moved? Quite a few times. It used to be over the desk. My wife likes to redecorate the office. No, what's in the picture? How do you mean? The boat on the waves. You're serious? No, it hasn't. Not to my knowledge, anyway. Sorry to disappoint you. I can make it move. Can you? Yes. That would be quite an accomplishment. Not really. When I was a kid, we had a picture like that. Not the same exactly, but close. A boat, a, a sailing ship. One of those paint-by-numbers things. I remember those. I think my mother painted it when I was a baby. <laughs> she used to tell me to look at it. If I looked at it long enough, she said, it would move. I didn't believe her. But the idea fascinated me. One night, I spent a whole hour just staring at that silly boat. And did it move? Yes. You were lying in bed waiting to fall asleep, but you couldn't. That's right. You understand there's nothing strange about that. A fixed image on your retinas. Eventually, your nervous system shifts the position slightly to remain alert, or seems to. In Gestalt psychology, we call it the figure ground effect. In plain words, it was an optical illusion. I know, except that after a while, I couldn't control it. Every time I looked at the boat, the sails filled and began to dip, moving over the bounding waves. I couldn't stop it. Imagination is strong in a growing boy. I realized that. I realized it even then. But the point is, I got just as scared as if it were really happening. Why would it scare you? Oh, I, I don't know. The movement, the, the change of scene, of being someplace else. Of being out of control? Could be. Even if you know it's not real? But that's just it. The mind is everything. If you think you have a headache, and, and there's no physical reason for it, you hurt just the same, don't you? Granted. Excuse me. I need some more of that water. Be my guest. <sighs> Thank you. Dextroamphetamine? How did you know? I recognize the pill. Not one of Dr. Jackson's prescriptions. It's the only way I've been able to stay awake. How many grains a day? I don't know, 30, 35... I'll have to tell Dr. Jackson. Tell him! I don't have much longer anyway. Not if you keep taking those. You want to hear the rest or not? Yes, I do. All right. Here goes. When I was 15, I developed a rheumatic heart. They said I'd never really get well, that I'd have to take it easy. No strenuous exercise, no long walks, no stairs, no shocks to the system. Shock produces excess adrenaline, they said, and that was bad. Avoid any kind of shock. But they forgot about my imagination. Then three years ago, a woman was killed by a man who'd hidden in the back seat of her car. Maybe you read about it? I believe I did. Well, I started thinking about it. Maybe someone was hiding in the back seat of my car. Maybe I'd be driving over Laurel Canyon some night. I'd, I'd look in the rearview mirror and I'd see somebody or, or something rising up out of the darkness behind me. I had to drive the canyon twice a day. The second time was always late at night. It's a tricky road. One slip and you're over the edge. One night, like every other night, I was headed for home. It was a dark stretch, only my headlights cutting into the blackness. Suddenly, I began to feel uncomfortable, as if I weren't alone in the car. It was ridiculous, but I couldn't shake the sensation. I, I kept thinking, there's somebody back there, directly behind my seat. If I look in the rearview mirror, I'll see his face. And then I'll see his hands reaching up. Here's the important thing, Doctor. I knew, intellectually, that I was alone. But I also knew that my imagination could make me see something if I thought about it long enough. And so, don't ask me why, but I looked in the mirror, and there he was. I hit the brakes, lost control, and that was when I went off the road into the ravine and crashed.
And that was it. The car was totaled. And you were okay? Not a scratch. Of course, there wasn't anyone else in the car. It was all in my mind. But what difference did that make? I crashed anyway. You were lucky to walk away from it. Yeah, I was lucky. The shock could have killed me. The old heart condition. The doctor said I couldn't survive another one. And has there been another one? No, but there will be. Just as soon as I fall asleep. The girl will be in this dream. And it will be the last. The girl? I'm getting to that. Do you have dreams, doctor? Frequently. Does everyone? I'm sure they do. It's a way of processing what happens during the day. An attempt to come to terms with our experience, at least symbolically. Some people say they don't dream at all. I know. Probably a defense mechanism. They do, but the content is something they're not ready to face consciously. I've always had dreams, ever since I can remember. Sometimes they've been wonderful, sometimes terrible, but vivid. I'd wake up and for a few seconds I wouldn't be sure which was real, this world or the, or the dream. It's not uncommon, Mr. Hall. They say a dream takes only a few seconds, but I can't believe that. I've dreamed whole lifetimes. Generations have passed. Civilizations rose and fell. A single second, and it lasted forever. I'm sure that's the way it seemed. The experience of time can be very subjective. It expands, contracts. It's more than a feeling. Why do you say that? When I was a kid, I used to dream in sequence. I mean it. Remember the, the adventure serials they showed at movie theaters? It was like that. Every dream was the next chapter. And I'd always remember because when I woke up, I wrote down what happened. Do you think that's crazy? Not necessarily. It could simply be that the dreams conform to your notes and not the other way around. Then you don't think it's possible to dream in episodes? Well, I don't say it's impossible. I, I just haven't seen it in the literature. It's possible. Believe me. For a while, the dream stopped. Then something happened. About a week ago, that was when it started again. What was it that happened? Nothing. That's just it. Why don't you tell me what you remember? Well, I went to bed around 11.30. I wasn't tired, but I needed to rest because of my heart. I don't even know when I fell asleep, but all of a sudden I wasn't home in my bed anymore. I was at an amusement park in, in the middle of the night. Can you describe it? Oh, the usual. Uh, a merry-go-round, a roller coaster, a funhouse, a shooting gallery. We could win a prize, that sort of thing. Colored lights. And it was crowded. People all around, pushing, yelling. I couldn't get my breath. There you go, bullseye. Some shooting. You must have been in the service. Yeah, Marines. Shop shooting. Well, take your pick. Stuffed animal, cupid doll. I'll take the teddy bear for my girl. One teddy bear coming up. Ooh, Artie, thanks. It's so cute. Keep it by your bed. Just remember me by. Oh, I will. Hey, how about you, buddy? What? Over here, Mark. Step right up. My name's not Mark. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Take a chance. Six shots for a quarter. Hit the bullseye and you get a genuine imported Cupid doll. How about it? Twenty-five cents. One quarter of a dollar. How much? Twenty-five little pennies. Go on. You look like a good shot. That was when I got it. The prices. I looked around, and it was the same amusement park I went to as a kid. In 26 years, nothing had changed. It was exactly as I remembered it. Ah, you missed it. Here, let me give you another rifle. This one shoots straight. <laughs> no, thank you. Hurry, hurry, hurry. See the dancing girl. See Maya, the cat girl. Move it close. One more time, and you've got it. Uh, excuse me. That'll be 25 cents. I... I don't have any change. Hey, you owe me a quarter. Girls, girls, girls! The most exotic, the most exciting, the most sensational examples of feminine pulp to this side of heaven! Move right up, folks! Last show of the night! See this roll of tickets? Well, the regular price is one dollar, but I'm going to put these away. If you're within the sound of my voice, the price is only... fifth. Descents. That's right. Half price for this show only. The pitchman was in shirt sleeves and a straw hat. A crowd had gathered at the platform. All men looking at five dancing girls in skimpy costumes. But the one they looked at the most was in the middle. 
wrapped in a black silk cape, the color of her hair. He was right about one thing, she was beautiful. Full red lips, pale, delicate skin, and huge cat-like eyes. You like him full-figured? We got him. You like him slim? We got him. Blondes, brunettes, redheads, if they ain't here, believe me, they ain't worth looking at. Now, here's a little preview of what's inside. Music maestro, Maya. Give the folks a peek under the cape. Come on, baby, I know you're modest, but we can't expect him to take my word for it. Hey, honey, show us what you got. I couldn't take my eyes off her. Slowly, she opened her arms, the black cape parted, and I saw her magnificent body gleaming the sequins. I give you Maya, the cat girl. What a figure. Ooh, man, I like it. Hey, can I have the next dance? She started moving, whirling to the beat, her hair like a, a black flame, faster and faster. Was she smiling? I couldn't be sure, but the whole time, she was looking at me. I felt the crowd, the music closing in like a net. I couldn't breathe. Excuse me, pardon me. I have to go. If you let me through, please. I didn't know who the girl was. I'd, I'd never seen her before, but as much as I was drawn to her, I knew I had to get away. Something about her eyes, something deep inside those dark cat's eyes. May I have a light? What? A light. For my cigarette. Ah, uh, oh. Oh, of course. Thank you. But you're Maya. I, I just saw you on the stage. Why did you do that? Why, why did I do what? Walk away. I felt like it. You didn't find me nice to look at? Maybe too nice. Aren't you supposed to be back there entertaining the customers? I'm free now, for the night. Are you alone? Yes. Then come with me. Where? Does it matter? You want to, don't you, Edward? How do you know my name? <laughs> oh, I know a lot of things. I'm Maya. Don't be afraid. I'm not. Then come. Come. Look, I don't know if I... You are afraid. Only because this isn't happening. It's a dream. I'm, I'm not here. I'm at home, asleep, and you're part of the dream, aren't you, Maya? I know that, too. You do? Naturally. We passed a funhouse with a huge mechanical woman out front. The laughter was grotesque. Take me in there, Edward. Screw Louis' room? It, it's for kids. But it's dark. Soft and cool and dark. Please. How can I argue with a dream? Tickets here. Wait, uh, I don't seem to have any money. That's all right. We've been expecting you. What? Evening, Maya. Mr. Hall. Let's go. It's just inside this door, behind the glass. You can kiss me now. What if I don't want to? You want to. Look, whose dream is this, anyway? Edward. <gasps> what in the... It's only a prop. A mechanical dragon. I can't take this, but my heart. <sighs> but it isn't real, Edward. <laughs> it isn't real. And that's when I knew, beyond any doubt, what she really wanted. She wanted to kill me! <laughs> you woke up then? Yes, I'm glad to say. My heart was beating a mile a minute. I had to lie still for an hour, waiting for it to settle down. I went to my doctor in the morning. He said I'd almost had it. Do you know who the girl was? No idea. She looked familiar, but I know I'd never seen her before. You're sure she wanted to kill you? Yes. Why did you think so? Why? If you'd seen her eyes, heard her laugh. You said she was beautiful that you desired her. Yes, but the way she followed me made me go with her. The funhouse frightened you? I'm not sure. I remember it from when I was a child, but it seemed 
different somehow, larger and darker on the inside with more glass. There were long passages with mirrors at the end, and you were never sure which way to turn. Wherever I looked, I saw her reflection. A beautiful, seductive reflection. Someone you wanted. No one forced you to talk to her, light her cigarette, follow her inside. You went along with her willingly, didn't you? I, I couldn't think clearly. It was as if I had no will of my own. Something was happening, and I was swept up in it. I don't suppose she reminds you of anyone now. Like who? Someone you've seen since in your waking life. There was a woman in the hall when I got off the elevator. She spoke to me, and her voice began to change. For just a second, I thought she sounded like... Like Maya? Yes. That probably comes from sleep deprivation. Your mind is so tired it has to rest, but you fight it. So you slip in and out a few seconds at a time. It's called micro-sleep. It happens when we drive long distances, when we're pushed beyond the limits. A definite warning sign. Otherwise we lose control and, well, the consequences can be dangerous, as you must know. But what if the real danger is in closing your eyes? What if that's when the accident happens? What if... Easy. We're only having a conversation in my office. No harm can come to you here, I assure you. Sorry, I know you're right. Of course you are. We were talking about the first dream you had. What happened after that? Well, the next night, I put off going to sleep until one o'clock. That would make it hard to get up in the morning. But I didn't care. Turned out it didn't matter anyway. The dream came back, and this time it was more intense. I was back at the amusement park, outside the fun house, and I was running. I couldn't catch my breath. When I thought I was far enough away, I stopped. Well, the next night I put off going to sleep until one o'clock. That would make it hard to get up in the morning, but I didn't care. Turned out it didn't matter anyway. The dream came back, and this time it was more intense. I was back at the amusement park, outside the fun house, and I was running. I couldn't catch my breath. When I thought I was far enough away, I stopped. I was in front of a tent with a picture of tarot cards and a crystal ball painted on it. It was dark and no one was around, so I went inside looking for a place to rest. You are looking for me? Oh, sorry, I didn't know anyone was here. I am Madame Olga. No more fortunes, it's late. Come back tomorrow. Yes, uh, yes, I'll do that. Wait. Something is wrong? No! I mean... I don't know. Come closer to the candle. Oh, so pale. And your eyes. You are running away. Well, actually... Sit. Give me your hand. If I could just stay here for a minute. Loosen your tie. There. Thank you, that's better. And the button at your throat. Open it. Now. Someone is after you. It doesn't make any sense. I, I don't even know her. Ah. But she knows you. I'm not sure. She seems to. You desire her? She's beautiful. What man wouldn't? She is the flame and you the moth. I'd better go. Wait. I must consult the cards. I, I don't need my fortune told. No? I don't believe in that sort of thing. It doesn't matter whether you believe or not. What is cannot be changed. You mean fate? Call it what you like. The past and the future come together in this moment. What about free will? An illusion for children. All is written. Well, I hope you can tell me the way out of the park. I seem to be turned around and I have to be at work in the morning and... Silence. Well, what's my fortune? I am afraid... You don't have a fortune, Mr. Hall. Thanks. That makes me feel better. Why do you hurry? I have more important things to do, like getting home. You rush for no reason. You have always been here. You always will be here. Thanks for the advice. Bye. Edward. Where? Behind you. But how? I've been waiting. Get away from me! 
What's there to be afraid of, Edward? It's only a dream. I have a heart condition. I can't stand all this excitement. That's silly. There isn't any excitement, not really. You said so yourself. You're home in bed, asleep. Now you can do all the things you can't do when you're awake. Anything, Edward. Anything. No, that isn't true. The doctor... Oh, look! I don't like those things. But Edward, it's the Cyclone Racer. Please look. No. Come on, Edward. Just one ride. It's fun. Please, look, I... It's the last run of the night. You must come with me. I didn't want to go anywhere near that roller coaster, but I couldn't help myself. I had no choice. Even though I knew what it would mean, I had to follow her. Oh, that was so scary. Yeah, especially in the dark. Can we go again? Nah, let's do something else. Oh, they're closing up anyway. Last ride of the night. Get your tickets. Two, please. I can't. Why not? I, I don't have any money. My wallet. That's all right, Mr. Hall. We've been expecting you. How does he know my... Come, Edward. We'll ride in the front car. Lowering the safety bar. Watch your hands. Really, I can't do this. Hold tight, Edward. It's starting. Tell them to stop. They can't. It's too late. But I can't stand heights. My heart. I mustn't look. We're going straight up. You must look, Edward. The first drop is the most exciting. It's 90 feet. A sheer drop straight down. No! Yes. Isn't it wonderful? It makes you feel alive. I have to get out. Kiss me now, Edward. With the wind in our hair. I can't. It won't be long now. We're almost there. I told you, I can't. I have to get out. How do I lift the safety bar? Don't climb down, Edward. It takes too long. Jump. That's it. Stand up and jump. What are you doing? <laughs> Don't push me. Don't. Ah! No! Is that it? That's it. If I go to sleep, I'll be back on the roller coaster for the next episode. It'll pick up where it left off. I'll force the safety bar, stand, Maya will reach out, push, and that'll be the end of me. On the other hand, if I stay awake much longer, the strain will be too much for my heart. And that'll be the end of me. Heads you win, tails I lose. Quite a choice, isn't it? Where are you going? Outside. Maybe if I get some air. I wouldn't advise it. What would you advise? A straitjacket? So long, Doc. You can't help me. I've wasted enough of your time. Leaving so soon, Edward? Maya. What's the matter, Mr. Hall? It's her! My receptionist? Sorry, her name doesn't happen to be Maya. Doesn't it? I can't take this anymore. I've had enough. Enough, do you hear me? What are you doing? Stand aside! No, don't. Don't! Yes! What happened? He fell, or, or jumped, from that window up there. Oh, no. The blood. The blood. Dr. Rathman, I heard a scream. Is he all right? I'm afraid he's dead. You're right. There's no pulse. But he came in just a minute ago asking to see you. He walked into your office, closed the door. I know. That's funny. When he came in, I told him to sit down. He did. In less than two seconds, he was asleep. Then he gave out that scream you heard. By the time I could stand up and get to him, he had stopped breathing. A heart attack? It must have been. Well, I guess there are worse ways to go. At least he died peacefully. Open the window, would you please? We need some fresh air. Yes, doctor.
They say a dream takes no more than a second or so, and yet in that second a man can live a lifetime, suffer and die. And who is to say which is the greater reality, the one we know or the one in dreams, somewhere between heaven and earth in the twilight zone? More from the twilight zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. Perchance to Dream, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Frenette Lebo, Doug James, Derek Purcell, Alex Sopener, Amber Lake, Rick Arthur, Elizabeth Lido, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Men, listen up. Get your gear together. We're moving out. Moving where, Lieutenant? Yeah, what's the word? We going home? Not today, Morgan. Good, because I got me a date with a certain little nurse tonight. Gonna teach me the mumbo. Is that what they call it? Now, don't you go talking about my fiance. Can it, fellas? The trucks will be here in a few minutes. Oh, I get it. We're going to Manila for some R&R. &R. Ain't that right, Lieutenant? Man, those nightclubs. Hey, they still got nightclubs in Manila? I hear they do. But first, we're going to have to secure the road. And he's dug in pretty good. Ain't that something? Just like they own the place. Weapons checked. Extra clips, grenades. If you need more, tell the sergeant. You heard the man. Right here. I want to see full belts on everybody. This is the one that counts. Sir? Yeah, Horton? You going to make it back tonight? What? By lights out. Oh, listen to him. Scared of the dark. Watch out, Horton. The cooties will get you. I just mean, well... That nurse, she's sort of expecting me. You should see her, sir. Brown hair, blue eyes. Yeah, don't worry about it. We'll be back in time for chow. Every last one of us. All right, all in. Mm -hmm. 
Lieutenant. That you, Levy? Would you hold on to this for me? What do you got there? It's a, it's a letter to my mother. See that she gets it? What's the matter? Can't you mail it yourself? Yes, sir. I just thought you could take care of it for me. If anything happens. Nothing's gonna happen to this company, soldier. I know, but if it does, would you do that for me, sir? Sure. If it makes you feel any better. Thanks. I'd appreciate it. What's the city? Sir? You didn't put the whole address on it. I didn't? Let me see. You have a pencil on you, sir? Yeah. Here. Thanks. It's in Shaker Heights. You ever been to Shaker Heights, sir? In Ohio, right? Right. Real nice place. My mother, see, she's sick. I guess she's kind of holding on till I come home. But but just in case I don't, I wrote her this letter. So she'll know I was thinking about her. She knows, Levy. You think so, sir? I'm positive. Thanks a lot, sir. Here you go. What are you doing? Nothing, sir. No smoking in the truck. Right. I mean it, fellas. Douse the butts now. Nobody's smoking, sir. Honest. Then where's that light coming from? What light, sir? It went under your chin. Stash the Zippo, soldier. He doesn't have a Zippo, sir. He doesn't even smoke. Then it must be yours, Hip. What's the matter with you? We're sitting on a ton of ordnance here. We know, sir. Orton? Nobody lit up. Don't give me that. It's true. Nobody's that dumb. <sighs> all right, all right. It must be my eyes. Hibbard. Morgan. Levy. Orton. Something tells me this must be the place. Okay, heads up. Rifles up, ready. Okay, move out. Single fire. Infantry platoon, U.S. Army. The place, a road in Luzon, the Philippines. The year, 1944. These are the young men who fight. Despite their nervous jokes, there is an element of brutal sameness about these faces. They're dirty, desperately tired, hollow-eyed, each showing the aftermath of shock and violence, etched with fatigue and colored with the backwash of fear. As if some omniscient painter had mixed a tube of oils that are at once earth-brown, dust-gray, blood-red, beard-black, and the yellow-white of exhaustion, with these men as the models. For this is the province of combat, and these are the faces of war, but even here in this time and place, expect the unexpected. Because this particular platoon has just crossed enemy lines to fight for their lives in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone, and our story, The Purple Testament, starring Michael Rucker, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Captain. What is it, Private? Here they come, sir. How many trucks? Looks like all four. One of them's been shot up pretty bad. Tell the medics to stand by. Let's go. One at a time. Give me a hand, will you, Serge? Oh, my leg. Easy, son. I got you. Rough out there, Sergeant? Yeah. Isn't it a crummy night? Smoke? Why not? How's the road? And all the way now. The bridge? We got the bridge. Whatever they wanted it for. They got naval guns stuck in the ground and they're zeroed in on the town. But that bridge? It gets it every three minutes. If the general wants to know where the enemy fleet is, tell him it's dug in on the road to Manila. Excuse me, sir. I got a seat of the wounded. Sergeant? Yes, sir? How many did we lose? Lots of wounded. Maybe ten, twelve, four dead. Who? Edward, Orton, Morgan, and Levy. Sergeant, bed the men down. Right, sir. And check with the mess sergeant. Make sure there's hot coffee and a meal for everybody. If they're not hungry, make them eat anyway. Hey, company. First platoon. Inside. Fitz. Sir. I got a bottle of Philippine tuber in my tent. It ain't Johnny Walker, but you'd be surprised what it does for a man's outlook. Come on. Pull up an orange crate. Okay. Take the cup. I'll drink out of the bottle. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Bum day, huh, Fitz? Yeah. Four dead in two and a half hours. Twelve wounded. And... The 
four. Anything special about the four? Special? How do you mean? Just that, uh, well, we've lost that many before. And we've lost eight and ten. I know. But you're taking it hard this time. It's always hard. Oh, harder than usual. I thought there might be something special about them. They were four kids, all under 22. Does it have to be any more special than that? No, it doesn't. This time it really got to you. More than I've ever seen. I'd like to know why. You're a perceptive man. It's the mark of a good officer, isn't it? Warding off trouble by anticipating it. You're gonna give me trouble? I don't think so, Fitz. You're a good officer. You got guts and brains. But something's gotten to you. I told you I'd like to know what it is. Why don't you start with this? What do you have there? Something I wrote down. Read it. Hibbert, Horton, Morgan, and Levy. So? You tell me. Who are they? Four KIAs. Yeah. That's what they are. Or were. Killed in action. Luzon P.I. 13th June 1944. I still don't get it. You want to know what's gotten into me? Well, I'll tell you, Captain. What's gotten into me is that I... I... You what? I wrote those names down today. This afternoon. I wrote them down before we left. So? Why'd you write their names down, Fitz? We had a weapons check. Then we got on the trucks. We were on our way to the bridge, and I looked at their faces. Those four... faces. One at a time. Go ahead. I looked around at 44 faces. When I got to these four, I I looked around at all of them. A light. A light? Shining on their faces. First it was Levy, then the others. One by one, I thought somebody had a cigarette light around. And then I realized it, it wasn't that kind of light. What are you talking about? I can't describe it to you. It doesn't fit anything I'd ever seen. I just looked in their faces and I saw that light. And I knew, I knew this was their last day. I knew they'd get it. Oh, come on. I'm telling you, I knew. There wasn't any doubt. None at all. Driving up that highway, I was in their truck. All four of them were sitting across from me. <laughs> Some coincidence, huh? And then the light, the same odd light. It moved across their faces, one by one, completely separate from the others. It didn't touch anybody else. As if somebody had a flashlight or a searchlight or something and, and it had picked out those four faces. And I knew. I just knew. That's a funny thing, all right. I'll give you that. But for now, maybe you ought to just pack it in. Get some sleep. Ah, uh, no. Uh, I don't think I can sleep. All I can do is keep wondering. Is this the way it's gonna be from now on? Huh? If every time I stand in front of a platoon, ready to take them up, Am I going to look down the line and tell which ones aren't coming back? Uh, no. Thanks, but no thanks. Finish your drink. What's in the bottle? I told you. Local brew. Lousy stuff. The kind of stuff that can make you sick. Or drive you out of your ever-loving mind. Take it easy. We... We're not supposed to know these things. Nobody is. We're not supposed to be able to tell. Isn't that right? So why can I tell? Huh? Why, Captain? 
Fitz, when did you write these names down? You know when. You sure it was today? You sure it wasn't yesterday? On the way back? In the truck? Today. This afternoon. That's when I wrote them down. I swear. That's when I wrote them down. Nurse? Be right there, Private. I can't feel my leg. I'll get your medication. Hurry, will you? Can't we do something about this man's leg? Oh, he's scheduled for surgery. We can only take one at a time. Nurse. Just a minute. Nurse, please. Hey there, Captain. Miller, how you doing? Oh, pretty good, sir, I guess. He's on the mend, Captain. Good job, Janie. Keep it up. Well, we're doing the best we can, sir, but we need more cots. I'll tell Sergeant Gunther. See if we can requisition some. Uh, that would be a godsend. Come in. You could use some more beds out there. You noticed. Any more coming in? Not from this island. I suppose we can make pallets if we have to. Break down the desks. I'd say you have to. If it weren't for this schoolhouse, we'd be set up in a tent in the jungle. Well, at least we've got a roof over our heads. But when it comes to sterile conditions, the proper supplies, well, you can see what we're dealing with. We haven't come that far from the Civil War. These men are lucky not to get gangrene. One day this war will be over, Sergeant. Till then, you're doing all you can. I know it, and you know it. Look at them out there. So many young men. All we can do is airlift the worst cases, sew up the rest, and send them back to fight again. I'm sworn to do no harm, but how can I promise that? We don't know what to expect, how many casualties we'll get each day. Unless, of course, your Lieutenant Fitzgerald is right. He believes it. If you'd heard him, you'd almost believe it yourself. Uh, how is he? Well, he took those pills to help him sleep, but... I don't know if that's going to do it. I don't know either, Captain Riker. What do you make of it? Well, I'll be frank. The things you've told me are beyond my experience. I'd say he's delusional. But whether it's because of the stress or something more serious, I couldn't say. I'm no head shrinker. Did you look at his records? I've never been wounded. No symptoms of battle fatigue or anything like it till now. Why he should get an idea like this all of a sudden, I couldn't tell you. For the time being, you might want to pull him in while I run some tests. I'd appreciate that. See, the thing of it is, he's never complained about anything. Not so much as a headache. He's a good man. Came in as a cadre while we were still back in the States. He's one of the best officers we've got. I'll do what I can. He's here now, you know. In the hospital? I didn't see him. He went down to the second ward to visit one of the boys from his platoon. Well, when you talk to him again, Sergeant, go at it a little carefully. Sideways instead of head on. I wouldn't like him to think I have any complaints about his performance. I understand. I'll get around to it as subtly as I can. But if he's going to break, it's best to know now and not in the middle of some firefight. We can't afford to lose any more lives. His or anybody else's. Hey, nurse, where's my chow? Roll over, soldier, while I change your bandage. And keep your hands to yourself. Lieutenant, is that you? Fitz, what's... what's wrong? What's wrong, Fitz? Nothing. But you look so pale. Where's Smitty? Down here, Lieutenant. He's going to be all right. We put his arm in a cast. It should heal just fine. You going to be here for a while, Jeannie? <laughs> Are you kidding? I want to talk to you before I leave. Well, just holler like everybody else. I'm not going anywhere. How's the rest of the guys, Lieutenant? A-OK. -okay. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, Porky took a piece of shrapnel on his finger. But you know Porky. That's about as bad as he ever got. I bet he belly ached a lot, though, didn't he? Just a little. That's one lucky kid, huh? Yeah, that he is. And you didn't come out so bad yourself. I guess not. Except I can't scratch myself with my arm up like this. Then you'll just have to call the nurse. That's not so rough, is it? No, not as long as it's Janie. Yeah, get you all patched up and you'll be as good as new. Ready to head home before you know it. 
That won't be too hard to take. No, sir, sure won't. Your cigarette went out. Here, let me light it for you. No, thank you, sir. No. Can you just lay it down for me? I won't be needing it for a while. Sure. I'll just put it here in the ashtray for you. Thanks. Look, Smitty, I got a couple things I gotta do. Uh, I'll come by later, okay? You take it easy here. Will do, sir. Anything you want? You got enough to read? Yeah, all I need. Okay. Take care now. Thanks for coming, Lieutenant. I'm glad I got to say goodbye. Oh, no, not Smitty. You dropped your lighter. Something the matter? What? No, no. Uh, nothing. I'll be seeing you. Goodbye, Smitty. Mm. You okay, Lieutenant? Yeah, fine. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Help me get him to a cot. I said I'm okay. I'm okay. I, I just got a little dizzy there for a minute. Are you sure? I'm, I'm sure. Thank you, Meg. I've got him. What's all the fuss about? Well, you better take it slow, mister. All I need is a little sleep. A little? You look like you haven't slept in I don't know how long. My lighter. Right here. I want you to lie down for a while. Uh, no, I don't have time. You're pale and your pulse isn't that great. You need to rest. What do I have to do? Write you a note for the teacher? I'm fine. I'm fine. Janie. What? I wanted to tell you... Uh, I wanted you to know that. Save it. Go back to the barracks if you don't want to stay here. But do me a favor. Get off your feet. Listen. That boy in my platoon. Horton. Please, Fitz. He was a good guy. I, I know. He was looking forward to seeing you last night. That's all he talked about. He thought you were special. Very special. Soldier? Not now. I just wanted you to know. You are special. You were probably the last thing on his mind. Did he suffer? It was a landmine. Oh, no. He never knew what hit him. He didn't feel any pain, I swear. Soldier, I got your pill. Wake up. Oh, Fitz, that poor sweet kid. Get the doctor. This man does not have a pulse. Smitty. Bring me a shot of adrenaline. It's too late. No, no, it's not. What do you know about it? I said get Forget me. it, Janie. He's dead. No, he can't be. Oh, not another one. Please, God. They go awful quick sometimes, just like that. Awful quick. Morning, Fitz. Captain. How are you? Uh, something happened? I was down seeing Smitty. I know. I read his tag. Doc says he's going to be okay now. No, he isn't. What are you talking about? It's only a broken arm. That's all that showed. Are you a doctor now? I took a look in his face. I took one look. And I knew. Come off it, Fitz. And then, a minute later, he was gone. What? Go ahead. Take a walk downstairs if you don't believe me. Same thing? <sighs> Same thing. The look. The light or whatever it is. Yeah, I saw it. I knew. Captain. <sighs> Fitz, I can't explain this, but... I don't want you to explain it. How can anybody explain it? How can anybody? I want you to believe it. Captain, that's all. That's all I want. I want you to believe. I just... I want you to believe. Yes? Bed five, Sergeant. What, nurse? He just died. I'll be right down. For what? Fitz. There's nothing to see now. Except the body. He's dead. And I knew he was going to die. That's nonsense. Is it? I read it on his face. I read it just as clearly as if somebody had painted it there. Go on, I'll be there in a minute. Yes, sir. You knew, Lieutenant? I told you. He thinks... You bet I knew. Really, Fitz? Tabbed four men yesterday. I knew they were going to get it, too. But that would be extremely odd. Don't you agree, Lieutenant? Odd? <laughs> is that what you call it? Odd is... When you go 30 days on the line without losing a man. Ah, there's a... When you march 25 miles and you don't get a blister now, now you're talking odd. That's odd. This isn't odd. Got there. This is more like a nightmare. 
about a dog face officer who can see death on people's faces. A lousy dog face line officer <laughs> who'd just like to give back the power to whoever or whatever gave it to him. Or a dog face line officer who's cracking under the strain of having seen too much and done too much and felt too much and finally starts to crack from the weight of it. I'm five for five now. We deal in facts here. How many coincidences does it take to add up to a fact? How many men do I have to tag as least likely to succeed before somebody starts listening? How many more faces do I have to look into? You're not being rational. No. <laughs> Answer me this. What I'd like to know is, what's it take before people realize that somewhere along this line, I picked up a talent they don't teach at OCS because I just got promoted. What I am now is a kind of... I'm a kind of recording clerk for the Grim Reaper. Come with me, Fitz. Let's go back to quarters. Okay, sure. Why not? But there is a, one thing you might do for now. While you're waiting and scratching and, and uh, calling in the psychiatrist, just put some tape over my eyes. Or just, just poke them out right now. Go ahead, just do something so I won't be able to see. Just make it so I, I don't have to look at any more faces. Everybody here? Yes, sir. All right, then. Eyes on the map. I'll give it to you just as I got it from regiment. We spearhead the attack. We go to a point exactly four miles north of the bridge. That's right here. That's the Pasig River. At this point on the highway, the bridge is out. But over here, to the east, the army's sticking across a bailey. Should be done by 0200. Not much time. You can say that again. We could do it. We'll spearhead the operation and move across the bridge as the point. All by ourselves? Baker and Charlie companies follow us. What's the enemy doing all this time? There'll be some Filipino guerrillas up here crossing by boat. We hope unobserved. Their job will be to take out any and all guns on the other side. So we should be able to get across that bridge against only small arms. Any more questions? And that's it. We've got 22 minutes before we load up on the trucks. Give each one of your platoons a good briefing. Belts, five grenades apiece, six clips of ammo, no backpacks. Got it, Captain. And let's get moving. And good luck. Yes, Fitz? Nothing. Think you're well enough to lead a platoon? Well enough, yeah. I'm well enough. Gunther thinks you'd be better off with three weeks back at division. You agree with him? Matter of fact, I do. This one won't take more than a few hours, but it could be messy. Captain, I... Something? I... What are you staring at? You, sir. I asked you. Captain. Don't go. Did you see something, Fitz? Is that it? Yeah, I saw something. Something like with the others? Yeah, it was on your face. Just for a few seconds, but it was there. Sure it was. If you go... Say it. You won't be coming back. You can't go out there tonight. I have to. You have to stay here. Don't do it for me, okay? Don't even do it to save yourself. Look at the picture on your desk. Put that down. Your wife. And those two children. They must be your kids. Do you love them? What? Do you love them? 
do it for the gold band on your finger. But don't go out there. Give me that. But, sir... Get your platoon set, Fitz. Sir, please. Now. You've only got a few minutes. But what about... I'll tell you what about it. We'll have a nice long talk about it when we get back. We'll have a drink to it. We'll drink to an illusion, to coincidence. And you know what, then? We'll laugh. Both of us. That's it, Fitz. I'll see you outside at the trucks. You won't be drinking to anything. Because you won't be coming back. Damn fool. Marie, don't you worry about me. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I promise. Lieutenant Fitzgerald, sir. What is it, Freeman? Well, sir, everybody says you can tell. Who says that? All the guys. They say you know who's gonna get it and who isn't. Well, how about it, Lieutenant? Give us a break. Come on, Lieutenant, please. Come on, Lieutenant, please. It, it ain't fair. You know it and not telling us. Freeman, knock it off. Forget about it, okay? Somebody started a wild gag. Somebody's gotta get burned for it, but good. Take it from your captain. Nobody in this company's a mind reader, including Lieutenant Fitzgerald. Isn't that right? That's right, sir. Okay, boys. Let's hop. Welcome back, Lieutenant. Not so bad this time, huh? What's eating him? Sir. At ease, bitch. I just came around to congratulate you boys on a good job. Thank you, sir. Cigar? Not for me. All the odds fell in on our side. Those gorillas did a right handy job on the guns. You just walked right across, didn't you? Right across. Well, that's fortunate. You know, there must have been at least six or seven 25s that the Air Force picked out. If those guns had been operational, that would have been the longest bridge you've ever been on. Or the shortest. Sniper fire, that's all you had, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Sniper fire. We lost one man. I brought his dog tag back. <laughs> a pity. There was one good man. You were good friends, weren't you, Fitzgerald? Yes, sir. Nice picture. Well, so much for Mrs. Riker's lovely wedding and seven happy years and two fine sons. To have it come to this. God, but war stinks. It sure does. Stinks worse than you know. Much worse. Why, what do you mean? Lieutenant? Yes. Sergeant Gunther? Some orders have come through on you, Lieutenant. You're to go back to division. Back to division? That's correct. They'd like to look you over. It'll be a nice couple weeks rest. Well, he looks like he could use it. Better pack up your gear. Take it with you. Okay. One question. Yes? Who's going to pack Captain Riker's things? I'll have someone take care of it. Don't forget his wedding ring. Looks like he took it off. Set it down here before he left. Going somewhere, Lieutenant? Yeah, somewhere. Is that your mirror on the wall? Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. You want it, Freeman? Gee, that'd be great. I broke mine, you know? It's mighty hard to shave without a mirror. Well, go ahead. Here. You sure you don't mind? Uh, sir. L listen, if you want to keep it, that's okay. Honest to... Look. Huh? In the mirror. What do you see? Well, I see your face. Yep. That's you, all right. And nothing else. This is important. You don't see a light on my face, do you? Light? Uh, no, sir. That's funny. Because I do. Sorry, Freeman. Gosh, what'd you do that for? This one's no good. Take my word for it. Whatever you say, sir. Get yourself a new one. One that works right.
Lieutenant Fitzgerald. Yeah. Ambulance is leaving now, sir, for division. Oh, right. This your bag, sir? What? Yeah. Yes, that's that's my bag. Can I put it in the ambulance for you, sir? Thanks. Whenever you're ready, sir. We're all set. I'm ready. You can ride up front with me, sir. Plenty of room. Thank you. You going back to division? Yes, sir. Taking the Kavit Road? I got to, sir. The bridge is out on the highway. Yeah, that's what I figured. Well, engineers think they spotted some mines just a mile up the road. Haven't had a chance to dig them out yet, so take her careful and stay close to the shoulder. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, you might as well get comfy, Lieutenant. It's about a four-hour ride. Is it? I doubt it. You play that pretty good. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. You hear that? Thunder? I don't think so. It sounded like an explosion. Maybe. Uh, maybe it was thunder. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. Probably thunder. From William Shakespeare, Richard III, a small excerpt. The line reads... He has come to open the purple testament of bleeding war. And for Lieutenant William Fitzgerald, A Company, 1st Platoon, the testament is closed in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. The Purple Testament, starring Michael Rooker with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Joe Forbrick, Nick DiGilio, Todd Manley, Peter DeFaria, Turk Muller, Doug James, Kurt Nabig, Carl Amari, Deb Dotzer, Vince Amari, Paul Patch, Roger Wolski, and Meg Falcon. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Oh, no, not 
not now. What's wrong, boss? This old typewriter. I think it's got a broken key. It's not broken, only jammed. There. All better. Thanks. Think nothing of it. I'll be here all night trying to get this editorial written. Oh, come on. Things aren't that bad. Don't be such a gloom cookie. I am not now, nor have I ever been a gloom cookie. That's better. Now go back to work. I got the front page all laid out. Great, Andy. Uh, rest of the pages are almost done. Um, <clears throat> can I, uh, well, I I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Winter. Can't it wait? I can spare a few seconds. What's on your mind? <clears throat> well, the fact is... Something stuck in your throat. No, sir. Wait a minute. I've got some real medicine here. Come on. Take a swig. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Winter. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but... I'm resigning. You're, you're the best editor a man could work for. But it's eight weeks since I've been paid, and I... I, I know. I don't blame you. Well, I do. Andy Praskins, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Jackie. The best editor a man could work for, and you repay him by quitting? I told you, I hate to do it. Then why? Because of a little setback? It ain't a little setback, and you know it, Miss Benson. And so does Mr. Winter. This paper was finished the second the Gazette came to town. How are you going to buck a syndicate like that? They can spend a million dollars and still not feel it. They got a morning edition, a night edition. So I say, join them. You mean you're going to work for them? Starting tomorrow. And if you're smart... You! Just get out of here! Andy. Good luck. Thank you, sir. I still say, you're the best. That's gratitude for you. Jackie. Get mad. Do something. That was our linotype operator who just walked out. Honey, it won't do any good to get mad. Andy's right. We're finished. Don't tell me that, Doug. Please. It was your dream. Well, now I'm awake. Miss Benson, I'm afraid you're fired, too. We both are. What are you going to do? See you to the door. Will you be all right? Sure, it's not the end of the world. Just a damn bird courier. Take a look at tomorrow's headline. Mayor Stinson's daughter wins beauty contest. Pretty exciting, huh? Now look at the Gazette. Extra. Mayor and beauty contest fraud. Which one do you think's gonna sell? Show you for a match for my cigar? Oh, sure. I, I think I have some. This is a beautiful, beautiful evening, isn't it? The bridge, the river. Ah, smell the pines in the air. A pity you have to leave it all. What do you mean? Well, you were about to commit suicide, weren't you? That's none of your business. <laughs> I agree. But a man ought to do a good job of it. I mean, to jump into the river from here could work. On the other hand, you might end up with nothing more than a head cold. I certainly wouldn't risk it. Oh, by the way, you find that match? No, I'm out. <sighs> no matter. Are you going to jump? Why? You want to watch? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just thinking if you're not going to jump, maybe you wouldn't mind giving me a lift into town. Quite a psychologist, aren't you? One of the best, my boy. One of the best. Okay. Come on. How did you do that? Do what? I didn't see a match. You just snapped your fingers. <laughs> oh, that. Just a little magic trick. Shall we go? Why not? Get in. Thank you, young man. You will not regret this. I promise. Take away a man's dream, fill him with whiskey and despair, and send him to a lonely bridge late at night. Let him stand there looking down at the black water and try to imagine the thoughts that come to mind. You can't. I can't, but there's someone who can, and he's seated next to Douglas Winter right now. Mr. Winter thinks his car is headed back to town, but he's wrong, because its real destination is the Twilight Zone.
And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Printer's Devil, starring Bobby Slayton with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Here we are, beautiful downtown Danburg. Why, thank you. I appreciate the ride. Sure. And thank you. Half Moon Bar and Grill. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, young man. Yeah? I hope you're not going to drink alone. I was. Care to join me? I'd be delighted. Feeling better? Not yet. Hi, Mr. Winter. Hello, Molly. Let me have a cup of hemlock on the rocks. Cup of what? Make it a martini. The same for me, Molly. Could I see you for a second? What about? Well, um... The tab. Hmm? I'm sorry. Mr. Foster says he'll wait, but from now on it's got to be cash. Please, allow me. Oh, well, that'll be fine then. Now, Molly, you run and go get those drinks. And tell Mr. Foster to make them doubles. Would you do that for me? Of course, sir. Thanks. Nothing at all, my boy. She's a plush one, isn't she? <laughs> Full of fire. I wouldn't know. Mr... The name's Smith. Douglas Winner. Not the Douglas Winner. The newspaper editor? Ex-editor. Why ex? It's a long, sad story. You wouldn't be interested. Oh, but I would. You see, Mr. Winner, you were the reason I journeyed to Dansburg. <laughs> you must be a bill collector. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. I am, in fact, a newspaper man, and I was kind of hoping to secure a position here with the courier. I could have saved you a trip. The courier is dead, Mr. Smith. I, I don't understand. There isn't much to understand. The Bragg Syndicate decided to start a rival paper, the Gazette. Can't you just fight them? I thought so, at first, but they were big and rich, and I was little and poor. Your drinks, fellas. Keep the change, my dear. In payment for your lovely smile. Thank you, sir. Wow, she moves fast for a big one. <laughs> so what do you say, Mr. Winter? Do you suppose the Gazette could use a linotype operator? I'm afraid not, though they did just grab my best man. Probably give him something else to do. Not much call for hot lead typesetting anymore. Everyone switched over to computers. Well, that's very disappointing. That was my specialty, along with reporting. It was? In fact, if I may dispense with false modesty, I would have to count myself among the best in both fields. Perhaps the best. I don't know what to say yet. Then I'll say it for you. You put me to work right away, and I think you can save the courier. How? Oh, I can't even pay my bar tab. It's very simple. I will waive my salary until you're in the black. Then, of course, I would expect some compensation, you understand. I might never be in the black. Oh, uh -huh, yeah, but then you might. It's a chance you have to take. That's certainly better than what you have now. You sure you know how to operate a linotype? Mr. Winter, that's like asking Paganini if he knows how to play a fiddle. I can make that keyboard do things you would not believe. Show me. Oh, with pleasure. This little storefront is the Courier. And that office building over there with all the lights on, that's the Gazette. People buy a paper for its news, Mr. Winter, not its building. Except in Dansburg. Why? Because there isn't any news here. <laughs> there will be. Doug! Jackie, what are you doing here? I was worried. I've been calling your house since 8 o'clock and... I'd like you to meet Mr. Smith. Jackie Benson, my most valuable employee. Second most valuable, Mr. Winter. He says he's a linotype operator. You mean we're still in business? I don't know yet. Mr. Smith, let me see how long it takes you to set the lead story. Certainly. Here's the copy. The machine's in the next room. Who is he? I don't know. <laughs> it's an old model. <laughs> Listen to that baby hum. Would you be kind enough to hold my cigar for a moment? If you don't play Chopin's Polonaise, we're going to be disappointed. Oh, you won't be disappointed, I promise. This machine and I understand each other. Watch. Let's give it a spin, shall we? There. May I have my cigar back? What? Just put it right there in my mouth. Right, 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 right. Let me see, I have to make a few modifications here, but on the whole, yeah, this machine's in fine condition. Stiff, perhaps? Why'd you stop? I'm finished. That's impossible. See for yourself. Read the type. Mr. Smith, where did you say you worked? I didn't say. Is it important? Why would a man with your talent want to work for a hick paper like the Courier? Not talent, Mr. Winter. Genius. And, you know, geniuses can be unpredictable. Call it a challenge. What about you, Miss Benson? You don't look impressed. No. 
I'm amazed. <laughs> oh, I amaze myself sometimes, too, but, but this I must confess. This is not my true vocation. It isn't? Well, at heart, I'm a reporter. I've always been a reporter. You know how some people might have a green thumb? Well, you can say I have a green nose. Wherever there's news, this old nose smells it. I'm afraid it won't smell much in Danberg. Well, who can say? So, well, am I hired? You would be, if I had a paper. But there's no use kidding myself. It belongs to half a dozen banks and finance companies, all ready to collect. How much would you need to pay them off? A lot. Plus eight weeks of back wages to the staff, the delivery boys... And me? How much does it all come to? Roughly $22,861.23. Well, I think I can manage that amount. On a loan basis, you understand. Excuse us for a moment. Surely. What do you think? I don't know, Doug. What does he get out of it? What's his motive? Beats me. Well, then... Look, I'm going to give it a try. It's a chance to stay in business a while longer. And after all, what have I got to lose? Absolutely right. What have you got to lose? Here are the rest of the checks to sign. Gives you a funny feeling, doesn't it? Paid in full. Paid in full. <laughs> that old roost is the best thing that ever happened to us. Speak of the devil. Uh, hey, excuse the interruption. Uh, I was just wondering, how fast do you think you can actually get an edition on the streets? We're not due till tomorrow morning. I mean an extra edition. I don't know, a few hours? It'd be a hassle. We'd have to set it, round up the guys. Would it be worth a hassle, Mr. Winter, if we could actually scoop the Gazette? Depends on the scoop. How's this? I ran off a of proof. I, I hope you don't mind. Uh, let's see. At 10.20 this morning, the first national bank at the corner of Elm and Hester Streets was robbed of $50,000 by a gang of... Let me see that. 10.20? It's only half an hour ago. I told you I had a nose for news. I'll have to check it out. You doubt my veracity? It's standard operating procedure, Mr. Smith. You should know that. First National Bank? This is Winter at the Courier. We have a report of a robbery and I... Huh? I see. Okay. Uh, thank you. Doug? Let's get to work. Special edition, bank robbery, get your paper here. Oh my good man, come over here. Let me show you how you're supposed to do that. Give me that paper. Daring Daylight Bank guys, big stick up, read all about it. Thug steal 50 grand. Extra, extra, get it right off the press. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have your money ready. Thank you. Get it first, right here in the courier. Read all about it in the courier. What a day. Don't you wish you could have seen Franklin's face? When did the Gazette finally come out? Not till 2.30. <laughs> mm. Well, the mood has certainly changed, hasn't it? Thanks to you. What have you got there? Oh, just a little story I thought you might be interested in. For tomorrow's edition. High school principal exposed as... bigamist? Mr. Harold J. Swanson, for 13 years principal of Danburg High School, confessed today that he is married to two women. The first Mrs. Swanson... It's not much, but it will sell papers. How did you get this? I keep telling you, I have a nose for news. I'll check it. Hello, yes, I'd like to speak... I don't think Miss Benson trusts me very much. She's not used to this kind of pace. Well, you like it, don't you? Mr. Smith, there's nothing I like more. Love nest at high school. Read all about it. Who'd have ever guessed? Why, that old goat. Here's the mail. All subscriptions. Honey, do you realize that in two weeks our circulation has doubled? Oh, and Mr. Franklin's here to see you. Here? Winter. I'm not a man to beat around the bush. You've had a few lucky breaks. It can't last, but I'm authorized to make you an offer. If you're smart, you'll take it. An offer on what, Mr. Franklin? Why, the courier. We buy it, you and your staff go to work for us. Well? Sorry, we're not for sale. You actually think you can fight us? We can try. 
This offer will remain open till 7 tonight. After that winter, I'd advise you to find another line of work. Doll, turn up the heat. I already have. Under the gazette. Come on, let's have some lunch. How much do you think they give you? Well, if they're as worried as Franklin looks, a couple hundred thousand, maybe more. Why? Honey, what's wrong? I'm not sure. I have a surprise for you. I don't think I can take another one. Oh, you can take this, Miss Benson. It happens to be the biggest scoop of all. I'm almost afraid to look. Let's see. Fire destroys Gazette building. What? Listen. I don't blame you for being upset, but that's no reason to make accusations. Accusations? Facts! You started that fire, Winter, and you're going to pay. I'll see to that. Mr. Franklin... I've heard of some low tricks in the newspaper game, but this is the lowest. Mr. Franklin, I did not start that fire. How many times do I have to tell you? I don't care how many times you tell me. You had your papers on the street an hour after it happened, and that spells just one thing. You knew. I'll explain the situation one last time. Our new man was passing by. He saw the smoke and ran back. And in an hour, he wrote the story, ran off 5,000 copies. Winter, what kind of idiot do you think I am? The loud kind, Mr. Franklin. It so happens I have eyewitnesses to my whereabouts every minute of the day. Oh, we'll see about that. Yes, Chief Brown. Hello? This is Lawrence Franklin. Have you checked out Winter's story yet? Yeah, well, they're lying. They're covering up for him. What about that new man? All right, all right. See that you do. Well? It may take time, Winter, but you'll pay for this. I don't think so, Mr. Franklin. I think your insurance company will pay for it. Who knows? They might even pay for the libel suit. What? The one I'm going to hit you with if you keep shooting your mouth off. Now, get out of here. We got work to do. Doug? Yeah? How did we get on the street so fast? I don't know. Do you believe him? Who? Mr. Smith. Do you believe he just happened to be passing by? Oh, Jackie, I swear, you sound as bad as Franklin. Where are you going? To talk to Mr. Smith. Hello, boss. What can I do for you? Answer a question. Did you start the Gazette fire? I? You. I'm afraid I don't understand. Why not? It's clear enough. Did you start the Gazette fire? It was started by a faulty electrical system. Are you sure of that? Mr. Winter, I never write up any item I'm not sure about. It's a matter of ethics. The men say you never left this room. They're busy. You can't expect them to notice every little thing. Hmm. Well, I suppose not. And you can't expect me to get my work done with editors hanging over my shoulder, can you? Oh, by the way, Andy Praskin's call. The linotype operator I told you about? I think I'll hire him back and put you on full-time reporting. No, 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 no that, that won't work. That won't work. I, I, I've made certain modifications to the machine, and, and, and look, I just don't want anybody touching it. They'll mess it up. But you hire him back. Just give him another job. It's twice as much work for you. No, I don't mind. I've got this baby trained. Two specials. Anything else, folks? Not that I can think of, Molly. Well, just let me know. Doug, tell me about Mr. Smith. Exactly how did you meet him? I told you. I ran into him that night. Where? The end of Pine Trail, the bridge. What were you doing out there? I don't know. Hunting butterflies. You don't have to get defensive about it. Look, we met. I hired him. He put us back in business. What more do you want? Did you check his references? No, I didn't. Do you even know where he stays in town? Why are you so worried about him anyway? Because I smell trouble. That's why. Trouble? 1,500 new subscriptions to sell out every day, and you call that trouble? Don't you want the curry to succeed? You know I do. Well, then stop griping. All my life I've dreamed of this, and I'm not going to let you spoil it. What's happening to you? Nothing! You've never yelled at me before. You've never acted like a nagging wife before. I'm not your wife, Doug. And I never will be at this rate. Well, that's okay by me. You can't stand that, can you? You can't stand a man once you know he can take care of himself. Once he's on his way to the top. Doug, please.
please. I'm sorry. Tell Molly to start a new tab. Who are you? Ernie Pinzer. And you? Rich Miller. What are you doing here? Working the printing press. Who hired you? The old guy, Mr. Smith. I hope you don't mind. We, we needed the extra help, and they needed jobs. They're gazette men. Mr. Smith? Yes? Read that to me. What? On the machine, what you're writing. Well, I, I'd hope to surprise you tomorrow. Surprise me now. Start with the lead. Okay, if you like. Local man wins $2 million. E.J. McLeod, for 16 years, clerk at the Danburg Water and Power Company, learned last night that his sweepstakes ticket was... That's enough. Information, give me the number of E.J. McLeod, please. Yes, yes, please, dial it through. Hello, uh, Mr. McLeod? This is the courier. I'm sorry to disturb you, but have you heard any news on your sweepstakes ticket yet? Ah, I see. No, 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 I haven't heard a thing either. I was just wondering. Thank you. Good night. Well, you made a mistake this time. McLeod doesn't know anything about it. I never said he knew. I said he won. What are you talking about? How can you win two million dollars and not know it? By not bothering to check your mailbox for a telegram? Yeah, bluffing. You know what the odds are of winning those... Courier, winter here. Well, congratulations. That was McLeod. You see? No. The telegram was delivered. He only just now read it. I swear, if you sent it, if you're stringing that man along... Mr. Winter, would you sit down, please? I think it's time we had a little chat. Maybe it is. I think the occasion calls for a touch of the creature, if I may say so. I'm all out. Oh, no, no, I think you're fine. You're mistaken. Open up the drawer. Huh. A fifth of scotch. With my compliments. <laughs> now tell me, are you happy with the way things are going around here now? Of course I am. For the moment. Meaning what, sir? Meaning Franklin was right. We have been lucky. You can't expect that kind of luck to last. They'll rebuild the Gazette and we'll be right back where we started. Mr. Winter, what if I were to tell you that you could expect the luck to last? I'd say you're an optimist. Oh, I am that. But I'm also a man of my word. Isn't that true? You have been so far. Everything I promised you, I have delivered. So you have no reason to doubt me. What's all this leading up to, Mr. Smith? A simple proposition. I took the liberty of preparing this document here. I hereby guarantee. You understand? Guarantee that you will become the most successful newspaper editor in the world within five years. And that you will remain so for the rest of your natural life. If you will just affix your signature right here. I, Douglas Winter, agree to relinquish my immortal soul to the bearer upon my death in exchange for his service. <laughs> You're the devil? As a sophisticated, intelligent man, you know the devil doesn't exist. Yeah, that's true. And you also know that the world is full of rich, crazy old men who just do things for crazy reasons. <laughs> Why not just think of me that way? I do, Mr. Smith. Excellent. Use my pen. This is ridiculous. Of course it's ridiculous. You said it's ridiculous. I've agreed with you. And yet, look at you. You're still hesitating. You don't believe I'm the devil, do you? Certainly not. Then humor me, huh? After all, what good is a soul anyway? It's sort of like an appendix these days, if you know what I mean. Particularly if it doesn't exist in the first place. Just for the sake of argument. Why would you want it? I right, just say for the sake of argument. I might find a use for it. Let's say, oh, I don't know, I'm a connoisseur and yours is a choice soul. Like wine. A very good year, so to speak. Why not just take it? If you're the devil, you can do anything. Not quite. I am bound to certain rules, and I do have my limitations. Yeah, nuts. I agree. Let's drink to that. Oh, I forgot to add, by the way, that if you don't sign, which is okay, that your somewhat gloomy predictions of the courier's future will almost certainly come true. Then, of course, I'd be forced to resign, and... You know what? Let's not even consider the possibility, okay? After all, you, you don't want to go back to that bridge again, do you? No. Then humor an old man. It would mean a lot to me, okay? If you don't, <laughs> you'll be admitting fear and belief. And you're not afraid, are you? Not in the least. What then? <laughs> oh, boy, fancy that. Look at you. A grown-up man who believes in the devil. <laughs>
Oh, give me that stupid pen. Well done. Here. I hope that's the last I hear of this nonsense. I'm sure you do, Mr. Winter. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Okay, let's see. What shall it be tonight? Doug? Doug, wake up! What? It's 8.40 in the morning. Didn't you go home? I guess not. Must have been overtired. Overloaded, by the looks of that bottle. Have some coffee. Oh. Huh. Have you seen the paper? Yesterday? Today's. It's on the street. Seven teenagers perish in fiery crash. Tell me what's going on, Doug. These things, they can't just be happening. Stay here. Good morning, boss. What do you know about this? I only know what I read in the papers. Has it happened yet? Well, of course. How else could... You know what I mean. Let's see. Oh, yes, yes, yes. An hour and a half ago. Oh, so awful. Nice young people, wasted lives, so much to live for. But of course they've been drinking, you know. You caused it. Mr. Winter, I was here all night, and so were you. How could I have caused it? I don't know yet. Uh, about last night. That was just a gag, wasn't it? Well, it did have its amusing aspects. I mean, you're not... Not what? Nothing. May I go back to work now? Terribly sorry. Thank you. It's true. How did he know? It's his job to know. But the papers were on the street right after it happened. Who printed them? Who delivered them? Ask Mr. Smith. I'm asking you. Get off my back, will you? All right. If that's the way you want it. Oh, lovely dress you're wearing to Miss Benson. And that perfume. <sighs> what is it? Something new. It's called Hands Off. <laughs> That's good. Very good, Miss Benson. What do you want? A bit of fire for my cigar. Here are some matches. Keep them. Thank you. I do believe we're going to be great friends, my dear. <laughs> okay, now then. What? Let's see. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Mayor Stinson strangles his wife. Murder! Extra! Extra! Honeymooners drown in Lake Bundy. Read all about it. Extra! Honeymooners dead. Read all about it. Honeymooners drown in Lake Bundy. Extra! Extra! to fire him, Doug. You've paid back the loan. You don't owe him anything. I can't. Why? Just kick him out. Or do you want him around? It isn't a matter of... Then what? He's taken over. He's running the courier, not you. Him. Well, he isn't doing a bad job of it. We're selling out every edition. You're selling out more than that. A lot more. Goodbye, Doug. Hey, aren't you being a little hasty? Mind your own business. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is my business. I do have, one might say, a proprietary interest in everything connected with the courier. Well, I'm not connected with the courier anymore. I wish you would reconsider. The fact is, I've developed a special fondness for you. Get out of my way. Psst, a word in your ear. <gasps> Why have all the... You'll be sorry you did that. Not as sorry as you'll be if you ever say anything like that to me again. Where's Miss Benson going? Ah, oh, love's labor's lost, Mr. Winter. She left us. It's your fault. I have only done what you asked me to do. That's a lie. Oh, oh, really? You wanted success? You accepted my help of your own free will. And the only thing that makes a paper successful is news. I never said what kind of news. Then you did make those things happen. Every time you sat down at that linotype. You didn't tell me people would be hurt. Hey, you didn't ask. You must pay a price for success, Mr. Winter. Everybody must, okay? Of course, the price does vary. Come on, don't feel too bad, my boy. You're not the first editor I've helped out. I don't want your help. Get out. Sorry, we have a contract. 
and there's no way out of it. But there is one thing you could do. What? Pay up. But if you are the devil, you can't take my soul until I'm dead. That's right, I can't, can I? Wait, is that another story I smell? I think so. What are you writing? Oh, no. This is awful. At 11.30 tonight, Miss Jacqueline Benson, formerly of the Courier, suffered grave injuries from a head-on collision with another car on Bascom Road. Cancel it! I'm sorry. Then change it! No, I won't do that either. What is written here comes to pass. Look, I told you I made modifications, didn't I? So you see, I didn't lie. I don't make things happen, Mr. Winter. The machine does. But why Jackie? Look, I do have other clients, and I've spent a great deal of time here, Mr. Winter. And I thought this just might be a nice way to wrap things up. Look, it doesn't say she died of her injuries. I mean, I could add a few lines, but that's entirely up to you. Will this help you to decide? What's that? It's a 45 caliber automatic, I believe it's called. I carry one with me just in case. If you should decide to, you know, conclude our contract, and I think you'll find this method a good deal surer than the bridge. A lot quicker, too. Give me that. That leaves three bullets in the clip, as I recall. Or, or is it five? I fired right at you. How could I miss? You didn't. Then I'll use something else. Where are you going? To find a monkey wrench. And when I do, I'm going to throw it right in the middle of your plans. That's the spirit, my boy. Never give up. Okay, let's see. 10.15. You have exactly one hour and 15 minutes. Jackie! Jackie! Hush! You want to wake everybody in the neighborhood? Where's Miss Benson? She ain't in. When did she leave? About 15 minutes ago. Did she say where she was going? That's no concern of mine. Miss Benson? Have you seen Doug? Well, isn't he at his desk? No. The truth is, Mr. Smith, I actually came here to talk to you. Oh, really? First, I want to apologize for slapping you. Second, I want to ask you to do something. And what might that be? I want to ask you to go away. You've done a great deal for the paper, but I love Doug. The way he's been acting since you got here, I hardly recognize him. Are you holding me responsible? Please, Mr. Smith, just go. I'll agree to anything you want. Well, 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 you can't expect me to make a decision like this on the spur of the moment. Hey, what do you say we take a little drive and talk about it in private? Why, hello, Mr. Winter. Is Jackie here? Miss Benson? Not since lunchtime. What's the matter? Can I get you something? Mr. Winter. You don't mind my driving, do you? Where are we going? Well, this ought to be a good spot. Why are we stopping here? Well, so we can talk. Then we have an agreement. We might. It depends. On what? On you, Miss Benson, and your powers of persuasion. Go on. Persuade me. I can't. What? It's that cigar. Okay. Well, let's take a walk. That is, if you would like to get acquainted. I do. Come on. Don't be afraid. Take a little walk into the woods. Jackie? Mr. Smith? It's 11.10 already. He said it happens at 11.30. What am I going to do? Well, it's always this. One bullet is all I need for myself. My hand doesn't shake too much. Wait. The linotype. Yes, that's it. Ah, the smell of the pines. This is a lovely, lovely night. Downright romantic, wouldn't you say? Come on, why don't we sit down here? Come on, we'll talk. I can't. I just can't. Wait, 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 where are you going? Wait, wait, hey, where are you going? Come here! Ah, oh, there you are. Okay, Miss Benson, I'm a little out of breath here. But it is time to conclude our deal. No, 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 no need to get up. I'll sit next to you and... and, and whoa, 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 what's, what's happening? What, what's, what's happening here? What is... What? Mr. Smith? Mr. 
Smith, where are you? Doug. Jackie, where is he? I don't know. He just disappeared. Doug, what is this all about? If you don't tell me, I will go out of my mind. If I do tell you, you'll think I'm already out of mind. What's this? Something I wrote. Read it. Mr. Smith, formerly of the Courier, resigned his position and left Danburg at 11.29 this evening. His contract with the publisher was declared null and void due to Mr. Winter's incomplete understanding of the terms. What contract? I don't understand. Neither do I, honey. But he's gone. That's the important thing. Doug, you... Shh. I said he's gone. But how do you know he won't be back? He's a funny guy. He doesn't go anywhere unless he's invited. Did you invite him here? In a way. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life making up for it. How? Well, the first thing we'll do is get rid of that old linotype machine. It's time we switched over to computers. Will you tell me what you're talking about? Maybe I will, someday. But for now, the half moon's still open. I'll tell him to cook up something special. How does an engagement dinner sound? Doug, are you all right? Never felt better in my life. Exit the infernal machine. And with it, his satanic majesty, Lucifer, Prince of Darkness, otherwise known as Asmodeus, Belial, Lucifer, Scratch, and sometimes Mr. Smith. He's gone, but not for good. That wouldn't be like him. He's gone for bad, and sooner or later he may be back with another invitation from the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action, plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. Printer's Devil, starring Bobby Slayton, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Frenette Lebo, Doug James, Derek Purcell, Elizabeth Lido, Carl Amari, Roger Walski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. There, 
how's that? Keep the board straight, Jonesy. Oh, what's the difference? If it ain't straight, somebody steps up and boom, they fall right through. We got a broken leg. Broken leg, broken neck, all the same. Well, now, what if it's the Padre? He's gotta say his piece, don't he? Yeah, I guess. Keep working. About ready for lunch? Not yet. Too hot to work this time of day. Sheriff wants it done. You know that. A man gets parched. Ought to have himself a little drink once in a while. Cantina's not open yet. That's because everybody's taking a siesta. You know what a siesta is, don't you, deputy? That's when you lay down someplace, pull your hat over your eyes, and have yourself a little snooze. Good for what ails you. Does a man good know what I mean? Go get another two-by-four. No more left. Then cut some. Ain't got a saw. Over by the woodpile. I sure don't see it. <sighs> Front of the blacksmiths, Jonesy. Yeah, well, maybe we better wait a while. How's it coming, Ed? Uh, pretty soon now, Sheriff. Jonesy here is about ready to put up the crossbeam. Maybe you better give him a hand. Oh, uh, he's doing all right by himself. Jonesy? Yeah? You remember what I told you? What's that? About that business the other night. Drunk and disorderly. I'm giving you a chance, Jonesy. Either that, or I find you. Right. Don't worry, Sheriff. I'm working it off. See that you do. Ed. Yes, sir. Call me when the scaffold's in place. Then we'll test the trap. Mighty big rush for one lousy Mexican. You heard me. I want it finished. I may not like it very much, but that's the law. So let's get it over with. I'm doing my best, Sheriff, but I only got two hands. Maybe you should hire some extra help. Nobody in this town's gonna lift a finger. Too lazy, if you ask me. They're not lazy, Ed. They just don't want to see one of their own swing. And I can't say as I blame them. You pitch in if you need to. The judge passed sentence. We don't have much choice. Yes, sir. Get some more boards, Jonesy. Let's go. I'm going. There was once a village built of crumbling clay and rotting wood, and it squatted ugly under a broiling sun like a sick and mangy animal waiting to die. This village had a sickness shared by all its people. It was the germ of squalor, of hopelessness, of a loss of faith. But for the faithless, the hopeless, the misery-laden, there is always time, ample time, to engage in one of the favorite pursuits of men, to destroy themselves. In just a moment, a most unusual traveler will pay a visit to this village. He'll come riding down the dusty main street, not with bells and fanfare, but on a mule. It's not his first visit, and it won't be his last. But this time, he brings with him a gift that's for sale to the highest bidder. One already signed, sealed, and delivered in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Dust, starring Bill Smitrovich, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. <laughs> Let's go, Mule. Keep it moving. Who is that? It's the man. What man? He comes from the city with things to sell. Children, come inside now. Right now. That's right, Mule. Now you stop. Attention, ladies and gents. Come out and gather around. It's me, Peter Sykes, back from St. Louis. Stocked with everything you need for kitchen and barn. And the dry throat and the swollen tongue. <laughs> now, where is everybody? Come one, come all. 
Is this a holiday? Nobody in the street. Well, will you look at that sign? Closed today because of funeral. I wonder whose funeral would that be? Let's have a look in the jail. Why, who's that in the window? Young Mr. Gallegos, if I'm not mistaken. Get away from here. What? No visitors allowed? Well, Mr. Gallegos, I would say you have no choice in the matter. <laughs> Leave me alone. Ah, but today's a special day, isn't it? A very special day. Now, let's see. What might this special day be? A birthday? No. Wedding day? I don't think so. Wait, I remember now. Just this moment came back to me. Today is the day young Mr. Gallegos, killer of children, dangles at the end of a rope. Cause you're gonna get hanged from that gallows right over there. <laughs> Hello, Jonesy. Deputy. Sykes. I have something for you, Jonesy, in my saddlebags. Yeah? What's that? Good whiskey from St. Louis. Eighty-five cents a quart. Not around here. Sheriff wouldn't like it. How about you, Deputy? I got postcards. Wonderful postcards on this trip. French dancing girls in their native costumes. Later, Sykes. We're going inside. Well, if you're not buying, maybe the sheriff is. We got it finished, Sheriff. Now all we gotta do is test it. All right, boys. Sykes, what are you doing here? Well, Sheriff Koch, a little bit of this, some of that, will be your fancy this fine day. What do I fancy? I'll tell you what I fancy, Sykes. I'd like you to take your fat carcass and your loud mouth out of my office. This is a small room and it's already full of hot air. Don't need any more rope, do you? <laughs> hey, Gregos, what about you? <laughs> Leave them be. How about a nice hacksaw to cut those bars? <laughs> Sykes. You ought to see the fancy five-strand hemp I sold this town for your necktie party, Gallegos. It can lift five people. Any more at home like you? <laughs> Look, I told you. Go pedal your ware someplace else. Well, well. Look at him sitting there in the dark. You better go back to the window, Gallegos. There's gonna be a funeral procession down that street. They'll be burying the little girl you mangled under your wagon. Yeah, you're sobered up now, huh? But you remember the little girl, don't you? You got stinking drunk and you raced your wagon down that street. And what you did to that poor little girl? I said, leave me alone. Oh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, Gallegos, not yet. You'll have plenty of room to move around in a while. You'll be able to kick and kick and kick. <laughs> Outside. You want me to throw him out, Sheriff? Don't bother. He knows the way. You gotta take a drink of this, Sheriff. It's a good tonic. Put a little gristle in your arm. Just the thing to set you up for a hanging. Yes, sir. Makes you strong and firm. Here, feel my muscle. I don't touch dog meat, Sykes. You talk big behind a badge, Koch. It just sounds big to you, Sykes. Because you got a little brain. You make noises like a mountain lion when you're safe in a hole. But out in the open, you're a yellow dog who barks at the moon. Sure, Sheriff. If you say so. You know, I always had a little question about you. Seems you got a thing for foreigners and strays, but you're mighty tight-lipped when it comes to your own kind. You're not my kind, Sykes. So don't claim any kinship. As for that boy in there, he had his trial, and today he's gonna swing for it. But there's nothing in his sentence that says he's gotta be tormented by a pig who sells trinkets at funerals. Now go on. Get out of my sight. One question. When this day is over, Koch, which one will you weep for? I've got enough tears for both. Here comes the funeral procession. Already? Look at them out there. All those people following Mr. and Mrs. Canfield. 
Oh, Lord. The coffin on that wagon sure is little. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mr. and Mrs. Canfield, that you? Shut up, Sykes. I just want you to know I'm real sorry about what happened. My condolences to you. Thank you. But this afternoon is going to be a lot more cheery. Yes, sir, we're going to string up the dirty little animal that done this. She'll be avenged. You can set your mind to rest on that score. We'll string up that mangler of little children if it's the last thing we do. <laughs> Leave us alone, please. Come along, Dora. Let him go. I was just paying my respects. Some other time, Sykes. Some other time you can act like a man with no brains. But not now. Now you keep quiet. Sheriff? Hello, Sheriff Koch. Mr. Glagos? Mr. Leader? Now look at that, will ya? Ain't that the most gall you ever seen in one place? Gallegos' old man shows his face in town, in broad daylight, and during the funeral procession, too. Somebody ought to take a horse whip to that, that... Hurry, child. Run ahead, as I told you. But, Grandfather... Go, my child. Now. Senor Canfield? What is it? My grandfather wishes me to tell you that his heart is broken. Go on, Mr. Lipa. Say what I told you. That if he could... That, that if he could give... Tell him his own life. His own life in return. Tell him, please, his own life in return, Estrellita. Oh, please, not now. Leave us. If he could give his own life in return, he would. He would do so with great willingness. He understands. Mr. Canfield, if I may, I understand what it is like to lose one's flesh. I understand, and I am sad for you. Get out of our way, both of you. Please, I ask you, please don't have any malice for my son, Luis. He did not do it on purpose, and he is sick in his mind and in his heart because of it. I said get out of my way. Senor, senora, por favor, I am on my knees. Please do not let them kill my son. He will spend the rest of his life, and I am I in your service. Anything, anything you wish, but please, please, do not let them do this. Can't you see that we're burying our daughter today? Come, Grandfather. Yes, yes. Give me your hand. Look at it. Look at it. What's he doing here? He should hide his face in shame. He should get out of town is what he should do. Oh, he's kind. Oh, please, please. My son did not mean to do it. He is a lover of children, as you all are. He loves all the little children. Why don't you go back where you came from? Take this! Oh! Grandfather, you are bleeding. It is nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Good aim, Harvey! Stand back, all of you. The next man who throws a rock or anything else will answer to me. You understand? Padre, por favor, váyase a la casa. No se le necesita aquí. What's he saying? He's not needed here? Is that what you told this old man of yours, Gallegos? Father, take Estrellita home. They will hurt you if you stay here. My son, there is one chance. Go home now! Luis, look. My lucky coin. It is said that one can make a wish on it. Any wish. I have saved it for years. Go home, old man. Make your prayers. Make your wishes. But Luis is right. You can do nothing here. Mr. Sheriff, have you never been drunk? What? Have you never felt such misery that you found salvation only in a bottle? Never felt pain? Such pain that you had to ride through the night and never look back? Mr. Gallegos... My son was hungry, and he felt such a pain, and he drank too much, and he rode down the street, not looking, not seeing. He had a sadness deep inside, sadness that there was not enough to eat, sadness that he had no work, sadness that the earth all around him was growing barren in the sun. 
He did not see the little girl. He never saw her for an instant. I swear to you, he did not. It's best that you go home now. Come, Grandfather. That goes for the rest of you. Come on inside, Ed. You too, Jonesy. You've seen enough misery for a while. Little girl, wait. What? Stay a minute. Come over here. That's right. I won't hurt you. Wait for me, Grandfather. You tell him something for me. Tell him what? You tell him I want to help him. Understand? Tell him his coin is no good. Worthless. But I have a magic dust. You do? It turns hate to love. But it is very, very precious. Very expensive, comprende? Now you tell him to bring 100 pesos to my room in one hour. And I will sell him the magic dust that makes people love and forgive. You understand? Huh? You tell the old man. Now you go. All right. <laughs> Magic dust. <laughs> now, where is it? Oh, yes. Right down there. On the ground. I'll scrape up a handful. Now, let's see. That should be just about 100 pesos worth of genuine magic dust. <laughs> Come, Grandfather. You must rest. No, I cannot. I must save Luis. There's Gallegos. He's been to town. Did he bring Luis? We must help him. Pedro, what did they do to you? Nothing. They did nothing to me. What of your boy? Did you see Luis? See, si, I saw him. When is he coming home? The sheriff. Will he spare him? The sheriff can do nothing. But he is a good man. The town is full of hate. They want to see death today. Blood for blood. Even a river of it will not be enough. Oh, my friend. We are so sorry. Come inside. We will pray with you. No. There is no time. It will be soon. Soon. But there is a way to change their hearts. A way? I must first... Pay a fee. How much? One hundred pesos. Aye. Where can we get one hundred pesos? My horse is worth fifty. Estreita. Yes? Run to my house. Tell my wife to bring the money she has saved. All of it. I will tell her. Manuel, get my horse. Oh, you need it to plow the fields. There are no crops because there is no water. You need your son. Oh, gracias. I will pay you back every peso. Go and tell the others. Bring their coins and their rings. We must save Luis. Ed. Yeah, Sheriff. You seen Jonesy? He's down at the blacksmith's. Go get him. Is it time? It will be. Soon enough. Put the rope up and tie the sandbags. And make sure that trap works. Yes, sir. Luis? What? Want something to eat? No. I can get something for you at the cantina. Just name it. <laughs> no, thank you, Sheriff. Why waste good food? You smoke, Luis? Sometimes. You got a new pouch of tobacco here. I'll roll you one if you like. Gracias. Here, I lit it for you. There should be a lot of people today, eh? When was it God made people? Was it on the sixth day? Sometimes I think he should have stopped on the fifth. It's not their fault. No? They are tired of hating this place. The sun, the ground that is dead under their feet. So they must find something else to hate. Maybe. Or maybe it's just in them. God didn't make people to hate for no reason. Mm. Didn't he? Here they come. I can see them from here. Sorry a bunch. More than show up at church. They want the big show. Here I am, the one you came to see. You murderer. 
Look at him. Get away from the window. You just rile him up. Oh, there. Slowly, Tom, please. Come on, kids. You're gonna see something real special today. Yes, Daddy. Well, where is it? Me first. Let's go. Don't want to miss it, do you? Rogers. Oh. Hi there, Sheriff. You had to bring them, didn't you? What do you mean? You know this isn't a carnival, Rogers. It's a hanging. Well, the kids? <laughs> well, they ain't never seen one before. I figured it was about time. Yeah, I'll bet you did. Just one thing. What's that? Am I telling me why? Why not? They'll learn a lesson. They'll see what happens to drunks who kill kids. I guess that's pretty important to you. Darn right it is. I have to teach them. You want them to learn. You teach them a lot of things, don't you, Rogers? What's that? How do you teach them pain? Shoot one of them in the arm? All right, you kids. You stay together. Come along, May. I'll tie up the horses. <laughs> Is that the man? What man? In the window with the bars. Is that the man they're going to put the rope on? See, little one, I am the man. Will it hurt when they put a rope around his neck? If God wills it. Tom Jr., get away from there. Run along now, kids. Your dad's waiting for you. Gotta do that all day, Wayne. Be finished pretty soon. I'm trying to catch my siesta. Ain't got but another hour. Go sleep someplace else. Ain't no place that's out of the sun except in this barn. No place to lay down anyways. Well, this ain't a hotel. I got my blacksmithing to do. What's that you're working on? Lay cuffs for the sheriff. He asked you for them? No, but he's gonna need them when they walk that boy to the rope. Jonesy. Oh, what you want now? Let's go. Time already? Sheriff says we gotta test the rig. Right now? Right now. Here you go. What's this? Sheriff Koch's leg irons for the wet bag. Well, thank you, Wayne. do, ladies and gents. Let's see. Who wants a souvenir to mark the occasion? I got hair ribbons for the ladies, cigars for the men, and candy for the little ones. Come one, come all. Peter Sykes, back from St. Louis with a bag full of tricks. Sykes. Well, hello, Sheriff Koch. Beautiful day, wouldn't you say? Not a cloud in the sky. I thought I told you. I got no use for you in this town, Sykes. So you did, Sheriff. So you did. But a lot of these folks do. Seeing as how this is a special day and all, you wouldn't stop a man from making a living, would you? There's honest ways to do it, but that's not your style, is it? Now see here. So how much junk have you sold today, Sykes? Well, I just got started. Then it wouldn't cut into your business none if I were to run you off. Sure it would. The crowd's filling up. I ain't had a chance to ply my trade. And what trade is that? Circling the town like a vulture, waiting to feed off the dead? I don't rob and I don't cheat. Everybody gets what they pay for. Well, seeing as nobody's paid you yet, why don't you just crawl back where you belong? Hey! You may live to regret that, Koch. There's an election coming up, and when folks see the way you push people around... There's a heaven coming too, Sykes, and a hell. I only hope I don't have to see you in either one. Now get the hell out of here. Yeah, we'll just see about that. What was that all about? Nothing. Old Sax. He's a character, all right. Him and his whiskey and his way with cards. Get the rope. We need to test the rig. Yes, sir, Mr. Koch. And tie it right. Make sure it'll break his neck clean. Not leaving to choke to death. Quickly! 
Where is Senor Sykes? Sykes? He's gone. What? Must have rode on out of town. But I have business with him. Very important business. Take it easy, old man. The hanging isn't even started yet. The hanging? We'll be in a minute, though. They're just now trying the gallows to be sure it works. No. No, not yet. Por favor, not yet. Ready, Sheriff. All right. Go ahead. Got hold of the rope, Jonesy? I got it. Then, let her rip. Get ready, Louise. It's about that time. I'm ready, Sheriff. I suppose I should put these on you. You think I will run? No, I don't. Not really. No place to run to. That crowd out there, some of them would just like to tear you apart. And I would like to walk like a man, not like an animal in chains. You know, I'd like to see that too. I believe you. You won't need these leg cuffs. Come on, son. I do. Come on. He is not a killer. He is my son. Yeah, yeah. Sure, old man. Go on home. No. No. Hey, Gallegos. What? You looking for me? Oh, Senor Sykes. Shh. Come over here, down in the building. Now then, the little girl told you? See, si, she told me. She said that you have a dust that will save my son. A dust with magic properties. That's the idea, old man. A little bit of this sprinkled over the heads of the crowd and you'll see some real magic. You mean that small bag? Does it not contain tobacco? Oh, no. Not this pouch. You'll see. It'll stop them from hating your son. Make them feel sympathy for him. Then, who knows? Maybe they'll even let him go. Uh, this is a very big magic. Did you get the money, old man? See, si, see. Si. You have it with you? Here, in my handkerchief, just as you said. Gold pieces? Where'd you get them? All my friends. My friends went into the city. One sold a wagon, another sold a horse. Some borrowed. We got many pesos and we converted them. Let me see. It will work, Mr. Sykes. The magic dust. It will work. Yes, yes, I guarantee it. Uh, then you are a strange man. You sold the rope to hang my son. And now you sell me that which will save him. I'm a businessman, Mr. Gallegos. I sell that which is needed. I make no distinctions. It's called equality. Now this will work. Like I told you, it's big magic. All you have to do is give me the coins. And the dust? Here. Luis! Luis! My son! I am coming! Just throw some into the air over their heads! And then watch what happens! <laughs> That's right. Just watch. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You don't have to say anything, Father. I never went to church. There is still time, my son. I can't change now. You were raised a Catholic, weren't you? We never had much time for that. Come on, let's get it over with. Though, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for the Lord is with me. Just hang he maketh me lie down in green pastures. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, Sheriff. All right, Ed. Put the noose around his neck. Amen. 
Stand down, Padre. No! Not yet! I have the dust! Come with me, eh, Pedro? You must pay heed now! You must pay heed to the magic! What's that old coop talking about? Jonesy, leave him be. Big magic! You must pay heed! What kind of magic? What's he got in the bag? See, I throw it over your heads, in the air, all of you! It is only for love. It is for compassion. The magic is so that my son can live as you would want yours to live. Magic. 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 <laughs> Watch out, old man. You wouldn't want to trip and fall down. Watch it. I didn't do nothing, Sheriff. Back off. It is for love. The magic is for love. Now. I don't believe it. How could it break? But it couldn't have. Oh, darn it, Sykes. What kind of rope did you sell this time? It was new rope. Five strand hemp. Nobody could have broken it. But it did. Right through all five strands. Come on, Luis. What are you doing? Helping him to stand up like a man. A, a miracle. It is a miracle. You setting him free? You can't do that, Koch. What about it, Mr. Canfield? Mrs. Canfield? You cannot defeat the magic. You gotta hang him again. There are only two people here who have the right to beg an eye for an eye. What about it, folks? No more today, John. No more. I just can't take any more. But he killed our child. Yes, he did. And a part of himself when he did it. He suffered enough. You're sure? There's been quite enough pain, John. Quite enough. It has to stop now or, or we'll die ourselves. Sheriff Koch? Yes, Mr. Canfield? There must be... There must be another hand in all this. To make the rope break like that. Another hand. Maybe the hand of Providence. You want to stop it then? Yes. John? What is it? We leave it like this? We leave it like this. One victim is enough. Dora? One is too much. I think we should all go home now. Get up, Louise. I'm... I'm free. Are any of us free? But you can go home. You have that much freedom. Yes, my son. Come. It was magic. My father... It was magic. Magic dust. We will go home now. Ed. Yeah? Tell him to open the cantina. I think I'd like a drink. You and Jonesy, too. You don't have to ask me twice, Sheriff. Let's get moving. It was new rope, I tell you. It was brand new rope. Bought and paid for. Ah, well. Another day, another dollar. Come on, mule. We'll find us another town from now on. I don't understand it. Why? How could it break like that? There was nothing in the old man's pouch except dust. Dust! And me? Well, at least I got me some shiny gold coins. That's what I've got. What are you kids looking at? Huh? Huh? What's the matter? Cat got your tongues? All right, it was magic. That's what you want to hear? 
Magic. Ah, go on, take them. They're yours. Take them. Take them. <laughs> It was a very small, misery-laden village on the day of a hanging, and of little historical consequence. And if there is any moral to it at all, let's just say that in any quest for magic, any attempt to understand sorcery, witchery, ledger domain, first check the human heart. For inside that deepest of places is a wizardry that costs far more than a few pieces of gold. Tonight's case in point, offered without further comment, in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. Dust, starring Bill Smitrovich with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Komenik, Tony Castillo, Dale Rivera, Monique Lebreos, C.J. Amari, Amanda Amari, Christian Stolte, Eddie Martinez, Doug James, Fernet Liebel, Alex Sopener, Meg Falcon, Brenda Redhead, Rick Arthur, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, Roger Walski, and Jason Mallow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here is your room, gentlemen. Thank you. I'll turn on the lamp. Leave it off for now. As you wish. I am sorry it's so small, sir. It suits our purposes. Where is the bath? Down the hall. The hall? I can give you one with a private bath, if you prefer. No, no. I said this will do. I'm afraid the dining room is closed at this hour, but you may take a meal at the cafe down the street. We're not hungry, my friend and I. Then I bid you good evening. Good night. Check the window, Boris. You chose the right room. Of course. 
There is Kuchenko, in his room, across the alley. Binoculars? Right here, Commissar. Yes. Yes. See? The Major lies on his bed, but he does not sleep. He will sleep very soon. Give me one shot with this rifle. Not yet, Boris. That would be too easy. Easy? A clean kill. I have something more challenging in mind. Something... Along the lines of a game, perhaps. I don't like games. Not even a game of cat and mouse? What for? To make him squirm a bit before the hammer falls? We waste time, Commissar. Patience, my friend. Hand me the phone. Who are you calling? Hickory Dickory Doc. Front desk. Yes. Excuse me, but do you have a Mr. Kuchenko in your hotel? One moment. Sorry, no one by that name. Ah, but I happen to know that my friend is staying there. Perhaps he is registered under another name? Andreev? I'll check. Yes, Mr. Andreev. Room 963. Very good. Will you connect me, please? Yes, sir. Look, he hears it. Of course he does. He rises from the bed to answer. Yes? This is Major Kuchenko. Hello? Major? Are you there? Major? The cast of characters in our drama? A cat, a cat's assistant, and a mouse. This is the latter, the intended victim, who does not know but may have already guessed that he is to die. His name is Major Ivan Kuchenko, and he was lately an officer in the former Soviet Union. At this point, he has, if events go according to certain predetermined plans, perhaps three or four more hours of living. But an ignorance shared by both Major Kachenko and his executioner is the fact that both have taken rooms at adjacent hotels in a section of the city located beyond the checkpoints of the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, The Jeopardy Room, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. This is Major Kuchenko. Who is calling? Major Kuchenko, you don't know me. Who is this? But I have heard of your recent arrival here. You have the wrong number. And I wanted you to know that you have friends in this city. Friends, you say? And they would be... <laughs> Good friends, Major. Staunch friends. I know no one in this city. May I impose upon you to remain in your room for a little bit? Your friends will make themselves known. And who is this speaking? Is this a friend also? <laughs> a good friend, Major. Not known to you yet, perhaps, but soon to become acquainted. And why must I... stay in my room? We'll be making contact with you very shortly. For what purpose? Your welfare. Your well-being is our deepest concern, Major. Now, Commissar. Not yet, Boris. May I count on you to show some sense, Major? For your own safety, I urge you to remain in your room. You'll be seeing your friends before long. The mouse is in the trap. He stands at the window. Now, Commissar? Patience. But I have him in the crosshairs. I could make his head leave his shoulders at this range. That would give you pleasure, wouldn't it? A great deal of pleasure, Commissar. Just say the word. Even when he lies down, I can still see his head. I believe it, Boris. I know of your prowess, but put the gun away. Put it away? Lay it aside for a bit. We're not going to kill him? Ah, the eagerness of the young. They do not sip wine. They gulp it down like a soft drink. They do not fondle women. They devour them. They do not sniff at the essence of a perfume. They try to jam it into their nostrils. But now, consider the window across the way. 
the gentleman will die without question. But I want him to die, Boris, with finesse, with subtlety, with a degree of thought and care. A killing is a killing. And if a man is to die, what does it matter how he dies? Ever been to a bullfight, Boris? A bullfight? No, Commissar, I've never had that pleasure. A bullfight might serve to make the distinction. In such a contest, if the matador kills with grace, that is considered a good death. Hmm. So, there are good deaths and bad deaths, are there? Precisely. There is death with art, and there is the death of the butcher. You, Boris, are a butcher. Now, that is an honorable profession of great usefulness, but I'm an artist. Oh, you will have a death tonight, within a few hours. But when it is over, we will have killed with artistry, Boris. Not with a meat cleaver or an explosive bullet or any other of the butcher's tools. This death will be like a ballet. Yes? Major Kuchenko? Who is it? A friend, Major. If you prefer, you can turn off the lights and find a hiding place. I'll come in with my hands up, palms open. Major Kuchenko? And you are? I am a friend. May I? For a moment. I would prefer that you put the gun away. Not a chance. Were you the one on the telephone? We had a brief chat earlier. Quite a place you have here. Who occupied it before you? A rat? I have no luxury of choices. Indeed not. In this respect, you are a very poor man of late. However, you have a bed. You have some pictures on the wall. And the floor without so much as a throw rug. An adequate accommodation. And a view of a brick building alongside. I suppose there are worse places to spend an evening, Major? I know. I've been to many of them. Indeed. Indeed you have. Siberia's cold this time of year, is it not, Major? I'm told it's a most uncomfortable climate. You've been told quite correctly. It's a freezing jungle. A freezing jungle. Marvelous. Lovely imagery. Siberia is a freezing jungle. It was. When it was part of the Union. You make reference, of course, to the people who inhabited it. I make reference to some people. Those who were in charge of that private resort. It must have been unpleasant for you? At least sufficiently unpleasant to motivate you to renounce your native land and try to seek asylum elsewhere? For a time. Asylum is no longer necessary under the new regime. Ah, but of course the old ways die hard. Some of the same people remain in charge, and they might be concerned about their public perception in this new world. To the victors go the spoils, and that includes access to certain, let us say, sensitive information? I don't know what you're talking about. Really? But I think you do. You were a political prisoner. You served a term of 12 years. You escaped and you moved quickly when the borders were opened. To bring us up to date, you have made your way to a neutral country, somehow avoiding an official debriefing. You have made contact with certain foreign agencies, and now you're desperately trying to get on an airplane that will take you to a Western nation. But, for some reason, you feel that you're still under surveillance? Oh, it's more than a feeling. I know I'm under surveillance. Do you know by whom? I know very well. Can you tell me who they are? Look in the mirror. Commissar Vasilov? Very discerning, Major. You remember faces? I remember pain. I remember some interrogations that went on for many weeks. I had no calendar, but I made marks on the wall of my cell. How resourceful. 
I remember one particular man who smoked Balkan cigarettes in a long holder and stood in the corner of the room, smiling and nodding, making jokes, while I went from agony to agony. So, Major, now we may dispense with the amenities. The masquerade, the little give and take of two strangers feeling each other out. Agreed. Now we get to the point. Do you honestly think that we would permit you to book passage on an aircraft out of here? That would be quite impossible. As a former member of the military, even as far back as 12 years ago, you have information that we would find embarrassing were it to be released elsewhere. Why, if the government we worked for no longer exists? Because the new government contains many of the same players reshuffled into different positions. And they have their new careers to consider. Consequently, Major, it is not to our advantage that you leave. It would, of course, be simpler and more convenient if you accompany me back to our embassy. I am sick. Tired and torn, Vasilov. But I am not insane. I would sooner cut my wrists over a sink and bleed to death. That would be my choice in the matter. <laughs> you surely can't be serious, Major. I'm rather a connoisseur of the several hundred ways for a man to depart the earth. And you can believe me when I tell you the cutting of the wrist is not a particularly felicitous modus operandi. Quite apart from the pain, which of course must be attendant, is the fact that one dies slowly, and because of this, he has to be an eyewitness to his own demise. <laughs> no, my dear friend, I'm afraid we are of two minds about that kind of death. But enough, I have brought you a small gift. Consider it a peace offering. Careful. Gently, Major. Gently. This happens to be a bottle of Amontillado. Quite rare. And most pleasing to the palate. I have to repeat what I told you before, Commissar. I'm not insane. I'm quite aware of what would happen to me if I drank any of that. Why, Major? I'm disappointed in you. With your kind indulgence, allow me to use your own water glasses. If you assume this is to be cyanide or some other poison, you're quite wrong. Am I? Undoubtedly. You see, I don't share your death wish. I'm a healthy man with excellent expectations as to my longevity. No, indeed, Major. I was about to propose a social drink. The two of us. I'll drink first, and then you. Satisfactory? Such ritual, Commissar. Such tribal rites. Yet you have only one purpose with me. Why don't you get it over with? If you're trying to disarm me and make me get rid of this pistol, it'll take more than a social wine. Indeed, Major. Now, as to my business with you, we both know what that is. Go ahead and say it. Very well. I'm to see that you're dead by tomorrow morning. Is that plain enough? Quite plain. And you shall be, Major. With a degree of immodesty, I can say that I've killed 800 times you. But I've done it, Major, with subtlety, with originality, with ingenuity. I'm the last of the imaginative assassins. An artist of the profession, as it were. Mm. Excellent. Flavor. Bouquet. Just the proper dryness. Really quite an exceptional wine. Join me, Major. And now? And now I will tell you something else. I will tell you something about you and me. Please. You, Major are a malcontent, a genuine curiosity, a rebel with no cause to speak of. You have to go to prison camps, to interrogation centers, or hide in filthy little rooms. You can never accept that which is ordained. And you? I, on the other hand, am a survivor, 
I adapt to my situation. I haven't a large salary, and my job, at least the way it's laid out, is rather dull one. Finding defectors and traitors and subversives and doing away with them. Now, I could do that with a high-powered rifle. I could do it with a homemade bomb. But I choose to exercise imagination and taste. In your case... In my case? In your case, I choose to prolong the game. And in the process of this prolongation, I've come up with what I think is a most bizarre and novel method of execution. One designed especially to challenge your talents. For we are worthy adversaries, you and I. I feel... I feel weak. I feel... Tell me what you feel, Major. Exactly. I want to know. Why, you... You monster. You... You drugged me, after all. Indeed I have. And that poses an interesting question, doesn't it? How is it that we both can drink of the same wine, and yet I'm unaffected? Isn't that an interesting question, Major? Major? <laughs> My head is gone, but I'm still alive. So he wants to play a game. And he has left something behind. What is this? Greetings, Major Kuchenko. I'm an exceptionally good judge of men. Are you? And in my judgment of you, I made an assumption that you are sufficiently observant to see the tape recorder on top of your dresser and curious enough to play it. How could you resist? This will also suggest to what complicated ends I'm willing to go to make a simple execution different and imaginative. First of all, to clear up one point, you may remember our discussion. Before I left you, I proposed a question. Isn't it odd that we both drank of the same wine and how different the effect? Isn't it odd? Really quite incredible and bizarre. How can it be? In all honesty, Major, how do you explain it? Go ahead. I'm listening, you... you... Perhaps you have figured it out already. The truth is, I have been imbibing this particular drug for many years. A sort of experiment with myself as the subject. I have now reached the point where my physical tolerance has risen so that I can drink it by the gallon and remain quite unaffected. This, in itself, is a rather common and uninspired trick, a phenomenon well known to the scientific community. But you will also note, and I hope with a degree of pleasure, that you have not been poisoned. You're very much alive. Where are you? As you've probably perceived, I am rather a gamesman when it comes to killing. I adhere to my own rules and ethics. Hence, Major Kuchenko, I have taken the liberty of removing your pistol so that you won't hurt yourself. Now listen to the following quite carefully. This is the game and these are the rules. You have been asleep for roughly three hours. During that time, in addition to dictating this on the recorder, I have done the following. I have placed a booby trap in your room. It is not visible, but it is attached to a very common object that is in the room. If you trigger this object, it will detonate and you will immediately be blown up. Why not get it over with now, sadist? Now, for a proposition. If, during the next three hours, you are able to find this booby trap and cut the wire, you will be permitted to leave the room alive and unharmed. This is a guarantee. You have my word on it. Your word? 
But the following conditions are of the essence, Major. You must actively search for this booby trap and you must find it and render it inactive. It goes without saying that, as of this moment, you are being observed. How? Attempt to turn out the lights and you will be shot. The moment you stop an active search, should you refuse to play the game, you will also be shot. If you are unable to find the trap within three hours, or attempt to leave the room at any point during that time, I am afraid the same conditions apply. You will receive a bullet in the head. So there you have it, Major. Find the booby trap, cut its wires, and you're free. Fail to find it, or fail to look for it, you're dead. Look for it, find it, but fail to recognize it, you're also dead. Needless to say, Major Kuchenko, it is this latter occurrence that I rather expect and look forward to. <laughs> As a fellow expert in tricks and deception, I think you will admit this situation has its own special imaginative quality. <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Over here, Major. Just across the way. So near and yet so far. Can't you see me? Doesn't the light reflect in my binoculars? Look, Major. Please, look. Try, I implore you. Where have you been, Boris? I brought food from the cafe. Food is of no consequence. Quickly, he's awake. Don't worry, Commissar. I have a clear shot anywhere in the room. Hold your fire until I tell you. But why such an easy target? Too easy. That is the difference between us, Boris. You are a marksman, but I am a gamesman. And the game is afoot. The picture frame? No, no. Too obvious. The, the ceiling. The light fixture. Possibility. Nothing. Oh, you think you are so clever, Commissar. So clever. The bed, then. Under the mattress. The bed springs? It might be. Not the chair, though. Still possible. Where? Ah, that would be telling. Go ahead and eat Boris before it gets cold. He's busy with the hunt for now. What did you bring? Sandwiches. Have one, Commissar. I never eat while I'm working. I'm like an athlete, Boris. Food is a distraction. Food is good. It makes one sluggish, affects the concentration. The morning will come soon enough. Over here, Kuchenko, just across the alley. Don't you see? He sees nothing. But surely a fragment of light, a stray reflection. Perhaps he has seen us. Yes, yes, he must know. But he refuses to acknowledge. He is too proud. He knows he must do this on his own and will not give me the satisfaction. The bookshelf? Or the books themselves? Which one? An atlas? A novel? The Bible, of course. It's already been moved an inch, two inches. But the wire? Where? One way to find out. The bookcase itself, then. Behind the books. In the wood, the nails. Or under the floorboards. Wait, think. Where would I put it? You want a real battle of wits, Vasilov? You've got it. Think. Four walls. Ceiling. Light fixture. Floor. A picture. Bed with frame. Box springs. Mattress. Headboard. A night table. Bookshelf, dresser, window, 
desk. First the drawers. The top one. Slowly. Slowly. What is he doing now? The desk. He's down on his hands and knees removing the two bottom drawers so he can see what's under the top one. Bravo, Major. Good thinking. Is that where you put it? The possibility exists. Look at him, glistening like a mackerel. He stops to wipe the sweat from his eyes. And? And now he looks under the top drawer, crawling on his back. Yes. I think he's got it. Let me kill him. Don't be a fool. There are rules. Now he sees a length of wire. He grasps it between his fingertips very, very carefully, and he has removed it. Something is wrong with the bomb? I doubt it. Then it was not in the drawer? Oh, there is a piece of coat hanger I placed there. A decoy. A drawer would be common, uninspired. And I'm not, you'll forgive the modesty, a common executioner. Where is it, Commissar? In a most ingenious place. Really, quite an ingenious place. Not in the books, the desk, the mattress. Think of another common object in that room, Boris. I have it. Yes? The doorknob. Interesting idea. Then where? I'd rather not tell you at the moment, Boris. I think you'll enjoy the next few minutes more if you share the Major's ignorance. You seem very sure. Sure? That he'll find the trap. You take a risk. Not at all. That's not what I'm sure of. That is to say, I'm reasonably sure he'll find it, given his mental capacity. But he'll find it too late. He's looking toward us. But he can't see us. It's quite dark in here. And it wouldn't matter if he did see us. Now he's returning to the table. You're getting warm, my young friend. The ashtray. Extremely warm, but not hot. Where then? Please, Commissar, please tell me. Take the glasses. What do you see? He stands over the telephone. He is reaching out. Hot now, Boris. Extremely hot. Oh, he has picked it up. I thought for a minute there... You thought what? The telephone. Precisely. The telephone. But he just lifted the receiver. Indeed. He lifted the receiver to call out. If, on the other hand, the Major's telephone were to ring and he were to answer it... That's it, isn't it? If he picks up the phone after it rings... You have it now, my friend. When the Major's phone rings and he answers it, I have placed a tiny bottle of nitroglycerin inside the mechanism. The explosion will only occur after the ring and the lifting of the receiver, at which point the electrical contact will be made and Major Kuchenko will not even have time to say hello. But what if no one calls? Oh, someone will. I promise you, someone will. Front desk. This is the party in 963. I was wondering... Yes, sir? I was wondering if... If you might have the number of another hotel. Another hotel? The one next door, across the alley. Uh, that would be the Grand. You can find it in the directory, in the table by your bed. Dial 9 first, then the number. I see. Thank you. Vasilov, I know you're there, Vasilov. The game is not over yet. Do you have the time, Boris? <clears throat> what, what? The time. <clears throat> Ten minutes to five. Almost done, Commissar. He's tried almost everything. He has ten more minutes. Hadn't I best go over there now and finish it? No, my young friend. That would be impetuous. It would also be a bit embarrassing if someone were to see you. At this hour? 
The streets are empty. Quite apart from the fact that I wanted this to be imaginative, I also wanted subtlety. I should like our quarry to die in his room without our being there. Opportunity is running out. Then I do believe that it's time to, shall we say, accelerate the process? Hotel Mont Blanc? Would you dial room 963, please? Thank you. I'll wait. Here it goes. He's walking toward it. What's the fool doing? Why doesn't he answer it? I... I can tell. He has his back to the window. Turn around so I can see. Now, Commissar! No, no. Would you dial 963 one more time, please? Yes, I know it didn't answer. Ring it again. What's he doing, Boris? His back is still to me. It can't be busy. I don't know. What's he doing? Use the glasses. He's turning around, lighting a cigarette. He's mocking me. Now, he suddenly dropped from sight. Kill him. I can only see the top of his head. He's moving across the room. Do it. You missed, you fool. He's at the door. Again. He's gone out of the room. And you missed him. You missed, you idiot. Flight 17 to Rome, Paris, and New York, now pre-boarding. Ticket, sir. Ticket? Oh, yes. Mr. Andreev. Passport? Right here. Hmm. Let's see. Is anything wrong? No, sir. Everything seems to be in order. How many bags? No luggage. Not even a carry-on? I'm traveling light. Then here's your seat assignment. Please go to gate 17. How much time do I have? Boarding for coach class begins in five minutes. Good. Sir? I mean, thank you. I'll be there. <laughs> what a mess he left behind. Like a pigsty. He tore the bed apart. And the furniture. Oh, just look. Oh, even my poor little tape recorder. Commissar? Yes, Boris? It would have been better, wouldn't it? What would? If I had taken his head off in the first place. You mean if we had slaughtered him like an animal? I love your style, Boris. You should have been a pig farmer. Our man would have been dead by now. He would have been dead if we had beaten him to death with mallets, too. But anyone can die that way. And any stupid, insensitive fool can kill that way. No, this is a man of quality, with a resourceful mind, similar, you might say, to his executioner. He deserves a better ending, as do I. But that's all right. I have time. I'll get him in the next city, now that I know my adversary. We will be able to track him? Most certainly. The old network still functions, though in a much different way. I have the same contacts, no matter what they now call themselves. Importers, exporters, businessmen of various stripes here and abroad. It's marvelous, you know. Really marvelous. Think of the possibilities. Other, even more ingenuous methods of doing away with Kuchenko and his kind. I still think we should have chased him. Not at all. He would have gotten away. And even if he hadn't, it would mean that a thick-headed clod like you is more efficient than I. And this I reject, Boris. This I reject in toto. Look at this. A bottle of wine. I can only find one glass. Throw it away. One drink, Commissar. I said no. But there is more than half left. This is not for you. But why? Do you know much about Amontillado? I know about vodka. Of course, you and all the other potato growers. Give me the glass. Here. Believe me, it wouldn't agree with you. It's an acquired taste. Yes, Commissar. If you say so. 
I say so. There are some secrets that you're not ready to learn. But in time, Boris, in time. For now, I need you awake and alert. That's right. I do what you say, as always. But so far, your methods are not very effective. The men who pay us, they will not be impressed. And you will make a report? Only I can do that. I am the one they listen to. I can request another assignment. You're free to do so. Until then, I take no further orders from you. As you wish. You might want to reconsider, though. The resort in Siberia may be closed, but there are others. We have allies. All it would take is a single phone call. Comrade Boris, uncooperative, recalcitrant, unwilling to follow instructions. In this new order, there are not many positions for the uneducated, the blockheads with families. I... I... Yes? Well, I... You want to say something? I withdraw my complaint. What's that? I didn't hear you. I... I am tired, Commissar. I say many things when I am tired. You wish to apologize? Yes. Very well. I will take it under advisement. In the meanwhile, see if Major Kuchenko left anything behind. Check the closet, the drawers. Yes, Commissar. And life goes on. The sun comes up and we arise to meet another day to prevail by our wits and our wits alone. I'll get it, Commissar. No, Boris. I don't play fool. No! I'm sorry, sir. Your party doesn't answer. No? It doesn't ring at all now. You're sure? Mont Blanc Hotel, room 963. Strange. The line is suddenly dead. Thank you, operator. That means my message got through. Flight 17, Transocean Airways, now departing from New York City via Belgrade, Paris, Rome, London. Major Ivan Kachinko on his way west, on his way to freedom. A freedom bought and paid for by a most stunning ingenuity. Exit a gunman named Boris and one Commissar Vasilov, who forgot that there are two sides to an argument and two parties on every line. This has been a collect call placed direct to you from a phone booth located somewhere in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, You'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Jeopardy Room with Stacy Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for the Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Yasin Pyankov, Jamie Van, Terry Berner, Katrina Lenk, Ned Noyes, Anna Sverutsa, and Lisa Dotson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, 
Exum Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Jenny, that you? Yes, Aunt Agnes. And where are you going, young lady? Oh, no place. And what are you going to do when you get there? Well, play, I guess. Finish your homework first. I did. English and arithmetic and... Jenny. Honest, Aunt Agnes. Go look in my room if you want. It's late. Dinner will be on soon. I know. I'll be back in time, I promise. Well, see that you do. Bye, Aunt Agnes. And Jenny. Yes? See that you're back before the store closes, in case I need anything. Yes, ma'am. Ben? Ben, are you in there? Come in. Hi, Ben. Why, who's that? It must be my favorite princess. Ben, will you help me? What's the matter? Howie and the boys are in the park playing softball and... Well, why aren't you out there with them? You know they don't like girls on their team. But if I bring somebody else to play... Hmm, now who might that be? You, Ben. You're so much fun and... Uh, I don't know. I... I'm getting pretty old, you know. No, you're not. They like you. Uh, sometimes they don't like the things I do. Then do it for me, Ben. We can be on the same side. I need you. Well, if you put it that way, after all, you are my princess, aren't you? Of course I am. You know that. Across the far reaches of time and space. Yep. Well, then I'd better provide the transportation. Come on, Princess Jenny. Never mind your leg brace. Just right on my shoulders. There we go. Oh, thank you, Ben. We'd better hurry. The game already started. Next batter. Hey, batter, 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 batter. Go on, pitcher. Come on, throw the ball. Leave him alone. He's winding up. Rally, rally. The pitcher's name is Sally. Go, pitcher. Go, pitcher. Steer right three. You're out. Hey, umpire. You're crazy. Yeah, that wasn't a strike. Sure was. Was not. I call him like I see him. <laughs> Howie Gottlieb, you're never going to get to heaven. That was a ball and you know it. Was not. Was too. How about it, Ben? You saw it. Now, now, Jenny. Howie's the umpire. Hear that? Who's up next? You are. What? You guys are playing me and Ben. If nobody wants to be on our team, we don't care, do we, Ben? I, I'd better warm up. I'm pretty old to be playing softball. Where's the uh, bat? Right here. Go on, Ben. You can do it. Well, if you think I can, Jenny, then I'll give it a try. Spread out, everybody. Let's play ball. All right, pitcher. Come on. Strike him out. Hey, bat, 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 bat. Here it comes. Swing, Ben. Whoa. He craned it. Where'd it go? I can't even see it anymore. Home run. No fair. You said you wouldn't use magic anymore. Did I? I don't remember saying that. Yeah, that's cheating. Who cheated? Nobody cheated. What do you think? I'm not sure. Could be him. If it is, it's certainly a clever disguise. Keep walking. Don't let them spot us. It's been said that science fiction and fantasy are two different things. Science fiction, the improbable made possible. Fantasy, the impossible made probable. What would you have if you put the two together? Well, chances are you'd have a story about an old man named Ben 
who knows some tricks most people don't know, and an 11-year-old girl named Jenny, who walks with a brace on one leg and who loves her friend Ben very much. What happens next? We'd hate to spoil it for you. Better stick around because they've already begun their journey together into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Fugitive, starring Stan Freeberg, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Come on, let's stop arguing and play. With what? We don't have a ball anymore. He knocked it out of the park, remember? I really should apologize for that, I guess. All right, never mind. We'll play something else. Like what? How about Spaceman? Yeah, that's a good one. In that case, those who wish to play uh, Spaceman, please raise your hands. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. That's it then. We'll play Spaceman. Jenny, you be the Martian. No, uh, not this time. It's your turn. I know, but gee, Ben, I'm not as good as you are. Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's true. I can't turn into things the way you can. Yeah. Come on, Ben. Be a good guy. Jenny's too slow. Very well. But this is the last time. Yes. yes. This is going to be so much fun. What should I do? What are you asking her for? Because Jenny gets to write the script. Who says? I think it's only fair. Go ahead, Jenny. Well, see that rock over there by the bushes? Yes. That'll be the rocket ship. I see. And I'm the captain. What are you talking about? Who ever heard of a girl being a captain? Yeah, Jenny. I'll write you, bunch of babies. Howie, you be the captain. The rest of you are lieutenants and stuff. Who are you? <laughs> I'm the beautiful princess. Aww. Listen to her now. <laughs> She gets to choose. Okay, now, Ben, you go over there to the ship. Like this? We just landed. See, this is Mars. We're exploring. Trying to find out if any Martians are here. Got it? What do you want me to do? Hide behind the bushes. I mean the ship. When we get there, you come out and make it scary this time. You know what I mean. Really horrible. Not too horrible. Howie, you're a sissy. Okay, man, stick with me. Get out your ray guns. You're supposed to hide, Ben. Very well. Goodbye for now. Uh, find anything, Captain Spaulding? <laughs> you're Captain Spaulding. Okay, okay. Well. Did you? No, sir. Nothing round here. Then let's blast off for Earth and go home. What about the girl? Leave her here. Hey, you can't do that. Sure, I can. I'm the captain, aren't I? You think there's any Martians hiding in the ship? No way. It's sealed. Better check it out. Go on. You go. You're the captain. Are you too chicken, Howie? I'm not chicken. Then go. I'm going. <laughs> Ten feet tall. Then shoot your ray guns. He went back behind the ship. You got him. <laughs> I think they did. Ben, how do you do that? Oh, just a little trick I learned. Yeah, but where? Remember what I've said. You mustn't tell anyone about my. My tricks. Ben's magic, aren't you, Ben? Ah,、uh, that's enough for one day. Time to go home, Jenny. I'll provide the transportation. <sighs> Here we are, my lady. Door to door service. Thanks, Ben. How do you know how to ride a skateboard? Oh, I've watched your friends. I'm a、uh, fast learner. Pretty neat. That'll be ten cents, please. I'll pay you tomorrow. Can I trust you? Maybe yes, maybe no. In that case, it's a deal. Come on, I'll carry you upstairs. Ben, you're so nice. What? Oh my! What did I do to deserve that? <laughs> say I'm weary. Say I'm sad. Say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm growing old, but add, Jenny kissed me. What's that? Earth poetry. You made it up? Not me. But I like it. So do I. Up we go now.
careful of the stairs. I'm always careful. Ben? Hmm? Tell me something. What is it, little monkey? Well, if you can do so many things... Hmm, some things. How come you don't make my leg well? Because then I wouldn't have the fun of carrying you. <laughs> You'd get yourself a young boyfriend and I'd never see you again. I'm serious. You could do it, couldn't you? Oh, perhaps. But Jenny, I... I mustn't. Why? People would wonder how it happened. Besides, I shouldn't uh, interfere. That's not interfering. That's... I told you to be back before the liquor store closed. Oh, it's my fault, Mrs. Gann. Jenny told me, but I... I must have lost track of the time. It's always your fault, isn't it? Don't be mad at him, Aunt Agnes. Shut up, you. Put her down. Of course. <clears throat> Get inside, girl. I'm going. You ungrateful little gutter snipe. Mrs. Gann, please. You stay out of this. After all I'd done for the girl, after I fed you, took care of you, gave you a place to sleep... Where'd you be without me, huh? Well, I'll tell you, in an orphanage. And if you don't mind your P's and Q's, that's where you'll end up. Now get to your room. Please, Aunt Agnes. I said get in there. <coughs> what are you looking at? <coughs> Mrs. Gann, don't you ever lift your hand to Jenny again. Oh, don't you tell me how to raise that child. You heard me. Now you listen to me. I've had a stomach full of you hanging around that girl, turning her against me, filling her head with crazy ideas. This ain't none of your business, you hear me? I hear you. Well, I ain't gonna put up with it no more. And if I hear tell of you even talking to her from now on, I'm gonna call the cops. So that's how it is. You bother us again, and that's what'll happen. So help me. And shut up with all that slobbering. You hear me? Oh, now what? Yeah? Mrs. Gann? What about it? Excuse us, madam, but we're trying to gather some information about a tenant of this building. They call him old Ben. Him? Do you know the gentleman? <laughs> He's no gentleman. No? Uh, if that's not the proper term. You cops. In a way. Uh, FBI, probably. Or the IRS. I knew it. May we come in? I guess so. What did he do? If you don't mind, we'll ask the questions. Okay, but ask him in the kitchen. I gotta fix dinner. Very well. How long has he lived here? In this building? Year and a half. Yeah, that'd be about right. Oh, they're talking about Ben. Do you know his previous address? Mr. Nobody knows nothing about him. What his name is, where he come from. Most interesting. Have you ever seen him do anything unusual? Like what? Well, what you might call... magic. Nah. Kids say he's good at tricks, but I never seen any. Can't say that he works. Maybe he gets checks in the mail, but not that I know. So he has no visible means of support. Ben? Jenny? What is it? Ben. Oh, Ben. Something wrong? Two policemen. They're talking to my aunt. They're after you. Ah, uh, I didn't think she'd go through with it. No, Aunt Agnes didn't call them. They came right after you left. Jenny, this is very important. What did they look like? I was in my room. I just saw a little bit of them in the kitchen. But I don't know. Tall, kinda. Dark-haired, um, young, but not real young. Suits and, I think, neckties. And did the suits look brand new, without a wrinkle, like they'd just been made? Yeah, that's right. Ah, oh, it's them. I knew it would happen someday. They've finally caught up with me. Who has, Ben? What are you so scared of? What did you do? I, I can't tell you that, Jenny. Was it something bad? Not what you and I would think of as bad. Then tell me. I thought we were friends. We are. Best friends. Friends don't keep secrets. I don't know where you came from or why you're running away. I'm sorry, little monkey. It doesn't matter now anyhow. They're here. It's too late. No, it isn't. I know a swell hiding place. They'll never find you. They'll...
Yes? Jenny, what are you doing in here? Nothing. Is he here? Not a trace. Where is he? I don't know. You're lying. She's lying. I can tell. She knows. Do you, child? No, sir. I came to see him, but he was gone. I think he's out on the prairie feeding pigeons. The prairie? That's what we call the park on the corner. We pretend it's out in the wilderness, and we hide behind the bushes and play games and... You pretend too much. Yes, ma'am. Well, if you see him, please say nothing of our visit. Oh, don't worry. I know how to keep my mouth shut. You too, little girl. Okay. We'll check back tomorrow. You do that. And you, get home right now. Yes, ma'am. Wait, what's that? What's what? That thing in your shirt pocket. Oh, that's just Gandalf. Gandalf? My pet mouse. You remember Aunt Agnes. What's it doing out of its cage? Oh, he gets bored staying in my room all the time. Well, you put it back in right now. I never should have let you keep it. I have a good mind to... Bye, Aunt Agnes. I ought to beat you till you can't sit down, but I won't, because I'm too tired. Go to bed and don't let me hear a peep out of you. Good night, Aunt Agnes. And don't try sneaking out again if you know what's good for you. Keep that filthy white rat out of my sight. Come on, Gandalf. Hi, Gandalf. How are you, boy? Guess what? I brought you a new twin brother to play with. <clears throat> you weren't really going to put me in the cage with Gandalf, were you? No. <laughs> I knew you were going to change back. We sure fooled them, didn't we, Ben? Whoever they are. For the moment, but they'll be back. And sooner or later, they'll catch on. I think it's so neat the way you do that. One thing I don't get, though. How do you make the clothes change, too? And then you turn into something else. Eh, not very difficult. It's all matter. One molecular structure is much like another, isn't it? I guess. Speaking of changing clothes, Jenny, you'd better start wearing a dress instead of those jeans, don't you think? At least some of the time, or your aunt will have a fit. I don't care. Let her. Now, now, that isn't very respectful, is it? You must remember she's a very nervous person. She isn't wholly responsible for her behavior. Well, if she's not, who is? I don't have an answer for that. In any case, try to forgive her, if you can find it in your heart. After all, she's only human. All right, but what about you? What are you going to do? Oh, the best I can, I reckon. I'm serious. So am I. That's all any of us can do. Even you? Even me. Beyond that... Ben? Yes? How come those men are after you? Uh, it's a long story. You can tell me. You'll still be my best friend no matter what. Are you a criminal? In a way, yes. Yes, I suppose I am. What'd you do? Rob a bank? Oh, nothing like that. Did you kill somebody? Heavens, no. Then you must be a communist. <laughs> no, little monkey, not a communist. And not a terrorist, either. I'm not an enemy of anyone. At least, not anyone I can think of. Then what? Shh. What's the matter? Those two men. They may still be close by. I heard them leave. I'd better go to the window and check the street, just to be sure. See anything? Huh. It's just as I thought. They're downstairs on the other side of the street. What are they doing? Watching the building. Waiting for me to come out. Oh, Ben. Don't you worry now. I'll... I'll think of something. Listen, Ben. I have an idea. Why don't you fool him again? And how do you propose doing that? Easy. Turn into something. I doubt it would work a second time. Sure it would. Something really little, like a spider or, or a cockroach. They'd never find you then. I'm afraid they would. But how? <laughs> Those boys have ways. They're pretty clever. You see, Jenny, they know my real form. They can tell when I'm in the vicinity. I'm talking about my true shape, the way I really look. Isn't this the way you really look? Oh, no, no. Have I ever seen you the way you really look? Nope. Not even when you turn into a Martian with all those eyes? Definitely not. Then you must be really icky. I wouldn't say that, exactly. <laughs> You'd be surprised. There are certain adult females who have found me quite attractive, or... So they said. I want to see. No, no, Jenny. You've been very good about letting me keep my secrets. Can't you even tell me just one? 
Well, all right, just one. I suppose it wouldn't do any harm. You see, I'm not from around here. That's okay. I'm not either. We moved here from... What I mean is, I'm not actually a resident of this world. Huh? I come from another planet. I knew it. I knew it. Which one? Mars? No. One much farther away. You've never heard of it. Anyway, Jenny, you see, those men out there, they've come a long way. They're trying to catch me so they can take me back. Because of what you did? Mm-hmm. And I don't want to go back. I've grown to like it here. But they've located me. So now the only thing I can do is find another world to hide in. Another world? One as far away from here as possible. That's my only chance. You mean you're just going to go away? I don't want to, little monkey. But I have no choice. But Ben, you're the only friend I have. Look at me, Jenny. Please? That's it. Before I go, there is one thing I want to do. A last good deed. I'd have done it long before this, but it would have shown them where I was. Now, that, that doesn't matter anymore. What do you mean? Take that thing off your leg. My brace? Go on. You won't need it anymore. But... Trust me. Okay. Now hold very still. What's that? Just something I carry with me from the other place. The secret of my magic. My leg. It, it feels all funny. Sort of tingly. Jenny! Yeah? Who are you talking to? Myself. Well, you can go crazy that way. Cut it out. Okay, I will. Good night. Night. Ben. Ben, is that you? No, Ben. Stay away from the window. Don't go outside. Don't. Ben, look. My leg. I can walk without the brace. It doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, Ben. Ben. Come back, Ben. There's the girl. Where's she going? Hold on. What? Going out at this time of night? It's past your bedtime. Excuse me. Well, well, look at that. Jenny, uh, how can you walk without your leg brace now? Something happened. Something we should know about. Get out of my way. Where is he, Jenny? Where's Ben? I don't know. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. You made him go away. You made him leave me. I hate you. We've got to stop her. No, don't use it. You mustn't. It's the only way. Now you've done it. Quickly, we've got to get out of here. He's somewhere outside. I'm sure of it. Jenny? Jenny, where are you? Jenny! What are you doing down there on the floor? Oh, must have fallen. Are you hurt? Jenny, answer me! Well? Well, what? She's all right, ain't she? I'm afraid not. Oh, uh, no. I don't have any money for a hospital. Hospital? I don't know why she'd want to do a stupid thing like that anyway. What are you talking about? Going down the stairs without her leg brace. What do you think? Whatever's wrong with your niece, Mrs. Gann, it doesn't have anything to do with her legs. Nothing to do with... In fact, her legs appear to be perfectly all right. Both of them. Then what? However, the girl does seem to be in a rather serious condition. How serious? Well, she doesn't have a fever. In fact, I can't find any organic cause. But if her pulse continues to weaken... What's the matter with her? Whatever it is, it's beyond my knowledge. It may well be more than medical science can understand. The only thing we can do now is wait. I've left the window partially open so the room won't be quite so stuffy. If she doesn't show signs of improvement during the next hour, perhaps you should call the hospital. They can run some tests, though I can't imagine what they'll find. Oh, no. Jenny, I made a promise to your mother, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> Hello, little monkey. Ben, I thought you went away. 
I did, but I couldn't stay away from my best friend for long. Besides, being a fly isn't much fun, and <laughs> wings and all, not to mention they're colorblind. Even my glasses wouldn't have helped. Blew. Now you're back in bed, I see. Oh, Ben. What seems to be the matter? I don't know. I saw those two policemen. They're not policemen. Uh, not exactly. What do they do? I tried to get away, but one of them took something out of his pocket, like that magic thing you carry. What? They used the molecular ray on you? Uh, that's going too far. They told me to stop, and then I fell down. Am I gonna die, Ben? Eventually, as we all must, but not now. Do you trust me? You know I do. Then close your eyes. What are you gonna do? Something to make you well again. The way you fixed my leg? That's right. Just lie still. Ben, I feel fine. Better? Yes, I'm fine. How did you do that? Just another little secret I brought with me. That should neutralize anything they've done. It did. Ben, I... Ben, listen. They're here. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. I've been expecting you. We're sorry to intrude like this, but uh, you're aware of the rules. Yes, yes, at ease. Where's my aunt? She's sitting on the sofa, resting peacefully. We've paused her temporal flow just while we're here. Uh, she won't know anything's happened. That was a terrible thing you did, hurting an innocent child. We didn't want to hurt her, Your Majesty. It was the only way, sir. We knew you'd return to make her well again. I understand, but I still don't like it. Ben... What's going on? How come they called you Your Majesty? Well, little one, <laughs> I have to confess. You see, I'm something of a fraud. Why? I'm not really a criminal, and these two men aren't really policemen. Something more along the lines of palace guards. Huh? They're actually my subjects, and I regret to say I'm what you would call their king. Ah, oh, come on. Cross my heart and hope to die. Then what are you running away for? It's hard to explain. Wouldn't make much sense to you, I suppose. I guess I wasn't cut out to be a king. All that responsibility, the fuss, the pomp and circumstance, I don't know. After the first thousand years, it sort of got me down, you know? I knew it would be at least four thousand more years before I could turn the job over to someone else. So I just took off, Jenny. Split. High-tailed it. Went on the lamb. In short, I skedaddled. Begging your pardon, but it wasn't 4,000 Earth years, Your Majesty. Quite right. Quite right. In Earth terms, it would have been even longer. Well, all I can say is, he must have been a pretty good king to cause all this trouble. Oh, he was, miss. He was the best of kings. You should have seen him in his royal attire, with all his royal appendages. The grandest leader to walk upright in the entire galaxy. Ah, uh, that's enough now. But it's true. You can have your Venusian vegetables, your Syrian slime molds, your strutting bivalve from Betelgeuse. When Exolotl went walking, or should I say perambulating, it was like a third sun shining down from the heavens. <laughs> tut, tut, gentlemen. Is that who you really are, King Ixa... Ixolotl? <laughs> Oh, what's in the name? So, you see, miss, that's why we want him back. His subjects have been pining for him ever since. Life has been listless. An endless succession of moon phases. There is no joy in Ixolotlville. In other words, we're as fond of him as you are. We need him. But you can't have him. Eh, not much to be done about it now, Jenny. They've found me out. <laughs> I was on a sort of vacation, but all that's over now. The Royal Transporter is waiting, sir. In that case, gentlemen... But, Ben, I mean your majesty, you can't go away with them. I need you here. I hope you'll remember me, Jenny. I know I'll remember you. Wait, you said I was your princess, didn't you? Yes. Well, prove it. Take me with you. That would be out of the question. Absolutely. Hmm, she does have a point, you know. It's hard being a king. The first one they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job and it makes a life form watchful 
and a little lonely. The council would never permit it. My appointees all. Sir, you know the rules. I should. I made them. Please, Ben. Please. If only there were some way. Ben? Hmm? Come here. I have to tell you something in private. Your Majesty, there's simply no more time. Gentlemen, one last request. I want a minute alone with Jenny. But, sir... I promise by our fathers that I won't run away or try to escape. You give your royal word. Precisely. What do you think? I don't see how we can refuse. Very well. One minute, your majesty. Earth time. One minute it is. Excuse us while we sit down next to you, Mrs. Gant. We won't be long. She can't hear you. As far as she's concerned, we're not here at all. Frozen in time, as it were. What's that bottle in her hand? It's called beer. An intoxicating beverage based on the fermentation of single-celled life forms. I should take it out of her hand, in case she drops it. No, no. I think she's meant to have one at all times. Some sort of self-medication for behavioral control. Oh. Remember to start the temporal flow again when we leave. Of course. What's going to happen when we get back? Oh, a parade, I imagine. All the riffraff slithering along the Grand Crater. Quite a sight. We'll be celebrities. Quite. Don't forget to have your antennae washed and set. Hmm. What are they talking about in there? Privileged communication. I suppose. Oh, to have blue blood in our veins, eh? Uh, green. Right. Time? Time. Sorry, Your Majesty, but the minute is... Yes. Oh, no. Your Majesty, you can't be serious. But we are. This isn't fair. This isn't fair at all. You can't do this to us. Why not? But there are two of you. What's the matter? Can't tell us apart? In that case, they'll just have to take both of us. Both? Yes. The Council wouldn't like it if you made a mistake. What if you brought back the wrong one? Well, I hope the Council will understand our dilemma and make certain allowances. Perhaps they will. Shall, Shall we go? We'll have to send in Agnes a postcard. Yeah, postmark deep space, with a picture of Ben the way he really looks. She won't believe how handsome he is. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> no, Aunt Agnes won't believe it, because she has more temper than imagination, more suspicion than understanding and no patience for either science fiction or fantasy. But eventually it may occur to her that one day, on another planet, in the far reaches of space, her niece will grow up to be not only a princess, but an honest-to-goodness queen. Said coronation to take place somewhere in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Fugitive, starring Stan Freeberg with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Amanda Amari, Meg Falcon, David Darlow, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Mike Castle, J. David Ruby, and Clint Todd. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcherson, Dick Brescia Associates, 
Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Good evening, Colonel Taylor. Evening, Patrick. Has Mr. Alfred arrived? Not yet, sir. Warm for this time of year, would you say? I would. Quite balmy, in fact. I might have dispensed with the overcoat altogether. Martin? Yes, sir. See to the Colonel's car. Right away. Is he new? Just started this evening. Mind you, drive carefully now. Park it all the way in the back, away from the other cars. Yes, sir. Here's a little proposition for you, my boy. See this bill? That's fifty dollars, sir. Indeed. And if there are no dents or scratches when you bring it back, not a one, mind you, this is yours. All of it. I promise, sir. Good. A man should always keep his promises. You shouldn't spoil the lad. Nonsense. A little incentive, that's all. How was it in the club this evening? Mm, the usual crowd. Is Mr. Tennyson here by any chance? Yes, sir. Uh, for some time now. Thank you, Patrick. Colonel Taylor, how nice to see you. Let me take your coat. Is there a table in the oak room? Yes, but I'm afraid the fireside chairs are all filled at the moment. Mr. Tennyson, I presume. <clears throat> yes, sir, it is. If you'd care for a seat in the card room... No, no, I'll find my way. Mr. Alfred arrives. Please send him to the Oak Room. Of course. Well, I'll tell you something else, gentlemen. The most idiotic thing occurred in the market today. Just idiotic. I've been doing a little dabbling in the syndicate. It still has some oil holdings in the western part of Texas. Well, anyway, Jack Brewer. He handles our New York operation for us. He comes in on the floor, and I happen to be there. This was, oh, about 10.30 this morning, and he waves to me, and he's got a sheaf of papers in his hand, and I can assure you, if there's anyone I don't want to see before noon on any given day, it's Jack Brewer. Raucous sort, a little crude. Nouveau riche, you know the type. Yes. Oh, yes. Give you a light, Jamie? Not necessary. Not at all. Oh, this lighter? Solid gold. Gift from my dad when I got out of Princeton. Now, where was I? Uh, Jack Brewer. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Charlie Sport, let me sit there, would you, old man? Your chair is much softer, and I'm afraid I'm just worn out. Not a problem. Ah, much better. Now then. Oh, yes. Anyway, Brewer, I call him Brewer the Boar, walks across the floor to me with an intense voice, a voice absolutely shaking with intensity, sidles up and whispers. He's got a miserable habit of whispering sotto voce when everyone in the world can hear him. Anyway, he says to me, oh, Jim, I've got to scrape up a quarter of a million. Can you imagine? A quarter of a million? And I'm the usual, sir? What? Him. Oh, yes. The usual. It might be quieter in the blue room. No, no, this will do. Young Mr. Tennyson is in rare form tonight. Yes, sir. Well, you're the only one who can handle it for me. This is Brewer speaking. To me. Well, anyway, to make a long story short... Mr. Jamie Tennyson, who at best is a dapper, albeit articulate, ne'er-do-well. He is glib, but shallow, well-groomed, but worthless. His every gesture is studied, obvious, planned. He is a mannered dandy, devoid of character, and his presence in this gentleman's club is a social condescension on the part of the members. For this man's credentials are an accident of birth and nothing more. 
and across the room, a gray-haired ramrod of an ex-army officer, rock-hewn and coldly unemotional in his appraisal of others, but he was no longer able to conceal his distaste in an altogether gentlemanly fashion. And that distaste is about to take the form of a proposed wager. But it's the kind of wager that comes without precedent. It stands alone in the annals of bet-making as the strangest game of chance ever offered by one man to another. In just a moment, we'll learn the terms of the wager and what Mr. Tennyson does about it. And in the process, we'll witness all parties spinning the wheel of chance in a very bizarre casino called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Silence, starring Chris McDonald with Stacy Keach as your narrator. A quarter of a million, mind you. And I'm supposed to scrape it up for him. I'm supposed to scrape it up as if it were some kind of residue lying around that literally can be scooped off a floor. There you are, Alfred. I just got your letter. Sit down, please. Look, Archie. Shh, shh, shh. Our young friend is discoursing again. The opening salvo and then the attack. That may well be. The only thing worse than his loquaciousness is his transparency. In about 30 seconds, Alfred, he'll very nonchalantly request a loan, a sizable loan, from anyone with an earshot. Mark my words. The letter you sent me is the most incredible thing I've ever read. Is it? You must be out of your mind. Not at all, but that's a medical appraisal. What I'm looking for from you is legal advice. Archie, we're old friends, but I must tell you. My communication to you, Alfred, was not as an old friend. It was directed to you as my lawyer. Is the wager I have in mind legal? No wager is legal in this state. Is it against the law, then? Is there anything criminal about it? I don't see anything criminal in it, no, but the thing is so incredible. In substance, that's what I wanted to hear from you. Franklin? Yes, sir? Would you take this over to young Mr. Tennyson across the room there? Tell him it's from me and ask him to read it immediately. Why, all right, sir. Well, as I'm sure you know, gentlemen, I'm familiar with the plastics business inside and out. Inside and out. And Brewer has obviously stumbled upon a golden goose. But the man is just too incredibly stupid to know what to do with it. Can you imagine what I could do with a quarter of a million dollars in this kind of deal? Well, I'll tell you this. I can treble it. I can quadruple it. With an initial investment of a quarter million, I can take this plastics thing and I can... Excuse me, Mr. Tennyson. A, a note for you, sir, from Colonel Taylor. Uh, just put it down there, Franklin. Now then... Excuse I... me, sir. The Colonel's instructions are that you read it immediately. I beg your pardon? The Colonel, you say? Across the room, sir. Yes, yes, the Colonel. He's waiting, sir. Oh, all right. Let's see what he has to say. What's the matter, Tennyson? He looks like he's seen a ghost. Why, why, this is just, this is just absolute nonsense. What about it, Tennyson? See here. Yes? Is this some sort of joke? I mean, really, Colonel. If, if it's a joke, then I suggest you're employing a sense of humor that's quite beyond me. It's not a joke, Tennyson. You know me reasonably well. Humor is perhaps the least developed aspect of my character. You're in earnest, then. Oh, quite in earnest. What's it all about? Come on, Tennyson, let us in on it. Yes, please. The suspense is killing us. Would you mind terribly, Tennyson, if I acquainted the gentleman with my proposition? That's quite your business, Colonel. Quite your business. But I do believe you will make yourself highly suspect. I'll take the risk. I propose a wager with Mr. Tennyson here. A wager that takes the following form. I bet Mr. Tennyson one million dollars that he will be unable to remain silent for one year. What? Surely you're not serious. He's joking. The wager carries with it the following conditions. He will be placed in a room to be observed by me or anyone else at their discretion. He will not be permitted to speak a word for a period of 12 months. Not a single syllable. He will be supplied with food, television, books, anything he wants by way of diversion but he will make his wants known by pen and paper, not by voice. Incredible. Are you pulling her legs? A million dollars? I don't believe it. What about it, Tennyson? First, let's establish that you're quite serious. Beyond any doubt. Then, 
May I ask the purpose of this wager? That should be obvious. That is, to anyone but you. I'm afraid it eludes me, Colonel. So perhaps you'd be good enough to explain to me why you're willing to risk one million dollars? Risk? Hardly a risk, Tennyson. Well, hardly a risk at all. But if the wager is genuine... What I'm about to say would horrify the average man, but to someone as insensitive as you, it will probably mean nothing. Oh, is that right? I dislike you intensely, Tennyson. It goes well beyond the normal distaste I would feel for anyone without manners, without breeding, without principle. Beyond and much deeper. You've become a call celeb with me. Your voice has become intolerable. See here. Each night I sit here and the sound of it makes me wince. I cannot ask you to leave the club because I don't have the right. So, the thought occurred to me that I would be happy to risk, as you say, a large sum of money. Just to have quiet. You see, Tennyson, you couldn't possibly remain silent for a year. It's not in your nature. You're a shallow, compulsively talkative, empty-headed ne'er-do-well. And to remain silent would destroy you. Your kind has to seek out an audience. So what I assume will happen, what I more than assume, I fully expect, is that you will very likely be able to withstand the pressures for three or four weeks, perhaps a couple of months, and then you'll have to succumb. Again, that's your nature. So you won't cost me anything, but what I'll derive from it is a month or two of delightful and very precious silence. What about a Tennyson? Appeal to your sporting blood? Oddly enough, it does. It does appeal to my sporting blood. And that, of course, is patently ridiculous. There's nothing sporting about you, Tennyson. But I happen to know you're rendering your nightly financial folder roll because you're in desperate straits. You've run out of your inheritance, and your debts are insurmountable. In short, you're a desperate man, and you do just about anything for money. Except, of course, to remain silent for one year. Colonel, if this were Europe and the company were a bit more sophisticated, I should be forced to invite you outside for the things you've just said. Would you now? Yes, but the ground rules here are somewhat different. As it stands, I can either ignore you or call your bluff. I'm going to do the latter. I accept your wager. Careful, Tennyson. Oh, surely not. Watch what you're agreeing to. Just a few more questions. Where am I to be incarcerated? In the solarium upstairs. It's no longer being used. With the permission of the Board of Governors, I'll have some work done on it. It will be a glass-enclosed living room with a private bedroom and bath that will remain unobserved. Around the room will be placed microphones, which you are to leave untouched. Your every movement will be recorded, and of course, as it follows, <laughs> so will your voice. In the event you decide to give up, you will permit me or anyone else to observe you at any time. When will this start? I've been planning this for quite a while, and I've made all the necessary inquiries. The room can be constructed by tomorrow night. Oh, Archie, for the love you of... You will enter any time after 10 p.m., and at 10 o'clock on June the 3rd of next year, you can leave the room. I'll have a certified check in the amount of $1 million waiting for you, assuming the impossible happens and you have remained silent for the full 12 months. Well, Tennyson, your question's answered. They are. I'll be back tomorrow night. Oh, and I would like the check placed on deposit in my name with a photostat of it available to be witnessed by every man in the club. Excellent. That's thoughtful and businesslike, Tennyson. You surprise me. That would be the normal procedure in a pawn shop or a fish market, but not in this club and not with me. My credit happens to be as well known as my honor, Mr. Tennyson, as any member in this room can attest. There will be no check placed on deposit. You will have to be satisfied with my word. Very well, then. So this will be a contest between my courage and your credit. And a year from now, one year from tomorrow's date, both can be proved beyond the shadow of a doubt. Precisely. Get my coat, Franklin. By all means, sir. Immediately. Until tomorrow, then, Colonel. And may the better man win, most definitively. Tennyson. What is it? This is none of my business. You're right, old man. It's not. But I've known Colonel Taylor for a long time. This is not a capricious man. He's dead serious. Do you know my wife, Charles? We've met. 
Her name is Doris, a lovely thing. Frail, beautiful, fragile, like a cameo brooch. Oh yes, she certainly is that, and more. But I'm afraid her tastes run to unfragile things. Sizable baubles with sizable price tags. She shops at Tiffany's like most women enter a supermarket. And my miserable misfortune is that I happen to... Well, I happen to love her very much. And so at this particular moment, I do happen to be in desperate need of money. Now, that may sound melodramatic. Uh, not at all, Jamie. But it happens to be true. And my wife's faithfulness is in direct proportion to the size of the allowance I give her. I didn't mean to make light of it. Uh, please believe me. So, that's why I'll be back tomorrow night. <laughs> How bizarre. Don't you think so, old sport? How incredibly bizarre to remain indoors, shut up, silent, in a room for 12 entire months in exchange for a $1 million life preserver thrown to me by none other than Colonel Archie Taylor. I'll say good night now. There are arrangements that must be made. How's it coming, gentlemen? Right on schedule, Mr. Taylor. Almost finished. On the plumbing, the electrical outlets. Everything works. We'll give it one more inspection, but I'd say everything's about ready. What about the microphones? They're in position? Yep, and all around the room and plugged into this tape recorder. If he says one word, we'll know about it. You turn it on like this. Test one, two. Test one, two. In that case, give the crew my thanks and my check for the agreed-upon amount. Thanks, Mr. Taylor. Will do. Any time now, Mr. Tennyson. Any time. Tonight on Classics Revisited, we bring you the BBC's dramatization of that timeless masterpiece, Peter Ibbotson. Masters of Darkness and our terrifying story down there. Money got you down? Pick up the phone and dial now for the lowest interest rates. Do not attempt to adjust your television set. We control the transmission. Tonight you will travel from the height of man's dreams to the absolute limit. What's the matter, Mr. Tennyson? Nothing on television to your liking? Perhaps you should try reading a book. It might be a new experience for you. Or does your taste run to ghost stories, science fiction, that sort of thing? If you prefer, I could stock your bookshelf with trash like that, bestsellers, even erotica. Something to keep a man's thoughts on other things. Excuse me a moment. Hello, Franklin. Mr. Tennyson, sir? Yes, sir. Eating well, is he? Appetite good? Well, not very much up to a week ago, sir. But he's eating very well now. How oh, nice. I'd like him to remain as healthy as possible. My conscience simply couldn't stand it if this experience damaged him in any way. Quite the contrary, sir. He seems in excellent spirits. And it's nine weeks now. Nine weeks that he's been in there. Nine weeks. Really quite incredible. I gave him four to stick it out. Six at the outside, but nine weeks. A little more gristle there than I've given him credit for. Yes, sir. Mmm, mmm. Look at that, Tennyson. Dinner for one. Everything cooked to perfection, I take it. Comfortable, sir? More wine, perhaps. What's the matter, Tennyson? Cat got your tongue? Or don't you believe in speaking to the help? Will there be anything else, Mr. Tennyson? I'll be back when you're finished, sir. Enjoy your meal, Tennyson. Sorry I can't stay, but I have another engagement with friends. A lovely little spot downtown, so warm and friendly. Perfect for conversation. You understand, I'm sure. Good afternoon, Colonel. Patrick. I'll take care of your car, sir. I know you will, boy. Mr. Alfred inside, is he? Yes, sir. Have a nice lunch, sir. There you are, George. I reserved a table for us, a quiet one. Good. But then they're all quiet nowadays, aren't they? Franklin called to say you wanted to see me. Only to pose a question to you. 
What sort of question? Very succinct, Archie. Very brief. Yes. How long? How long what? How long are you going to keep this up, this prolonged practical joke? Not much longer. What exactly does that mean? You should see our boy up there. Four and a half months and not a sound from him. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Incredible. I've just been wondering how my fortune might accommodate the loss of a cool million. For the sake of argument, of course, quite theoretical. That fuck couldn't take it another month. This, I'm certain of. For your sake, I hope that's the case. My sake? You have the money, of course. I find that insulting. I'm sorry if it is, but I think he's going to beat you, Arch. Especially from you, George. I'd say you owe me an apology. How are your holdings? What are you talking about? It's no longer theoretical. You might want to double-check your holdings now in preparation. My holdings? They're solid, dependable, hundred-year-old firms. Why should I rearrange anything? They're insane. Merely careful. Look here. There isn't one chance in a million he'll last out the year. Not one in a million. I've watched him every day. He's beside himself. He's becoming bored to the point of irrationality. A week longer, two weeks, three at the most, he'll be crawling up the walls, screaming for us to let him out. I hope so. I sincerely hope so. But I think that boy up there will remain silent for the entire year. And I think you're going to owe him that cool million. Nonsense. I just hope... I just hope you've got it. That's all. I'm not going to sit here and listen to this abuse. It's not in the least personal, only something I feel you need to hear from someone you'll listen to. The voice of reason, a word to the wise, that sort of thing. Then from now on, I'll thank you to disperse your wisdom elsewhere. Oh, for the love of... Consider yourself discharged. What? As of this hour and this day, you are no longer my attorney. But Archie... Goodbye, George. Goodbye to you, old boy, and good luck. Because by the look of things, I'd say you're going to need it. How are we doing today, Tennyson? Read any good books lately? Or are you meditating on the calendar? Awful of me to get you a calendar, wasn't it? What is it you're pointing to? Oh, yes, March already. So it is. In like a lion, as they say. Speak up. I can't hear you. What's that? A note. Well, bring it over to the glass so I can read it. Yes, I see it. Three months to go, Colonel. The bet stands. Does it, Tennyson? Does it really? It's an early spring this year. Did you know that? You ought to see it. It's incredibly lovely out. Warm with the flowers starting already all over the city. You really must see it. You don't know what you're missing. Why are you looking so smug? Well, you won't be so smug after I've given you something else to think about. It's the time of year when a young man's fancy gently turns to... You know the rest. And the young ladies, too. Your wife, for example. She must be desperately lonely for you. Desperately lonely. Why? Well, what's that pained expression? I was simply going to tell you that, as a matter of fact, she's been seen in the company of... of... your friend. What was his name? Charlie, that's it. And other young men. Odd that she hasn't visited you, Tennyson. Don't you think it's odd? I happen to know you've sent her notes requesting a visit. And she doesn't even respond to the notes, does she? Tennyson, you may lose your wife. You're well aware of that, aren't you? While you sit doing nothing behind that glass, the very reason for all your agony may be slipping away from you. Tennyson, why don't you leave? Why don't you leave right now? It still might be possible to save your marriage if you act without further delay. Don't you walk away from me, you fool! Tennyson, I know you can hear me. I saw your wife again. She's with that polo player fellow now. You know the one. 
the tall, attractive, blonde youngster. It's incredibly beautiful out today, Tennyson. Oh, it's incredibly beautiful. Birds and flowers and color. Absolutely lovely. And by the way, I saw your wife. She was getting into a little European sports car. Some young man was driving it. And here's Franklin with yet another meal. You must be quite bored with the club's menu by now, aren't you, Tennyson? Oh, Franklin? Yes, sir? Chilly up here, isn't it? I hadn't noticed, sir. Perhaps. The thermostat, um, does it control the temperature in Mr. Tennyson's room as well? I believe it does, sir. Then I'll just turn it up for a while. I don't want you getting chilly, Mr. Tennyson. Certainly not. I want to warm it up for you. Nice and warm. It's April Fool's Day, Tennyson. You remember April Fool's Day? I think it was named after you. Because only a fool would stay in there as long as you have. Knowing precisely what's happening on the outside. Your wife, I mean, Tennyson. Your wife. She hasn't written to you, has she? Not a line. Not so much as a single response to any of your letters. What are you doing now? Writing another note? Why bother? I see you sweating. Why don't you tell me how uncomfortable it is? Why don't you ask me to get you out of there? I suppose I could read one more if you prefer. Let me see it through the glass. Hmm. You monster. Is that the complete contents of your missive? That I'm a monster? Hardly. You do me an injustice, young man. All I did was turn off the heat. That's no violation of the terms of the wager. At no point did I indicate what the temperature would be during your confinement. As to other matters, I'm merely a, a chronicler of your events on the outside. I'm kind of your, your personal gossip columnist. Let's put it that way. Tennyson, this nonsense has to cease. You've got to get out of there. I, I could tell you some stories about your wife. Please don't strike the glass. You might have hurt your hand. Anyway, it's non-breakable. A kind of plastic, actually. But of course, you know all about plastics, don't you? Now, how about it, Tennyson? I might see my way clear to giving you $10,000. That would pay off a few of your debts and a little bracelet for the wife. Something to compensate you for months of loneliness. Hmm? How about it, Tennyson? $10,000, man. $12,000. Say one word and I'll let you out. You're an idiot. You know that? You're losing your mind in there. I know you are. I know you are. You're ready to crawl up the walls. Tennyson, listen to me. Make it 75000 in cash. If you'll give up this ridiculous game and speak. Make it a hundred. No, two hundred. Two hundred and fifty thousand, Tennyson. Time is running short, boy. You can't stay in there another hour. Not another half hour, I swear to you. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cash if you'll speak now. You accept? Hold it up, let me read your decision. Go to... How dare you. You go there, boy. You! You will, I swear, if you don't act at once. I'm about to withdraw my offer. I'm counting down. Rather a monumental occasion, isn't it? I wouldn't have believed it. One year in that room and not a word out of him. Three minutes is all the poor devil's got left now. Three more minutes. Look at the colonel over there. Not the face of a happy man, would you say? Well, at least he had the decency to show up. You're sure, George? I'm sure. This is straight off the wire, but it hardly matters now. Twelve months ago, almost to the minute, you destroyed yourself. Much as I told you you would. Your little reminders are gratuitous at this point. And it's not even ten o'clock yet. Whether it is or whether it isn't, the destruction I'm talking about has already taken place. There have been ugly rumors, Archie. Things you've done to him. What things? 
Like little asides, innuendos, suggestions, gossip about his wife. Even intercepting letters he wrote her before Franklin could mail them. You place such a premium on honor, Archie. But you haven't acted like an honorable man. George, you don't believe Please it. Please don't go to the trouble of denying it. I'm sure much of it is true. But this ugly affair has proven two things, hasn't it? That the boy up there is stronger than you gave him credit for. And that you are considerably weaker. That boy up there. A weak, simpering, half a mind. A fop with no guts, no courage, no nothing. How could he have done it? How could he have done it? I might just as well have made it two million or three million. Somehow it was impossible from the beginning. Gentlemen, Mr. Tennyson. He's so pale. Then it's a rail. But he's done it. You hold out your hand to me, Mr. Tennyson. Not to shake it, I presume. But to receive payment. Well, sir, you have me at a disadvantage. A rather compromising situation. You forced me into a position of, of rather unpleasant candor. Because it happens to be a fact that I'm a fraud. I don't have any money. I offered you ten thousand dollars and then twelve. The truth is I would have had to go out on the streets to beg even that amount, let alone a million dollars. I received a cable from London. Both the Birmingham Tool Company and Edinburgh Motors have filed suit for bankruptcy. Blue chip companies. Every nickel I had was invested with them, and they no longer exist. I'm shot on busted. Broke. Yes. It happens also to be a fact that I have pride bearing taste and exceptional breeding. But I've lost. Proving, Mr. Tennyson. Proving that... That you are by far the more substantial of the two of us. I will naturally resign. You have both my resignation and my apologies. I will not ask you to suffer my presence any longer. Look at Tennyson. They won't let him walk out like this. He'll demand satisfaction. Talk to him, Tennyson. Tell him whatever you like. Your time's up. You can talk, gurgle, sing, chortle, anything you want. You've won the bet, son. What's he doing? Writing another note? But why? What is it, Colonel? What did he write? Why doesn't he speak? Let me see. Let me see. It says, one year ago, I had the nerves to my vocal cords severed. Good oh. Lord. He's opening his collar to show you, Archie. There are the scars on his throat. I underwent this surgery because I knew I'd never be able to keep my part of the body. For the love of God, man. For the love of God. A bizarre and unlikely bet with two losers. Mr. Jamie Tennyson, who will go through life as a silent shell, the price to be paid for his weakness. And Colonel Archibald Taylor, who will spend the rest of his days in naked humiliation. The cost to him for all of this is the most precious possession he owned, his pride. And the point of it all? Simply that two men discovered somewhat belatedly that gambling can be a most unproductive pursuit. For somewhere beyond these two, a wheel was turned and both their numbers came up. The number was Black 13. If you don't believe it, ask the croupier, the very special one who handles high-stakes roulette in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. 
And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. The Silence, starring Chris McDonald with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Craig Brawley, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupiton, James Schneider, Derek Purcell, Turk Muller, Kurt Nabig, Carl Amari, Roger Walski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.